Today, we have gathered here to discuss a subject of great significance for the future of Kerala's ambitious plans for creating a knowledge economy on the shoulders of science. On the onset, I want to invite our chief guest for today for the inaugural function. Uh, first, I want to call upon uh, Dr. Jiju P. Alex, State Planning Board, Government of Kerala. Thanks, uh, sir, for raising our occasions. Next, we have Dr. K. M. Abraham, Executive Vice Chairman, KDISC, amongst us. We have Dr. Saji Gobinath, Vice Chancellor, Kerala Digital University. Dr. Uh, Sam Santosh, Strategic Advisor, KDISC. And Dr. P.V. Unikrishnan from KDISC. And the fields of plant genomics, agri genomics, and animal health are interconnected. And advancements in one area can have a positive impact on the others. Through the application of genomics in these areas, we can improve food security, enhance agricultural productivity, biodiversity, biosecurity, and one health. KDISC plans to establish a high capacity data center to harness the power of genomic data and the rich biodiversity of Kerala. This center would act as a hub for researchers, health professionals, and public health officials to access and share genomic data. I am pleased to introduce the distinguished experts in these fields who will share their insights and experiences with us. And we believe their knowledge and exper expertise will undoubtedly help us to gain a deeper understanding of the potential of setting up an exclusive genome data center. We are also honored to have several officials from the government of Kerala and academia with us uh, who will play a critical role in making this center a huge success. Their presence today highlights the importance of this topic and their commitment to advancing these fields. I am confident that the discussions and debates that will happen today over the next uh, one day will be productive and thought provoking. I hope that this conference will serve as a platform for fostering collaborations and partnerships and that it will help us to catalyze new research and development in genomics and genomic data center. Thank you all for joining us today and I look forward to a stimulating and enlightening conference. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I would now like to invite all the honorable speakers on stage. Mr. Sam Santosh is an entrepreneur with a 35-year track record of creating successful companies in the United States and India. For the first 20 years, Sam was in the IT industry and made his mark by setting up California software and taking it public in India. In the last 15 years, Sam led the genomic revolution in India by incubating and launching multiple companies, leveraging next genome sequencing and bioinformatics through his incubator, SciGenome Labs in Kochi and San Francisco. Sam incubated MedGenome in 2010, and over the next 10 years, raised $120 million from leading venture capital companies like Sequoia, Sofina, LeapFrog, and IFC. Sam established MedGenome as the leading genomic diagnostics and research company in India, and he's often called the genome man of India. Currently, Sam continues to incubate startups in SciGenome Labs and promote genomic research and education through SciGenome Research Foundation, a nonprofit trust that he established in 2011. His main passion now is in creating a medical plant, medicinal plant garden based on the 17th century magnum opus Hortus Malabaricus, Garden of Malabar, at his hometown of Trishur, Kerala. Sam is the author of Sam's 12 Commandments for the Indian Entrepreneur. Sam is a mechanical engineer with an MBA from IIM Calcutta. He maintains homes at San Francisco and Kochi while continuously traveling across the world visiting museums, archaeological sites, and botanical gardens. Sam has been the advisor for KDISC from mid-2021 as part of KDISC mission of transforming Kerala into a knowledge economy. Sam has proposed the idea of setting up KDGC, Kerala Genome Data Center, as a center of excellence in genomics and bioinformatics. I invite you on stage.
Thank, thank you, Vajas. Uh, I won't be talking too much now. I have a, a detailed presentation uh, after the inaugural function. So let us proceed to the inaugural function. So you, uh, who will be the next speakers? Now I invite uh, Dr. Jiju P. Alex uh, to speak a few words uh, on this occasion. Respected Dr. K.M. Abraham, Dr. Sajji Govindan, Dr. Sam Sandosh, Dr. P.V. Unikrishna, and all the dignitaries who have gathered here at this historic moment of inaugurating a genome data center in Kerala. So I have got a background in agriculture, but I am not an expert in genetics, genome studies or biotechnology, since many of my colleagues are here. But I would like to speak a few words from the policy perspective. In fact, the establishment of this center is nothing but realizing the dream that we are going towards a knowledge economy. The 14th five-year plan, as it, I mean, it has been it has been launched by the government, and it is in progress. It is in the second year of its implementation. We have been able to make substantial improvement and substantial strides with respect to making this state a knowledge society. So the investment in the higher education and in R&D have increased substantially, in the, in the, particularly in the last two years. And we think that we have to have indigenous methods of establishing our own knowledge systems in all cut, cutting edge technologies, in all new domains. Kerala has the capability to do that. And we have seen that our institutions have got great manpower and creativity to facilitate this process. From that point of view, I think this genome center is an absolutely innovative idea because we would always like to have this kind of cutting edge technology research in the public sector rather. So one major issue that would happen when such databases of importance, say for example, a genome database is of great importance with respect to almost all sectors of the economy, in health, in agriculture, in, in biodiversity conservation, in climate resilient practices, etc., etc. And it is very important that these research and these data sources should be at the ownership of the public sector, rather. I do not know how far we would be able to do that because the current age and era requires joint partnership with the public sector and also maybe the voluntary sector, etc., etc. In genome research, as far as I understand, most of the cutting edge research is being done by the private sector, global giants, with whom we do not have any particular access. And that data is very valuable. The research is also proprietary. And the products are not maybe that much accessible to maybe for, for being used by the um, government or maybe by the public sector institutions. So this issue will have to be addressed in the long run. And Genome Center is rightly addressing this particular issue. And we know that in biotechnology and genome research as well, our universities have contributed substantially. I am hailing from the agriculture university. 
And basically, Agriculture University, as I understand, has initiated several programs on genome research, gene editing. We have come up with, and also we have committed completion of the genome of maybe almost about uh, 100 crops or so as part of this particular project, it seems, and also 70 microbes. The microbiome center and this genome data center, both would certainly enhance the capabilities of these universities. And I have also seen that all the other universities, except the language universities and the technical universities, all the other general universities have made tremendous work in the field of biotechnology and genome research. And I do not know how much do these organizations share their data, their experiences, and how much do they collaborate each other in coming up with uh, big projects which would transform maybe the economy of the state. So the Genome Center is also going to be a platform for having collaboration among these institutions. There are several scientists who are working on various crops and the applicability of the research, the commercialization of the research is something which we have not been able to accomplish so far. So this is also a very important thing. This Genome Center would certainly serve as a center for a, a big source of data which is going to be in the public domain which can be used by anyone and I also heard that maybe all this data which is being in the public domain right now there is a possibility of denying access to this data at any point of time once private forces get into this maybe global maybe giants get into this there is every possibility that access to this data could be denied so many countries have started establishing their own genome centers, fearing that there would be denial of access to this, maybe based on commercial interest. So from all these perspectives, I think whatever has been initiated, which is a very innovative program of the KDS. KDS is the leading organization which has initiated the process of innovation, which was not very familiar with the Kerala community earlier. So we have started thinking in lines of how we can be innovative, how the higher education system could be transformed, high, how R&D institutions could be transformed in line with what is happening in the outside world. Maybe we are also now going to align ourselves with the global standards in various respects. So Genome Center, I think, is certainly going to serve this purpose. I'm so happy that I have been invited to be a part of this function. I also associated with KDS on various, maybe particularly in their Young Innovators programs and so many other programs. At the planning board, uh, while pursuing this dream of creating a knowledge economy, we have made very serious attempts to see to it that investment in this sector, particularly in the knowledge sector, uh, is substantial and it is going to be continued irrespective of the various constraints that we face. Uh, in the, I mean, with respect to our I mean, income of the state and other issues that we face as of now. So with these words, I think I, I, I congratulate the team who have worked behind it, particularly the KDS team, Dr. K.M. Abraham and Dr. P.V. Unikrishan, who have spearheaded this idea. They have revolutionized the whole process of thinking in Kerala because they are bringing in several, several new ideas which we were not familiar with earlier. And I, 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 I wish this occasion all success. I wish this particular endeavor every success in future. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I'd now like to invite Dr. K. M. Abraham, Executive Vice Chairman, KDISC on stage. Dr. Jiju P. Alex. Sam Sandosh, Dr. Saji, Dr. Unikrishnan, ladies and uh, gentlemen. It's a great uh, occasion today. It's a great pleasure for me to be part of this occasion. And uh, for a person who has been associated with the decision making of the launch of the Kerala Genome Data Center yesterday, by the Honorable Chief Minister. I, for me, it is a very personally exhilarating, uh, joyful occasion as well. You know, big institutions are born either 
out of luck or destiny or perhaps by the hand of God. I'm not too sure whether the expression on a lighter note, I'm not sure whether the expression hand of God works well with a crowd of genomic scientists who are thinking about spicing and, and cutting and sequencing uh, life as such. But nevertheless, I think personally that if there is anybody who is slightly closer to understanding the working of God, that is these uh, genome scientists who have gathered here in this, uh, in this room. Because they know how the, how the Almighty operates in terms of coming out with newer and newer versions of ourselves. But when this decision came, the hand of God worked in this. We got Sam Sandosh to be on our board in the Kerala Development Inno in uh, Innovation Strategic Council. He became our council member. He propounded this idea. But when this idea was actually proposed in the beginning, I was, uh, I was actually concerned. And the reason I was concerned is the scale of funding intended for this kind of an effort is of the order which perhaps a small state like Kerala may not be able to afford on its own. So the question that we had to resolve before placing it in the council, before the Honorable Chief Minister was the, the different pros and cons of this decision. Now Dr. Jiju Alex uh, touched on a particular point about where the ownership of the data should reside. Kerala for some reason, good or bad, there are arguments in favor and arguments against has a peculiar public consciousness when it comes to data and data protection. I am not arguing for the, uh, the, for the ethicality or morality of that particular decision, but that is something which we have to live with. And there is also this concern that unless data resides, long term data resides with the public ownership, and Dr. Jiju touched upon this point, ultimately it is going to restrict access to that data. So these kind of decisions actually motivated us and said, let us take a step forward, establish the genome data center, see what happens in the future, pump in some money to establish the network, the, the, the computer infrastructure, so necessary for that. At that, at that point in time, we had to resolve yet another issue. Should this data be residing in our own servers, our own architecture, or can we actually lean on the, on the cloud system? We had a small committee, we had a small debate around this topic. Where, will, where should we ideally position this data? Should we position this data in the cloud, or should we have our own servers? And, uh, and the debate veered towards having our own center after for a long, you know, even now it's getting debated, but on a balance of convenience, on a balance of long-term interest, we decided that we are going to fund this uh, investment. So that is how this whole idea took shape. We had a couple of iterations. We went through yet another kind of a debating point, whether human genomes should actually be brought into the study right from the beginning. And the general wisdom of the policy makers was that we should eventually, but let's start with plant and animal genome first, take a few first steps forward and then take a decision on how and when we should actually go into the area of human genomes because the preponderant view in the genome science scientist community is that without human genome database, the entire ecosystem will not be complete and many of us do believe and agree with that but then you know timing is of the issue from a political polity uh, consciousness point of view. So we are here now and this occasion the science seminar comes at a time or rather to commemorate the launching of the Kerala Genome Data Center by the Honorable Chief Minister yesterday. Kerala is notable for several firsts and I am sure this center is going to be a very historic one for us. We are going to blaze very strong tra uh, tra tra trails uh, in, the, in, the, in the genome ecosystem. We are going to go places. The startup ecosystem associated with it is going to grow. The industry associated with it is going to grow. 
the efforts that Dr. Jiju mentioned is, that is happening in almost all our general universities, they are going to come together now under the umbrella of the KGDC and I look forward to, you know, to, to this centre being a tremendous or playing a tremendous part uh, in it. I place on record my thanks to Mr. Samson Dosh for giving us the leadership, for giving us the guidance uh, as to how to take forward. I, I, I end uh, with one request to the community that has gathered here. Today, in front of me, I see the largest talent pool that we could possibly dream of on an occasion like this. Stay with us. This is a long journey that we have started. Stay with us, hold our hands, guide us, help us to move forward and that will, that's the only thing that I would like to place on behalf of the government of Kerala, on behalf of the uh, chief minister. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the request I would like to place for your consideration and I hope this cooperation that we are seeing now, both at a national, international level, we have participants from uh, stalwarts from the international level who are here. So I hope uh, you stay with us and you guide us in our journey forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'd now like to invite Dr. Saji Gopinath, Vice Chancellor, Kerala Digital University. Good morning. Honorable uh, dignitaries on the dais, of the dais, uh, invited delegates and participants of uh, this very important uh, seminar on Kerala Genome uh, Data Center. As you know, uh, Honorable uh, Chief Minister has launched the uh, Genome Data Center yesterday and I think uh, this seminar, I believe, will going to give directions on the actions which uh, Genome Data Center is going to take up in the next uh, few years. As uh, Dr. Jeeva Alexis rightly pointed out, Kerala is actually on a verge of a knowledge revolution. Uh, when this new government came, the, the, one of the key priority area is to how do you make Kerala as a knowledge society and how do you create knowledge industries. Now, if when you think about knowledge industries, and uh, Dr. Sam has led many so knowledge industries to success, uh, we know that you really require some level of uh, facilities to attract, curate, and incubate new industries. So I think the, the purpose of Kerala Genome Data Center to me is for that. So it primarily will provide an infrastructure, that infrastructure where the data is sourced both from internal and external available sources. And then we also provide the computing power so that people can actually develop solutions on the top of it. So as uh, uh, the earlier speakers have said, there are several research happening in various institutions, various universities, and if it has been taken using any of the government money, I know that by pride norms, this is supposed to be shared also. This has to be an open data. So now, through Genome Data Center, we are trying to accumulate all this data. Plus, there will be also be projects initiated by KDISC, which will also ensure that more sequencing and more data sources will be generated. All these will come at a single point. On the top of that, you will have high-end computing power. We are working to create one of the most powerful data center perhaps in the country itself in, uh, in, in the digital university. And digital university is very privileged that be a part of uh, uh, this particular project. So that people who have got the ideas, people who have got the talent, people who have got the skills and expertise can come over, use these facilities, the data infrastructure, the, the, the computing infrastructure, and come out with product and services which can later convert itself into research products, knowledge products, or even companies. And that is primarily the vision, I believe, of the Kerala uh, uh, Genome Data Center. How do you curate this? How do you uh, address the various nuances of that? I believe that uh, today's uh, uh, seminar will give a lot of uh, uh, insight onto that. And uh, I'm sure that we will have a very exciting session today. And wish Kerala Genome Data Center all the very best. And let's all look forward to a very uh, enriching session for the whole day. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'd like to invite Mr. Sam Santosh to share the vision and strategy of KGDZ. Good morning, the respected uh, guests on the dais, uh, other invited guests, and uh, scientists, students. I'm very happy to be here today. 
and uh, as a sort of a like a dream getting fulfilled. Uh, we had to wait for some time, but finally, you know, sometimes the wait is worth it. So today I feel very happy, and I we really owe it to Dr. Abraham and uh, Dr. Unikishan uh, to take this uh, uh, idea into a into a into a fruition and bringing it uh, bringing it live. Uh, because ideas are plenty. I mean, anybody can come up with uh, so many ideas, but how do you convert an idea into reality is the challenge. And I'd really like to place on record people who really worked on completing this proposal. Dr. Achu Shankar Nair and team from Center for Computational Biology, Trivandrum, were uh, very helpful in preparing the report. Ashin Menon, uh, who was working with Sajinom Research Foundation, did all the hard work of uh, getting the project proposal together. And uh, uh, contributions from Digital University and uh, Kerala Agricultural University and uh, many other institutions. Uh, I could not reach out to everybody at that time because uh, it was just an idea and a proposal. Uh, but uh, now we will be very actively reaching out to uh, all of you as well as the rest of the life science organizations in the country. So let me briefly go through what is the vision and uh, what are we trying to achieve. Uh, and uh, um, we, can, we, can, we can discuss on that the rest of the day based on all the contributions from the other esteemed speakers. So what is the Kerala Genome Data Center? So this is a high capacity, high performance uh, data uh, computer center that initially will be set up at Data University and then subsequently when the science park is ready, it will be moved over there. So uh, this will uh, collect data from uh, everything that is alive, right? That is, you know, if there is life, uh, there is genes. So, so so uh, genes are so uh, uh, gene data is going to be so important uh, for a lot of things. Uh, I don't need to tell you that. You guys all know that even better than me. Uh, but uh, Kerala will take the lead in accumulating uh, the data from available, uh, not available, not only available, but uh, important to Kerala. Uh, what, what, uh, what is the genomic data that is important to Kerala uh, for, for a number of purposes, which we can go into. Uh, so a repository for that and a powerful data center that will enable all of you uh, to, uh, uh, to not only access the data, uh, but do your analysis using the, uh, the various bioinformatics pipelines and various other tools that will be needed uh, to use this data to convert into other future applications like synthetic biology, uh, you know, biomanufacturing, all the future industries will need this genomic data. So that is the center's purpose. The center will be the, will be the place where all of you can come and uh, contribute your data, access the data that is available and work on the data. Right? So we'll set up this, the IT platform, the hardware and the software to analyze, store and distribute the genomic data. Uh, we will uh, you know, in develop and install the very so lot of software that is needed for, uh, for, the, the, for analyzing the genome data sets. So people don't need to have their own installs for all the pipelines that you need to, uh, to, do, to analyze the data. And we will need to uh, 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 do some by ourselves and uh, the rest by bringing in other startups to develop uh, other AI and ML based tools for analyzing the data. So this becomes a storehouse and this also becomes a base center for organizing training programs. So we need to upskill. So we need to upskill the people that we already have and we need to upskill people that I'm sure will be attracted by this from other parts of the country and the world to come and work on this data. So that will be the, that will be the training part of it and skill building part of it. And we will invite all the institutions, uh, you know, primary to Kerala, but it's open to everybody around the world. Uh, but our focus will be on the companies and uh, research institutions in Kerala. So one point which I like to make it very clear that is so that there is no confusion is that this genomic data center is not a research center, right? We are not no way competent or capable of telling you what the research needs to be done. So we are just a facilitator. So we, we are not, uh, we are, so you are the ones to decide what are the things that, uh, that should have priority. You are the ones that needs to convince the government also that human data, if you all think is important, human data should come in. Meanwhile, as Dr. Abraham pointed out, hey, we have a lot of plants, animals, and they, so, so I have the, the aquatic organisms. So we can, we can uh, definitely go ahead with that. But even among that, which are the plants to focus on? Which are the animals to focus on? Which is the main challenging problems that our farmers face as far as pests are concerned or as far as uh, uh, yield? Or, or, or loss of yield is concerned due to global warming or climate changes and all that. So these are the problems that you are aware of. So we will also be getting down to the farmers. So the farmers, the cooperative societies, the plantations. So they are the ones who will tell us the problems. You are the ones who will decide that, okay, what are the type of research that can be done. We are the only ones that will provide you some of the data that will be useful to you once you decide that this is the data that you want. 
A few minutes I'll spend, many of you will know of this, but a, a little bit of a background, why Kerala is such a blessed place, right? So our journey started about 100 million years back, when we split off from Africa and, uh, and moved off, right, due to the continental drift, and came and hit Asia. The Asia, what Asia was at that time. It took us a journey of about 50 million years uh, over the ocean. So that was a journey that made Kerala and India unique. Why? Because that gave us the time to develop and grow and evolve. 50 million years is, is a pretty long time. So the whales evolved in India, chicken came from India, so many, so many unique uh, animals and species that we know came from India uh, or developed in India or evolved in India. So in Kerala, uh, part of the, though part of the Indian subcontinent was even more unique because of why we had the Western Ghats on one side. So the Western Ghats made us even separate from the rest of India. So that is, gave us a separate you know, time period for a lot of uh, organisms to develop and evolve very uniquely in Kerala. And this is not just a theory, this is a hard facts, right? So, so, so don't need to be confused about whether, oh, this is just a claim, right? Maybe when Lord Parishrama hurled the axe, luckily he didn't hurl it too far. So Kerala is like a small sliver of land, right? And that sliver of land is such a beautiful land and it is maybe one of the top biodiverse places in the, uh, in the whole world. And not only that, there are a few other you know, two, three places like Costa Rica and things like that that are biodiverse, but I don't think they have the depth of, of medicinal plants, of unique breeds, you know, uh, which, which Kerala has. So that is the, that is the thing that we, we are you primarily positioned uh, to, to, to be the storehouse of uh, the, this valuable genomic data. And uh, uh, just, uh, just a glimpse of the various biodiversity things which, uh, which, which Kerala can be proud of, our livestock, you know, our Vechur cow to our Kasargo dwarf to, you know, the various goats and, uh, you know. But at the same time, all this uh, diversity and the, and the uniqueness of the Western Ghats provide some challenges also to us. Why? Because we are a thickly populated state. For a small state of 39,000 square, square kilometers, uh, we have 3.5 crore people, you know. And of this 3.5 crore people, a few may be outside the country, but we have enough other, uh, you know, uh, people coming in too to, 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 to balance the population. So, uh, but the 30% of the state is forest. So we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are in very close interaction uh, with, with, uh, with the human animal, uh, uh, you know, the, the conflict. That, that, is a, that is a continuous thing. But at the same time, that is something that uh, is very visible, you know. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, there is a lot of invisible things which are even more important. The animal you see on TV, you know, the, the, the elephant coming out or the tigers and all that in the villages, which are serious problems, I'm not belittling that. But even more serious problems are the viruses and the bacteria and the other microbes jumping from forests to uh, for, uh, humans and our, our area, our land. And similarly, even more bad will be our diseases and our viruses from the humans jumping out to the animals, the poor animals. So we not only encroach on their territory by, you know, reducing the forest, but we also give them a, a tremendous number of uh, viruses. Uh, like, you know, there's hardly an elephant in, uh, in, in our forest which doesn't have human TB. Uh, you know, so, so these are very sad things that, uh, uh, that has happened as uh, sometimes I mentioned, uh, we are the largest pests, you know, in this, this uh, earth has ever seen. So we have, we, have, we have damaged the earth and we are damaging a lot of other things. Anyway, so what are the effects of that? So there's a lot of uh, transmission of, of these uh, viruses and other things back and forth. So uh, we already saw the COVID. But uh, prior to that itself, as uh, people from Kerala, we know the large number of, uh, you know, uh, uh, flus and other fevers that we are getting uh, on a continuous basis in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, we have all been sort of neglecting that and ignoring that. Uh, uh, not even identified most of them. We know chicken, gunia, or dengue, and a few few fevers. But I am bet you that there are hundreds of other things that are out there which are all continuously evolving in close contact with humans. So there is a lot of danger in the future as many of them evolve enough to become like the COVID-19. So the biosecurity project or biosecurity initiative will become very critical for in, for Kerala uh, to take the leadership in, which can then be a model for. Uh, many other states of Kerala, uh, some states of India, and even rest of the world, which also have similar problems. So Kerala is uniquely positioned to drive the uh, the, the uh, microbiome research. Uh, we uh, seeing that the Kerala government has also set up the Center for Microbiome Research in RGCB, so we can also support them. They will obviously take the leadership in many of those and and ensure that uh, these type of initiatives can be pushed through quickly. I'll spend a few, uh, I don't think I'll spend much time maybe on the Kerala population. Most of you know that we are very ancient uh, population, uh, right from the time uh, uh, we are Homo sapiens moved out of Africa. Uh, we, uh, 
uh, we, uh, they reached here as one of the first places in India through the coast. Uh, the coastline was much uh, lower at that time, so they could practically walk across or in small boats. So we, and that uh, still uh, remains. So there are pockets of uh, uh, tribal populations. 36 tribes have been identified in this small state of Kerala, which still, uh, you know, remain practically protected. So they are also a good uh, uh, database of uh, genomic information as the first citizens of the, of, of the, of the country or the state. So, but we are not, uh, as Dr. Abraham explained, we are not going into the human genome sequencing as of now, uh, but uh, we will, uh, as soon as we get permission in the next maybe six or 12 months, uh, we can start looking into that as well. So what is the goal of the uh, uh, project? So as the Chief Minister announced yesterday, the total budget we are expecting to spend over the next five three years is about 500 crores. So uh, after that, uh, about maybe 150, 100 to 150 crores will be spent on set, setting up the, uh, the infrastructure, the hardware. The rest is for uh, practically most of the rest of the money will be for generating the data. Uh, we are hoping to run this as a very lean organization and without any uh, other investments in um, uh, other rest of infrastructure like building or labs or nothing like that will be there. We will uh, practically operate from the KDISC office with a, uh, office with a small team of four or five people uh, uh, and uh, they will uh, depend on you uh, of all the scientists and other research organizations uh, in, the con in the state to support uh, and, and provide, the, uh, provide the manpower uh, for this. And uh, the, obviously there will be an ethics committee, there will be a scientific advisory board who will uh, select the projects to be projects that are the proposals coming from you that should be chosen for, uh, for sequencing. And uh, uh, this will be implemented in the strict uh, following the central government's uh, pride guidelines on how the data should be show, st stored as well as shared. So what will we be able to do? Our, outcome from, uh, get the outcome from this project. Obviously, the primary levels of outcome are very obvious. I mean, I mean, we don't need to uh, harp on it. Like, it will be the, a powerful data center to analyze. It will be a large storage area uh, for, for people to store the genomic data. Uh, but what is beyond that? So we have to train, you know, hundreds of uh, 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 scientists, uh, bioinformatics scientists, and uh, we need to create jobs. So how will we create jobs? So that is why the goal to put it in the, uh, in the science park. There will be enough space for startups and companies to come in. Uh, we will also put up with the government's uh, direction on the right policies so that when the data is shared with, uh, with the non-academic institutions, we will also ensure that they are here. Uh, they have to put up an office and they have to hire local people. So, so that is why we need to skill the people too. We can't just insist on them hiring the local people without having the resources. So having the resources ready and getting them, uh, getting them uh, uh, hireable, you know, uh, to, to, to employable. Uh, by the organization. So that will be the real goal uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the center and to be basically be the research platform for you. So the, the, we are not come, going to come up with any products or any findings or any grand things. So all that will depend on the scientists and other research organizations and uh, commercial organizations as well. Uh, so it's not uh, just blocking the commercial organizations, they are so key. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to have uh, Synthite here, for example. Dr. Vishal Menon will talk to you later. So I push them hard to make sure that Synthite comes. They're also contributing, uh, donating money to the QSAT uh, to set up a center for synthetic biology uh, in, in Cochin. So uh, this will all be a very good network that Kerala will have with this KGTC center and the Center for Microbiome Research here in Trivandrum, the QSAT center uh, in 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 Kochi and uh, uh, various other uh, life science institutions across the country. So the KGDC will have a very, like I said, a very uh, lean organization. Uh, the the uh, KDIS, it will be led by the KDIS steering committee uh, with Dr. Abraham heading it and Dr. Unikishan and other key players there. We'll have the scientific advisory board. We'll have a project director come, set, like a core center director who will run it. There'll be a small core team under him, which will mostly be of, uh, uh, pro bono work from the chief scientists that we will uh, uh, try to get from uh, uh, in, people like you or from institutions here. Uh, two or three people will be uh, employed directly. So the driving force uh, will be the core team. Uh, the, the project director initially as on a temporary basis will be Dr. Raju who gave you the welcome speech. Uh, uh, but he'll be there for maybe a few months but we will be hiring uh, a full-time person in, in, during that time. Uh, there will be a, a three to four uh, data scientists, uh, one person we already sort of shortlisted, finalized and two to be recruited. Uh, we won't have any dedicated admin and support that will all be provided by KDISC. And uh, the core collaborators, uh, the primary collaborator obviously is Dr. Achyush Nair, Nair uh, who has uh, like really uh, uh, drove the proposal preparation and design. 
and uh, that from the Center of Computational Biology, Kerala University. So they have a PhD program also in the multiple areas. So there is a, a good group of about 25 uh, young professionals uh, who can uh, uh, play the major role, uh, uh, responsibility in uh, setting up the data center, the, the, the data part of it, and uh, deciding uh, what are the large amounts of data that is already available out there, which is which is uh, we don't have to generate, but those which are relevant to us, to Kerala, which we can uh, collect and curate and upload. And uh, Dr. Saji, obviously from Digital University, and Dr. Sabu Thomas, uh, he'll be here today. Uh, he is the heading the Center for uh, Excellence of Microbiome at uh, RGCB Trivandrum. Uh, and uh, then, of course, all of you, I don't want to name everybody, but uh, all the speakers and, uh, uh, and other participants, uh, some of the speakers we invited could not make it, uh, but I, I'm sure they will all help both here in uh, India and abroad, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the various life science institutes. So this is something which I'd really like to harp upon, because this is a big asset that we have in Kerala that we have not really made use of. There are over, you'd be surprised to learn that there are over 125 uh, life science research and commercial uh, organizations, uh, minimum, maybe even there are more, because they are all hidden. Because, you know, uh, how many people here, are, for example, know Synthite? Synthite uh, has about 35% of the spice extract market of the world. So there, is, uh, there are such large organizations. Uh, the only person in Kerala who points that out is uh, uh, Balagopal, uh, as you might have seen in his uh, recent book also. So that, that we are not as bad as people make, out, uh, make us out to be. There are so many, so many excellent institutions uh, and, and companies in Kerala. Um, due to various reasons, they all prefer to stay hidden. Uh, they don't really uh, seek publicity. Uh, but, uh, but it's our job to really bring them out and, and, and get them to work together here. Because we are here to meet uh, their needs. So what are the immediate steps? So here we will be running this like a, I'm the only way I am used to working is working for a, driving companies. So we will be working like a, like, a, like a small startup. So we have our startup, our goal for the next 30 days. We will set up the core team at the KDISC office. We have already uh, given the names for the scientific advisory board. As soon as the government approves that, we will have the scientific advisory board in place. Oh, it's approved, uh, Dr. Unikrishnan says. So he is like Mohanlal. Before you think, he would have done it. So, you know. Um, so, uh, uh, so we will uh, set up the, uh, we will finalize the hardware uh, uh, in the next few days. We have an expert committee for uh, uh, deciding on the hardware configuration. Uh, uh, Dr. Sajiv Gobinas has uh, uh, offered to uh, let us use the, uh, their data center for the time being till our, our servers get in place. So we can, we are off running right away. Uh, and then uh, we'll immediately uh, call for research proposals uh, from all the institutions and uh, anybody interested. So this is not restricted to institutions, independent investigators. Uh, anybody who has good ideas on what Kerala uh, the genome data center uh, should generate the data and store, you're welcome. So that, that uh, application uh, will be solicited over the next 30 days and we'll give you a 30 day time for uh, submitting the approvals. The scientific advisory board will decide based on the principles laid down by the uh, KDISC executive committee on wh what priority should be given. And, uh, but keep in mind, uh, KGDC will not be funding your whole research project. KG, obviously, the, the genome sequencing part is the most expensive part. So that part we will fund. But you will be having to find your own internal funds or other grants for sample collection, DNA, RNA extraction, and you know all the other associ associated part of it. Uh, and uh, uh, like I said, parallelly we'll start curating the published data available. And uh, we'll also, uh, we don't have a lab, so we will be sending out a tender for, I know there are many uh, labs uh, with, uh, with the sequencing facilities who can bid for it. So we'll be going on a purely quality and uh, price metrics for, for giving the genomic servicing, genomic sequencing contracts out. So and we'll be making really a roadshow with uh, visiting as many of the institutions as possible, mainly trying to get your help and uh, because many of, the, many, of, many of the units have not responded to emails or phone calls, but we're not letting, the, letting them go that easily. So we'll make sure we go there and, uh, and uh, we'll try to get their support. So that's all I think I have for today. So thank you very much. And uh, if you have questions, I don't want to have waste everybody's time now. We can handle that during the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. With this, we come to the end of the inaugural function. I request all the dignitaries on stage to kindly take a seat. For the keynote address, I would like to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Ebi Oman. Dr. Ebi Oman has spent nearly 30 years as a scientist, inventor, and entrepreneur in Lincoln, Nebraska. 
And throughout his career, has created intellectual property that has resulted in many US and foreign patents. Dr. Oman founded Matma Corp in 2014 in Lincoln. Before founding Matma Corp, he co-founded GeneSeq, a high-throughput genotyping service lab where he served as a president and chief executive officer. GeneSeq, founded in 1998, was acquired by Neogen in 2010, and today is the world's largest commercial agricultural genotyping facility. Before that, Dr. Oman worked as a senior scientist at Licor Biosciences, a scientific instrumentation company where he was involved in the development, marketing, and sales of an automated DNA sequencing system. Dr. Oman has a PhD in molecular genetics biochemistry from the University of Kansas and completed his postdoctoral work at the Samuel Roberts Nobel Foundation in Oklahoma. Maybe Sam would like to add a few lines later. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Satish Chandran. Hi, Dr. Rebi, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Oh yeah, we can hear you, see you very well. Okay, great. I'll just add a few words to what uh, Vajas uh, introduced, uh, A.B. So, uh, there are so many things uh, unsaid that, uh, that, uh, I, uh, that we all need to know. Some of that I can try to share with you. Uh, A.B. is originally from Trivandrum. So, he did his, after his PhD was in uh, Kerala University, A.B.? No, MG PhD was in Kansas. PhD was in Kansas. Still PhD was here. So, we were sort of yeah. compatriots at St. Thomas College when he did his undergrad. But we are ends of the other ends of the <laughs> spectrum. But uh, why I want to really highlight about AB, and uh, we had initially promised to be here in person, but due to some personal reasons, he couldn't come across. AB is one of the leading uh, original scientists who developed sequencing. Okay, so when you call uh, talk about DNA sequencing, uh, the basics of DNA sequencing, uh, he, uh, the, you can we can't get a better person in the world than AB human. It's not an exaggeration. So a human uh, has uh, devices that you, uh, maybe he will not show today, which uh, which has uh, which does uh, uh, genome sequencing of only a few genes at a time in a handheld box of this size, right? And that was developed completely in his uh, lab, uh, so uh, uh, utilizing his own patents. Why I am bringing it up is that, so uh, AB is just an example of the uh, different uh, Malayalis and Indians uh, across the world uh, whose uh, talents and skills uh, we, we can take. So uh, to, like uh, 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 AB can do in sequencing, we will see over the rest of the day and in future, future uh, day, weeks, uh, so many of the experts uh, that uh, KGDC and other institutions in Kerala uh, can take advantage of. Sibi, I won't take too much of your time, so welcome, thank you very much. Uh, late night in uh, Nebraska, uh, but uh, I think uh, we will all uh, be very excited to hear from you. Thank you. Can I start or do you have to introduce Sadish as well? I can start? Okay. Okay, thank you uh, Sam and thank you Ojas for the introduction. I will try to uh, limit my talk to the 20 minutes, 25 minutes perhaps. So uh, genomic technology is what I'll do. I assume not everybody in the audience will know what sequencing is and what other similar technologies are. So I'll give you a little bit of a historical perspective on it as well, and then suggest a few things that Kerala can do. So let's start with a few simple terms. What's a genome? It's actually a total genetic makeup of any living organism. Uh, genotype is specific in information that's encoded at a particular position in the genome. Again, this is for people who do not know what these things are. So when I speak or somebody else speaks the whole day, you are able to follow this better. Phenotype, uh, it's a set of observable characteristics of an individual. And in fact, that's what an individual looks like is basically what a phenotype is. And the, uh, another term that you will hear a lot is phenome. Basically, all the uh, totality of all the phenotypes of an individual makes uh, the phenome. And sequencing is a way to figure out the arrangement of bases in a piece of DNA, the bases being A, T, G, and C. Uh, that's how you uh, code sequence. And editing are ways to change those bases, whether it's uh, to create a good mutation or to create a correct a bad mutation. So in, in very basic terms, these are what people talk about. So uh, just to give you an idea of what sequence
sequencing is DNA, as I said, it, it is basically ATGNC. They are typically uh, in the native form, a double helical structure. In other words, there are two strands. Uh, whenever there is a T, the letter T, it always pairs with an A. In other words, whenever there is an A, it pairs with a T. Similarly, whenever there is a G, it pairs with a C. In other words, whenever there is a C, it pairs with a G. So to read the sequence, uh, all you have to do is to get one strand and make a specific piece of DNA which we call a primer, that is from a known sequence. And you could label this primer uh, at the five prime end of this primer over there uh, with the radioactivity or a fluorescent dye. And then you could extend this primer to read the sequence. So since I said C pairs with G, it'll go G, A, A, C, C, and you can figure out the sequence of this primer. So that was developed in the 70s by Fred Sanger and he won the Nobel Prize for it. And basically all you do, need to do then is to have uh, a polymerase, which is an enzyme that will copy this DNA, a bunch of nucleotides, A, T, G, and C, and also uh, nucleotides that are called terminators that will stop at random. In other words, wherever it needs to stop, it will stop. Wherever there's a T, instead of putting an A, it will put a dideoxy A. So you get these different sizes of molecules, uh, fragments which you could now run on a gel. So if it's labeled with uh, P32, it will look like this. Uh, when I was a student and I was a postdoc, I would have done hundreds of these gels. And you put an X-ray film on it and you sit and read it from the bottom, you just read off the sequence. A lot of hard work, but you get about 100 or uh, 200 bases at a time. And then, came machines like the one I'm showing here is the LiPo sequencer that I worked on and that as you can see uh, there's a gel inside it uh, and you will load that gel and you'll get an image just like what you see on the left. LiPo sequencers are fluorescent tag but single dye machines so you will get an image exactly like what you're seeing on the left side but you could read 1200 bases I would say one of the first people who read 1200 bases would be me sitting over here, so I helped with that sequence of the early 90s. And at the same time, the market was actually dominated by the ABI machine, Applied Biosystems, at the 373 machine. And then when LIPO came up with the 4200 and got 1200 bases, they extended their box, as you can see, a little bump on the device, and that's the stretch machine. These two machines and other platforms as well, at the same time, generated chromatograms from the raw data that I just told you how it happens. And you can see, uh, you know, the A base is all shown, shown here as chromatogram in green. The T would be red and like that, and so on and so forth, so you could read the sequence. And then by the late 2000s uh, and late 90s, actually, the capillary machine showed up. What you're seeing on the right there is the ABI 3700, which is a 384 capillary machine. 300 of those machines sequence the first human genome. And then uh, the Amersham Megabase was also uh, available at that time, a 96 capillary machine. Gives you a little bit of a, uh, an idea of how these things happen. And then came next generation sequencing. And there, all you're doing is you're just uh, taking a genome breaking up into small pieces, adding known pieces of DNA that act pretty much like the primers I showed you in the previous picture. And then you can sequence by ligation, that's what resulted in the API solid device. Or you can do pyro sequencing, resulted in the Roche 54 machine, or the, uh, you can measure the hydrogen ions that pop out of the reaction in a polymerase extensive, and that's how the ion torrent technology came about. And then the one that a lot of you are familiar with, which is the reversible terminator chemistry that Illumina used, and pretty much dominated sequencing. And that happened through up to about 2013, 2014. And then third generation technology scheme, which is shown here on the left, is PAC Bio. It has a little connection to link it, I won't say more than that. Uh, so there, a single molecule is being sequenced. So, like, if you look on the PAC Bio side, it's a single molecule.
random or all of these bases are labeled and then when it goes through the polymerase light is emitted and then you are simply measuring fluorescence over time. Similarly, the also nanopore technology is the molecule of DNA or RNA is going through the nanopore, there's a change in current and simply you are measuring current over time. So there you can now know the difference between A, T, G and C going through that pore and you can reduce the sequence. What's the difference between what I just mentioned as first and second generation technology versus this is that in this case you're getting massive amounts of data, 20,000, 10,000 bases at a time. So as you can see from the early days of sequencing with about 75 bases in the 70s to 1,200 bases in the mid-90s when I was working on it to today you can do a billion bases per machine by third generation sequence. That's massive amounts of data you can generate with a single machine. At the same time, cost also went down dramatically. It actually beats Moore's law in computer science. It went significantly down when one genome was sequenced for a hundred million dollars. Today, you can get a full genome sequence for less than a thousand dollars and the goal for a lot of companies is to get it to about 250 dollars. Not there yet, I think, but there are companies who claim they can do it. So, what type of sequencing goes on? I've just given you a, a big picture. Lots of different uh, varieties of names are used, but generally speaking, it's whole genome sequencing where you sequence everything uh, that you can isolate as DNA or exome sequencing where you are just uh, sequencing the coding part. Sorry, go back. Uh, or expression sequencing where you are just sequencing RNA just to know what genes are turned on and off. So all other types of sequencing you are going to hear about, I'm sure, today is somehow connected to one of the varieties that I mentioned here. So, over the years, as different technologies and different uh, agencies started producing data, this is just an illustration of the GenBank database that I've used uh, for a long time from the 90s onwards. You can see the amount of sequence information that's going into it and the amount of people accessing it has gone up dramatically. The millions and millions of sequence being dumped into these databases. And open access to that data is significantly important. And several speakers in the inaugural function mentioned that. I want to emphasize that whatever you're doing in Kerala, open access is going to be important. Uh, here's another example. All the planned databases, you can see the usage from different countries. Look at India. Its access of MACE database is pretty significant. So all these databases are publicly available. Nobody's controlling this data as far as I know. So you need to start thinking like that. Open access is important because everybody benefits from it, from the farmer to the society. Okay. What's the next technology I want to talk about as far as genomic technologies goes? You saw what sequencing is. The other technology that you need to be aware of, which most of you are, is editing technology. So, uh, several of that shown here. Most of them simply involve some sort of a nuclease, like mega nuclease or sink fing finger nucleases that will cut uh, DNA and introduce changes, whether they're insertions or deletions. And then the one that's very famous, a lot of you uh, know about it and maybe even using it as CRISPR-Cas9 uh, method where you have a guide sequence that allows you to make precise changes. So whatever the method is, the good thing about gene editing is that it's now used extensively for therapeutic uh, purposes, quite a bit. You, you can change uh, your own T cells if you want. That's what's listed here as ex vivo. You can modify it or you can change your, your gene inside the cell itself using any of these technologies and then put it back into your body. Okay, and so that allows you to create ther therapies. So for example, cancer is very much uh, now several blood cancer types are being addressed that way. But there are many ways you can do it in vivo as well. Okay, so all these technologies, how, that, how has it helped uh, 
the growth of global agriculture. Until now, animal genomics, and I'm going to focus the rest of my talk on animal side for a few minutes, at least for a few minutes, I'll focus on the animal side. Uh, what, what people did was they'll sequence the animal genomes, you'll detect and catalog sequence variants from all kinds of uh, individuals, and then you use those genomic variations and select animals for specific measurable traits. For example, yield of milk is a huge trait that was selected using these technologies uh, in the United States. And then once you select those technologies, you implement it globally. My old company, GeneSeq, um, played a big role in it. And that's actually shown in a recent paper that I just accidentally saw only last week. Uh, this just show, shows you the red uh, map of the US shows you all the distribution of the Holstein uh, cattle in the United States that were genotyped. In fact, EPDs were measured on that. And then uh, the green dots are all the Angus cattle in the United States. And GeneSeq would have uh, helped genotype uh, a lot of these. are millions of animals involved in this. This is up to 2017. But what is important about genomic technologies is to make these changes, say milk yield in, in, in the Holstein animals, what took five to six years, they were able to do it with genomic technologies in one year. So that's what has happened so far. Now in the future, I think gene editing is going to make it even faster. You can predict genomic variations, go and modify it and see if those predictable genomic variations are there or not, or, or are they doing what you thought would happen. So here's a, a, a figure that I borrowed from uh, Jennifer Doudna, who's a Nobel laureate and who developed the CRISPR technologies a paper in January, uh, and you can see uh, this chart tells you in last 10 years how much uh, the CAS, CRISPR-Cas9 technology was used, and what she's saying is in the next 10 years, a uh, lot more uh, FDA-approved tests are going to uh, therapies are going to show up, and the point I just made about animals, you can see that multigenic traits are also going to be modified and evaluated with these editing technologies. So you can make progress incredibly fast uh, by incorporating all the sequencing ideas into editing ideas as well. So coming to Kerala, what can you do? So animal uh, protein production is one thing that I would recommend. In fact, when Sam asked me to give this talk, one of the things he said was, you should make some recommendation as to what can be done in Kerala. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next couple of minutes. Uh, you know that world population is going to be about 10 billion people by 2050. There's going to be a significant demand for animal proteins. Uh, in fact, protein demand is shooting up all over the world. That means you have to have a deep understanding of animal, animal biology through genomics to increase production, livestock, poultry, aquaculture. But at the same time, you got to make sure that you're not uh, contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. You also need to make sure very little antibiotics is being used because a lot of people do not like antibiotics being used in animal production. Uh, and then new production systems and management practices have to be developed as far as animal welfare goes. And all of this has to happen with cost uh, that are huge factors as far as doing things in India, particularly Kerala. And the question is, can Kerala use some of these technologies and leapfrog ahead of others? And the answer is yes. Uh, here's a, a, a graph that shows you the rise at the, of demand for meat all over the world. It's, it's actually pretty dramatic. In about 20 years, it's, the demand has almost doubled. And on the left, I'm just showing you a 10-year trend in India as well. There in India also, the demand for meat has doubled in about 10 years. So that means you got to have production also increase. And interestingly, Kerala only contributes about 2.3% of total meat production in India. So what can you do? So here are my suggestions. I'm just showing you papers I just found just by looking for papers. 
and actually half the people on this paper I know uh, amazingly. Here's the Indian bison, the gal. It looks, in my opinion, very good for meat. Okay, that's a uh, Indian bison, uh, a male animal, uh, sorry, a female animal shown here with a calf. That's been sequenced. And the interesting thing is, it's a species by itself, uh, boss gaurus, and it's not, as it, it, is, it is definitely a boss uh, genus, but it's not boss indicus or boss taurus. Okay, it's different. The chromosome numbers are also different. Similarly, there's another animal called gyal, which is boss frontalis. That has also been sequenced. The Chinese are paying a lot of attention to that particular animal. It's also known as mithun in Northeast India. What would I recommend about it? Again, if you, when they looked at the uh, genome analysis of this animal, they found out that gyal was actually a hybrid between a wild gyal and a boss indicus gyal. That's interesting because a lot of people in India have told me these animals are not easy to work with and because they are very wild. I disagree. And you'll see why, because somebody also developed an animal called the Mithun and they're already using it. And it's found in many countries around India as well as in India. I think a breeding program needs to start with this animal. This is just, again, suggestions I'm going to make. It's already been sequenced. Um, you can collect more animals and sequence them for desirable traits, and the two desirable traits will be docility and fertility. These are very well-documented traits in the boss taurus and boss indicus breeds. So you, you, could have, you, should have, you could have some people go observe these animals and pick the animals that show those traits. And once you sequence them, you'll find out the genes responsible for them. And then you can make a composite breed. In fact, you could back cross the Midhun into with the Gao and then finally cross it into Boss Taurus for meat traits. That's how you develop composite breeds. With that idea, a whole new industry can start in, in India because I think the Indian bison, particularly the Midhun proves it, has incredibly good uh, value. And the, and the Midhun is definitely a delicacy in Assam. It will also help conserve the animal, because both are actually threatened species. What bothers me is that China has a significant uh, interest in this animal, and I'm pretty sure they're working on developing it as a breed uh, and as a meat alternate solution. So people in Kerala need to think about it. Uh, entrepreneurs can start developing a, a, a breeding program by, with the idea of creating a whole industry uh, behind it. Uh, another one that I'm very fond of and, and promoting is uh, what is known as perimene, uh, which is pearl spot. I just randomly again look to see, are there people in India working on this? And to, to my uh, joy, I found a lot, there are a lot of people working on this in, in Kerala. So what can you do with that? That would be one species that I would definitely sequence and I would also look for traits like feed conversion because now you can grow these things it will convert to uh, sellable products pretty quickly fertility resistance to disease and adaptation to brackish waters uh, similarly the Atapadi and the Malabar uh, varieties of goat I found again people working on it I was I just showed you randomly two papers that I found, uh, which I'm happy. But interestingly, these two papers talk about the two breeds, one as a low prolific uh, goat breed and, uh, and the, another one as a, a high uh, non-prolific goat breed. I assume that means that their fertility is low. But then if you sequence them uh, and you're looking for traits, that's the kind of trait you'd be looking for. And since they are meat animals, you would look for feed conversion, marbling, tenderness. These are all uh, production traits. And I also found out Atapadi is resistant to uh, many diseases according to the National Bureau of Animal Genetic Resources, which is part of ICAR. Again, these are suggestions. Here's my uh, last uh, suggestion as far as human genetics goes. Again, I heard the earlier speaker say that you are not going to get into the human side of things. But here, if you do, here's the suggestion I have. 
one of the biggest weakness if you think of human genetics is the lack of phenotypical and clinical data without which you we can't do it much so that culture of collecting data has to be somehow has to somehow become part of the Kerala culture or the India culture. Uh, simply collecting samples and sequencing them is not going to get you anything until you have observable clinical phenotypes. Basic information, date of birth, sex, caste, test results, whatever you can about a particular patient needs to be documented. I found out from uh, a doctor in India that uh, actually medical students are trained and legally required to collect this. Uh, but he told me that hospitals, particularly large and small ones, do a good job of collecting data, but individual physicians rarely do. That needs to change if genetics has to be implemented into some sort of a, a program in, in India. Uh, the argument that too many <laughs> patients are there, that's why I don't have time, won't, won't, won't work. The other thing is, Information needs to transfer from a primary physician, let's say a pediatrician, to a family physician, from a family physician up to a cardiologist when, when the person gets old and has, uh, has a cardiac problem, or an oncologist if a person has cancer or any, any disease like that. So uh, data, information needs to move by from all uh, stratas of Care. without restriction too. I, I need to make that point as well. And in the meantime, if somebody collects a sample and sequences or genotypes it, that also needs to be incorporated into the patient data. With that, here's my biggest recommendation. The Kerala model is well known to everybody, uh, but I am going to suggest a Kerala wellness model. What does that mean? Well, we all boast Kerala is a very progressive state. Uh, definitely it is progressive in healthcare delivery and coverage. Uh, and, and what I would say is as soon as a baby is born, you collect a sample from that kid. Not blood, of course, no baby has enough blood to contribute, but you can always take a cheek swab and you can use that as a, and, and, and you can use that and bank it. You don't need to sequence it. You don't need to genotype it, but at least you can bank it. Why? As individuals age, you get age-related diseases like cancer and cardiology and problems. At that time, you can sequence, and that's what a lot of people do. They'll take, when, when somebody gets cancer, you, you, you sequence. But now, if you have a childhood sample that's already banked, you basically have a reference sample. That's your personal reference genome. You don't need to go to a database to find a common reference sequence. You can use your own reference sequence. Why is that important? Because when gene editing technologies are changing every day, they're improving, they're getting better, you should be able to go back to your reference sequence, make the changes, put your cells back, and create ther therapeutic solutions. This is a forward-thinking health approach, and it could be a model for the whole world. Definitely, there are cord banks in Kerala, and a lot of people contribute samples to the cord bank. This could just be a supplementary. It, it need not replace the cord bank, but it could work together. I think the medical community, society, doctors, everybody sitting in the audience here can debate this and see if this can be done. I think it's something you can do and should do. In my opinion, that is the future of healthcare. And if Kerala does this, Kerala could be a leader in this. In summary, this is a figure I stole from a, a tourism website. Everything about Kerala is always tourism, right? If there's a will, you can succeed. Uh, I'm glad that the audience includes scientists, entrepreneurs, and other investors, along with government people. Whatever you do, scientific data should be made accessible to everyone. Protein production systems, like I touched on, can be created in Kerala, and you can create new wealth and job opportunities.
Kerala could be a leader in cell replacement and gene editing technologies because this is just starting and it's easy to set up these kind of companies. The significant potential as a high job growth, a non-polluting industry. And you can create, as long as you can create the business climate to encourage investments in these kind of areas, things would look very good for Kerala. And medical tourism, which definitely grows in Kerala, you could add uh, this item as well. And thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, we can now proceed to the question-answer session. Uh, I'd, I'd request you to raise your hands and the mic will be brought to you. Just request you to just raise your hands. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ebi, for your, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. I just had a question when you talked about the protein uh, enhancement uh, industry and uh, observing traits. You know, what is the process that is involved in observing traits? Is that a kind of a labor intensive or is that a more R&D kind of thing? What is it that uh, is involved in the process? Just to give a layman like me an idea. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a scientific uh, process actually. Uh, it's not very labor intensive, but there are many ways to observe uh, and collect that kind of data. Basically, you, you're collecting phenotypes. Um, for example, I mentioned uh, the GAO docility. That's definitely an observed trait. You could have a forest official look, tag an animal, and and see, you know, these are, so now you have identified the animal, let's say a radio uh, collar or something like that, so you can monitor these animals, and you can look for docility. Are they docile versus aggressive animal, and then you pick the animal that's docile, and that's one way to observe a trait. Yes, it is a little bit of a labor intensive uh, method, but uh, you can observe a plant, you know, does the plant have a certain trait you're looking it's no different if you go to the field and observe an animal or you observe a human being. The, does this person have a visible sign of cancer? That would be an observ observable trait. Uh, so, yes, it is labor intensive, but that's what scientists do. One I hope I answered your yeah, question. Thank you very much. I just one more quick question. Yeah, sure. On the, on the, uh, the bio bank that you mentioned, have other countries tried it out or uh, is it an established practice? And, uh, and if not, uh, would you be able to help us uh, put together a paper on the concept itself? Absolutely. Uh, I don't know whether what I suggested has been done by other people, but it's not a complicated thing to do at all. Uh, when you collect cells, let's say from your cheek, uh, it needs to be stored in a certain way. Uh, and collected in a certain way so that it stays for a long time. You know, you're not storing it for two years, you're storing it for the lifetime of an individual. So let's say you're storing it for 100 years, so to speak, or even more if somebody wants to have uh, access to that data down the road. So it'll be very similar to somebody collecting cord cells and preserving them and storing them uh, in minus 80 or even liquid nitrogen. So things like that. You you got to you got to have a, a, a plan put in place, but these are not uh, things that cannot be done. I am not sure of uh, anybody else doing it. That's why I suggested that this be tried and done. And, and, and definitely, I'll be. That's one of the things I'll be very interested in getting involved. In. Thank you very much, Dr. Abi. Thank you. Anybody else has any questions? Yeah, I, I'll shoot a question, Abi. You mentioned about the various uh, breeding uh, uh, breeding approaches for breeding the various uh, uh, 
you know, uh, cattle. Uh, but uh, this will take time, right? Uh, typically, how many years would it take for such a program to become, like, uh, uh, give, give output? Uh, that's what I touched on when I mentioned uh, five, six years is standard for those kind of process. But with genomic technologies, you should be able to reduce that time significantly. Yeah. Why but you still need to breed and get an offspring and then breed uh, again. You know, another offspring. So you're talking, this is not a two year plan, let's say 10, 15 year plan, eventually. Yeah. But if you don't start today, you're not going to get anywhere. But, uh, but why I asked was that, I mean, one of the reasons why I asked was that uh, we are seeing new technologies coming up in cell culture and uh, uh, plant-based uh, meats, right? There are two ways of trying, yes. people trying to avoid uh, killing animals. Uh, they are all like sort of premature and expensive at this stage, but uh, in 10 years' time, uh, won't those uh, two technologies come up to replace uh, animals? Hope not. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of uh, test tube meat. I rather eat something from an animal than from a tube. So, <laughs> hi, Abe. Um, this is Ramchand. Oh, hi. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. <clears throat> yeah, I have a question. It's a technical question. Uh, sure. Since you have been involved with, you know, sequencing various procedures from the very beginning, uh, I just want to know: uh, anybody is using? Raman spectroscopy is almost 100 years and I think Raman spectroscopy is one of the most powerful technology in structural identification. So since uh, in sequencing the variations of structures are there, especially for mutation and uh, thus this electromagnetic radiation, the visible region can be used for this variation and anybody is working on that. I have been thinking about this for quite some time, that's why I thought. I just want to know anybody is working on that. I have no idea. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abi Oman. I'd now like You're to. Welcome. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce uh, our second speaker for the keynote address, Dr. Satish Chandran. Dr. Satish Chandran is a biotech scientist and a serial entrepreneur with nearly 35 plus years in leadership positions at early and mid stage biotechnology companies and at large pharmaceutical companies. Dr. Satish is the founding director, president, and CEO of Lay Sciences, and concurrently is also the CEO and director of Prodigy Biotech. He has built and led teams in multiple startup companies to develop novel concepts into several commercially viable products in the areas of vaccines, drugs, biologics, and medical devices. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Let me see if I present this. Uh, give me a second. Well, good morning, everyone, mm, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, particularly many thanks to Sam uh, for getting me involved and to participate in this conference. So if I may, I was going to begin with a self-introduction, but since you did a great job, I don't need to do that. That gives, saves me a few minutes uh, of that. Um, uh, I'm going to focus on microbiome. Apologies to, until, until this uh, uh, few minutes ago when Sam spoke, uh, is when I learned about the mic microbiome program in Kerala, and I had no idea that there was one ongoing already. Uh, I should I should I shouldn't have second guessed, but I did. Um, but so uh, pardon me for taking me taking walking you through the basics. But I'm going to give you a case study in the, in two years how we have uh, um, the company Prodigy where I where I, I run this company. I'm the CEO. Where we have taken an idea, a concept into a product that we are taking into clinical trials using a microbiome approach. And that may be a good case study to be emulated elsewhere. Okay, so I'll start with the background on microbiome and disease, and then a few suggestions on how you might build, build a program, no different than what I have done here. Okay, I'll skip the self-introduction. 
I, I, I mean, as, as, as you rightly pointed out, uh, I, I, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been in many biotech companies, five, six of them, um, mostly based on novel technologies. I started the first DNA vaccine company in the late 80s and then went on to build an RNAi company, the first RNAi company in the early 2000s, and then a cardiac surgery company. So um, I always live with the science of business and business and science, or that's where I live. And uh, the method of uh, solving a problem has not been a, not been daunting. Whether Dr. it is Sadish, a uh, very sorry to interrupt you. I would request you to put it on a slideshow. Just oh, yeah, my the apologies. presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Is that better? Uh, is that is that better? Yes, I think so. It is. All right. Okay. So the the tool you use to solve a problem doesn't matter. It can. It is always multidisciplinary, and particularly as I go to microbiome. Um, I talk about microbiome. It is a multidisciplinary field. There are there have been genomics involved, um, and complex genomics, the metagenomics, sequencing bacteria, thousands and thousands of bacteria in in your gut and other places, and uh, the bioinformatic analysis, uh, the scientists, the physicians, how they came together to solve a problem. That's exactly what I'm going to walk you through. Okay, first of all, uh, for those uninitiated, uh, microbiome, all mucosal compartments and some non-mucosal compartments are colonized with microbes. That's a fact. Okay, these include bacteria, yeast, fungi, viruses, and even bacteriophages. There are 30, estimated 30 trillion cells in our body. Okay but only a third of it or less is human cells. You have more microbial cells than there are human cells. 99% of the unique genes in our body are bacterial. Only 1% is human. Until the advent of PCR and deep sequencing and metagenomics, the human gut was estimated to contain only 200 microbes, 200 unique microbes. Now, the current total, as of a month ago, was is greater than 4,300. 4, Until recently, the human lung was, was supposed to be sterile. It is not. Now we know there are over a dozen microbes that live near the alveoli all the time. In those who, who, who don't have a disease, those who have a disease may have different kind. So. So the information has changed. And why, why is that information important? That's what I'm going to walk you through. So there is no, first of all, there is no one ideal microbiome. There is no prescriptive microbiome that one, one must have. All we can agree on is that you have to have a diversity in the microbiome, and I'll take you through that. And our microbiome changes depending on what you eat. How, whether you exercise or not, what drugs you take, what comorbidities you might have, such as uh, diabetes, for example, whether the child was born by a C-section or a vaginal birth, whether this ch child is breastfed or not fed by my, uh, um, uh, with breast milk. Your friends, Sam talked about interaction with the nature, such as with plants and animals, yet exchanging microbes. Zoonotic viruses don't come from nothing. They come from, they jump species. So this is what microbial world is. So total interaction of a human with everything that we do our, 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 and our, our, our surroundings. Okay, let's talk, I'm going to focus on the gut. Microbiome exists everywhere. It's in your eye, it's in your nose, in your, in, on your teeth, in your teeth, uh, on the skin, everywhere. But I'm going to focus on the gut microbiome. Okay. A, our gut forms and, and structurally functions well, and this has been known for a long time, using germ-free mice and comparing with non-germ-free mice. It, 
it, it is actually modeled because of an interaction with the microbes. It functions well because it interacts with the, the microbes. There are few classes, few of them here that I'm going to walk you through, which is about a, uh, seven or eight of them. Classes of bacteria that predominate these are the firmicutes, the bacterioides, the actinobacteria, fusobacteria, and so on. I won't read through this, but these are the bacteria that are predominant there, but by no means that they are the only ones. As the gut, the, from the, as you go down the esophagus into uh, the stomach and into the colon and in, and in, in, the, in the large intestine, the oxygen levels are different. The microbial population is different. Even in the large intestine, the proximal segment has a different set of microbes than the transverse segment and the distal segment. And, uh, and the fecal matter is a small representation of what is happening, what is extruded. Many of these microbes are attached to the epithelial cells. They don't leave. They, they have methodologies, they have figured out how to stay on with the mucosa, and some are sloughed out. So it's a dynamic process and in, for health and disease, and with this is where we'll go next. Okay, what, what is in the gut should stay in the gut. It cannot enter into the systemic circulation. And how, is the, how does that happen? Our epithelial lining, epithelial lining, which is the enterocytes that line the intestines, they are tightly packed, and they are called tight junctions for the same reason. They, and they have immune cells, they have, they have protein, they, on, only those materials that are meant to be in the systemic circulation are absorbed biochemically into, by the enterocytes and passed on behind into the blood system, into the blood vessels. If that harmony is disturbed, if that gap junction, that, that gap junctions are disturbed, or it is, we call it gut leakage, you have a gut leakage. And when you have gut leakage, things that you don't want to be in the systemic circulation end up in the systemic circulation. That's when bad things happen. And, and we call it gut dysbiosis. And I'll share these slides through Dr. Raju and then anybody can access that. Today, after nearly 20 years of research in the United States when the microbiome effort started, we know that microbiome is associated with several diseases. The gut-brain accident, neurodegenerative disorders, recently an organism has been found in the, in, in the gingiva, in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the gum of tea, uh, that, that, ha that ha is a causative organism for Alzheimer's. Similarly for Parkinson's disease, autism and so on. There's a gut-lung axis. We, 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 we have learned that there is a, the microbes are relevant in the progression of the disease. The gut-liver axis is the most studied one in NAFLD, in NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and alcoholic hepatitis and so on, which I'm going to touch on later. In autoimmune diseases, including psoriasis and lupus and so on. I, I won't go into all of this, but it is important that the gut dysbiosis and microbiome shifts uh, associated, uh, uh, they go across multiple therapeutic areas and new correlations are being developed daily. It all begins with a correlation and then to causality. Okay? The enterococcus, so somebody who has a, hemi, a, a bone marrow transplant, for example, those individuals who have enterococcus, enterococcal bloom in their large intestine, they have very poor, very worse outcome than those who don't. That's been established. A singular organism, which I'm going to focus on today, responsible for alcoholic liver disease, or it's called alcoholic hepatitis, it, that, is, that satisfy all of the Cox postulates, work, which is causality, was discovered in 2019. And that's a product I'm, we're developing here at Prodigy. I won't go into this much other than to say 
on the left is a healthy one and on the right is the altered microbiota that increases permeability. You can see the gap junctions have, uh, are opened up and therefore um, materials get into the portal circulation f uh, from the gut and then into the liver, damaging the liver, causing NASH, NFL, cirrhosis, and so on. Okay. Again, this is a, the etiology of the disease is essentially overuse of antibiotics. Antibiotics dis indiscriminately kill many bacteria, good and bad. And the, when the good bacteria are removed, the bad bacteria get to spread later. And though that's the beginning of dysbiosis in most cases. And that leads to immune dysfunction and then leakage, uh, uh, gut leakage that leads to liver cell necrosis and liver failure. Okay, I'm going to give you a case study now. It's alcoholic hepatitis. Uh, there are many things that happen and if somebody who abuses alcohol, um, alcohol will be converted into aldehyde and it will have, it will affect the, every cell including the liver cell and the mitochondrial function. That's a known by chemical feature. But there is something more that happens. Those who abuse alcohol and present themselves as alcoholic hepatitis have actually destroyed the mucosal lining and opened up the gap junction. That results in the translocation of bacteria, LPS, lipopolysaccharide, and other toxins from the intestine into the liver, and, and resulting in inflammation. And of course, uh, it's a non-biochemical transit of these molecules across the, across the intestine into the systemic circulation that causes alcoholic liver disease. Okay, it's a more, alcoholic hepatitis is the most severe form of alcoholic liver disease and is associated with a high mortality. High enough, there are 30% of those individuals who present themselves with alcoholic hepatitis will die in six months. Okay, that has been known since tens of years. It's been known for a long time. Okay, the only, only medication available today to treat these people are corticosteroids to prevent inflammation. In the United States, the average cost to treat a patient is 46000 Okay, This is $46,000 and that is of 2010, it's probably twice that. They usually end up with liver transplant that costs about a quarter million. Okay. Here is a study that was published by Bernd Schnabel and his group at the University of California, San Diego. He identified, a, he made an association using metagenomic analysis, 16S RNA followed by metagenomic analysis. He associated a particular enterococcus, enterococcus fecalis was identified to be the causative, uh, I'm sorry, associated with this disease. On the right side, you see a graph, the flat line shows people who don't have um, so, this particular bacterium that produces a toxin called cytolysin. If this, you and I, all of us carry that bacteria, but those who have abused alcohol have the cytolysin positive ones. The cytolysin positive bacteria, which got enriched in those people, causes death. In 180 days, nearly 89% of the people are dead. And, and he associated it with Enterococcus fecalis, cytolysin positive. But association is where you start. So you start with the phenotype, that we mentioned this, you start with the phenotype of death in such individuals. You compare against the, those who are not dying and the healthy, and you fi he figured out this is, there is a relationship here. Association leads to causal, determining causality. How do we prove causality? Over the last three years, uh, Prodigy, with, along working with uh, um, uh, Bernd Schnabel's group and a group in Hyderabad, Reagene uh, Biosciences, we established the causality. We showed that uh, it, it using a three-dimensional uh, bioprinted model, showed that the, the likely cause of the, the toxicity of the hepatocytes, the leakage of cytolysin, not the bacterium, the cytolysin itself. 
and we went on to show that you can remove the Cox postulates by removing cytolysin using an antibody, uh, a, te a technology that we develop here, developed here, that you are able to reverse the process. The beauty about liver is that it's highly regenerative. So it's, we were able to reverse the disease process. And we are, uh, uh, we are moving it forward into an IND and to the uh, for clinical studies at the moment. So that's the case study. But this intervention, does not have to be the methodology that I just stated. You, there, could, there are probiotic approaches, there are antimicrobial, just like our, our, our technology does. There are pre probiotics, as you know, are bacteria, um, live bacterial products, yogurt being one of them, but a much uh, yogurt is not sufficient. You need billions of bacteria. Yogurt has only uh, several millions. <clears throat> Prebiotics that will a fiber-rich diet, for example, that will change the bacterial flora and make it more diverse, or a postbiotic that will that 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 will change the metabolites that the microbi microbes make and therefore bring harmony to the um, to the to the large colon. There are many companies here, and and each of them have unique technologies: the probiotic, the antimicrobial. This is just a sprinkling of companies who have successfully developed and, or are developing products to adjust the microbiome. Here is a study that was done, which is appearing in the cover of hepatology in a few months. It is online at the moment. Bern Schnabel did this study with us. <clears throat> it showed that on the left, you are looking at ALT. Um, a, a, a serum ALT level is an indication of hepatotoxicity. And you can see on the leftmost is the control. Um, uh, IgY treated, uh, control, untreated, followed by I, the, our treatment uh, at different concentrations. And you can see at a higher concentration, you are able to decrease the serum ALT levels, showing that you could prevent um, hepatotoxicity using anticytolysin immunoglobulins. And similarly, on the right hand side, you see that the, uh, uh, the fat deposits in the <clears throat> liver are also decreased. And here is an image. On the left is the no treatment, and the right, on the rightmost side is the treated sample. OK. Let's quickly move on to the next couple of minutes. I want to move on to the, 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 for a discussion, to be initiated discussion here, in the, hopefully in the QA session, is how do we build a microbiome program? I walked you through where an, a phenotypic observation resulted in an association that resulted in a causality and, and developing an intervention, all in two years and $10 million. OK. <clears throat> uh, and how do we build a microbiome program? OK. So first of all, why, why should Kerala do, um, a, a, do a microbiome program for itself? Because people are different. People of different regions are different. Here is an example of alcoholic liver disease. The alcoholism, the abuse of alcohol is the same across the world. The percentage of people who abuse alcohol is the same. But you look at the ALD numbers, alcoholic liver disease numbers, US has 38%, for, or Mexico has 31%. Look, go over to Japan, ALD is 13%. Not because they don't abuse alcohol. So the diet matters. They, their genetics matters. What they do matters. So the, the microbial shift of Kerala is unlikely to be like anybody else's. You have to do your own to figure that out. And that is for every disease, whether it's diabetes, whether it is alcoholic liver disease, or any other. OK? And I'm showing you the same picture again, that because we are, we interact differently. People of Kerala does not interact like the people in the Western world or anywhere else. You can borrow the science that has been developed in the United States and apply it to Kerala. You have to develop your own. And that's why you need one. OK? Um, and you have endless opportunities. You have endless opportunities for many companies to, to deal with so many different diseases, from IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, liver diseases, metabolic syndrome, obesity, atherosclerosis, diabetes, and so on. And I mean, it's innumerable. OK. Where do we begin? First, you begin at knowledge base. It's a multidisciplinary approach. Of course, you need to be focused. 
and, and it, it starts with genomics uh, of health and disease indications. Okay? There are this person who is a group of people that who are healthy, who are similar otherwise, but healthy, uh, but with disease. You start with associations, genomics of that, these micro, microbes and the human, and that, that, that's a starting point. You start developing associations using 16S RNA, RNA analysis or in the metagenomics of microbes, human combined human genomics, transcriptomics, and possibly metabolomics. I won't get into that. How the, the bile acid itself, if you have the wrong kind of organism, it has a different conjug conjugation and metabolites that are formed. Some of them can cause the gut to be leaky. That's another place. So this is what we would build. You don't build them all together. You start with the first step, which is starting with the, met, uh, the phenotype followed by metagenomics. The key ingredient is govern, go, go, the government has to initiate this program. That's what I'm hearing you're doing. That's, that's great. You need leading academic laboratories and industry partnership because there are technologies to it. Even the collection of the fecal matter to preserve all the 4,300 bacteria that are in your fecal matter, you need new technologies of how to preserve that, how to transport it to the center and, and, and to be able to sequence that one bacterium. Abby just talked to us about the singular DNA sequencing. These are the technologies that you need. You need key opinion leaders, scientists, and more importantly, you need physicians along the side. It's a team effort. The scientists include possibly chemists and physicists and biologists and molecular biologists, all different computer scientists and so on. You need centers of excellence to, that develop new technologies to deal with each one of them, and the industry spawns from it. To determine causality, you need to develop models of disease to test the test of hypothesis, and that you know that you need, you need key opinion leaders, scientists, and physicians. Finally, this is a, a totally an industry thing, and this is how you spawn industry, because there are multiple modalities, as I told you. You can have companies with prebiotics, even fecal transplant approaches, or probiotics, postbiotic, targeted microbials, and, and that's how you would build a, a, an organization of that kind, or, or a or a te technology, uh, I mean, the, a, a programs of this kind. I'll take any questions and answers, uh, questions that I can answer. Sadish, uh, this is Ramchand. Hey, Good evening. I, I know it's post uh, 12 o'clock there. Hey, it's uh, nearly one something, oh. one third. Okay. So um, I have one question. You know, the, uh, you are talking about the gut microbiome, and also the gut contains a lot of endotoxins or lipopolysaccharides because of the bacterial lysis. Now, uh, in the hepatic conditions like, you know, or uh, when because of high levels of alcohol consumption, paracellular permeability changes. So how the protection of LPS goes inside? Because LPS also has been implicated in certain liver diseases. So how this is uh, protected that, you know, it doesn't go through uh, paracellular, or I, I mean increased uh, the transport phenomena through paracellular. That's my first question. The second thing is that, you know, I know that you are working with the IGY, we sequestrate the bacteria which is responsible for hepatitis. Does this IGY, especially crude IGY, can sequestrate this lipopolysaccharides too? So, I'll, I'll answer the second question first. Um, antibodies like immunoglobulins or IGY particularly, they're very poor. Um, in interacting with the polysaccharides, uh, they are better with protein. So, in my experience, anti-LPS is tough to get, and the and the binding constants are very weak. So, it's very challenging. The, so, the approach should be you're correct in that. In 
it is not only cytolysin that is uh, that is getting into the liver, but systemically LPS and many other things are leaking out in a, those who alco abuse alcohol and have alcoholic liver disease. Usually, there's, you, the people don't die of liver disease; they die of multi-organ failure because of LPS, sepsis. So the focus has to be the eventual focus has to be how do you stop gut leakage? That's the question that is still out there. We need to figure out. I don't know the answer. We need to figure this out. Stopping gut leakage is paramount to many diseases. I mean, alcohol is an extreme state. Inflammatory bowel disease, those individuals also have gut dysbiosis and leakage. There are many diseases that cause the same thing. The gut leakage and gut inflammation is the core of the problem. And that's, and, and, and that's, that's challenging. It's, we, we don't know that, how to deal with that yet. Thank you. We can take one more question. Hello, Dr. Sadish, can you hear me? I am yes, Sadhu Thomas from a scientist in Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology, Dirvanandavira. I do have a uh, small question. You have something, you talked about the probiotics. In that context, my question is, do you recommend the, in the therapeutic intervention, the probiotic intervention or the other uh, stool transplant or the microbiota transplant? Which one do you recommend? So, uh, there have been success in all of them. There is a company called Ceres Therapeutics. They got an approval from the FDA for Clostridium difficile infection using a, a probiotic approach. They, we, we, they call it LBP, live bacterial product, which is nothing but a, 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 a 10 trillion ba bacterial, comp, a mixed bacteria, essentially mimicking a fetal transplant uh, in capsules. That's what their product is. And that has successfully uh, completed clinical trials and shown to be success, uh, was successful in uh, clearing Clostridium difficile. Fecal transplant, in my opinion, has worked in 99% in of the time. Uh, it is and highly recommended. The problem is controlling it. For example, there were two recent deaths in the United States with a fecal trans, through fecal transplant, a very highly con contagious as well as uh, um, resistant, antibiotic resistant bacteria got transferred. Those individuals died. So. The so FDA is focused on how do you control that. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah, it's okay. But uh, if we are taking the probiotic as an individual uh, for the treatment, there may be a chance of the transmission of the antibiotic resistance genes also. Currently, to my knowledge, I think nobody is checking the antimicrobial resistance genes present in the bacterial system. Yeah, so this was a, this was a two instances of a fecal transplant. but. LBP approach, there has been no issues of antibiotic resistance because they are pre-screened bacteria that is introduced. Um, I, I, I think uh, probiotic is, uh, I, th I think our approach to treatment will be a combination approach. It will be a pro and pre and possibly a postbiotic as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can take one last question before we split for the 10 minute tea break. All right, uh, I'd request everyone to uh, proceed for the tea break. It's a 10 minute tea break and we have more exciting sessions lined up. Thank you. Thank you.
I'd uh, request all the delegates to please for the next session.
in the last two decades, biology has become data science. One of the most critical aspects of biology, it is the, it is the analysis of data that has made bioinformatics the most important fields in biology. Significant growth in bioinformatics is possible with the explosive growth of artificial intelligence and machine learning. In the next few sessions today, you will be hearing a lot about this. And now I would like to introduce you to a pioneer in bioinformatics, Dr. Achut Shankar Nair. Dr. Achut Shankar is the HOD Department of Computer Science, Biology and Informatics, University of Kerala. He did his studies from the College of Engineering, Trivandrum, further IIT Madras, Bombay, University of Cambridge, and University of Kerala. Holds two PhDs in engineering and music. He is also a teacher and visiting professor in various institutions, both within India and abroad. He also authored 15 books in English and Malayalam, numerous scholarly articles, and a number of research publications jointly with students. He held a membership in Kerala State Higher Education Council, QSAT Syndicate, Kerala University Senate, Academic Council and Research Council. He is also the recipient of Kerala Government's Young Scientist Award in 1991, Engineering Teachers National Award 1994 by ISTE, National Teachers Award by Indian National Science Academy in 2013, the Wycombe Mallavi Foundation's Award for Excellence in Social Service 2014, and P.T. Bhaskara Panikar Award in 2019. He and his team worked closely with Sam in the pr preparation of the proposal of KGDC. Very good morning to one and all. Sam Santosh, Dr. P. V. Unnikrishnan, other distinguished, uh, Professor Saji Gobinath, Sri Balagopal, other distinguished uh, delegates for this one day seminar. My role today is to chair this session uh, in which we have three speakers. Dr. Jeff Wall, Dr. Vinod Skaria, and Dr. Ramesh Hariharan. Dr. Jeff Wall, I understand, is coming online. He's here. He's here. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, let me preface the chair's remarks by congratulating the government of Kerala and also KDISC for spawning yet another dream in the science and technology field in Kerala. I think this project this uh, new initiative is going to be a very, very important one. I would liken it to the starting of the Keltron in 1970s uh, because Kerala has been waiting for a very long time to see a major initiative in the field of bioinformatics and allied areas. And it has become a reality now. The Department of Computational Biology and Bioinformatics is mighty pleased that we are now placed in a canvas, a recognizable canvas of the whole state and I am sure every university in Kerala feels so. Uh, without uh, any further remarks, I would now go on to uh, start the session off. We have the first talk by Dr. Jeff Wall. We will approximately have 20 minutes each for the talk. Uh, Dr. Jeff Wall, I am very happy to see you again. You are, you are a honorable visitor to the University of Kerala a few years ago when Dr. Sam Santosh brought you to the university. Dr. Jeff Wall is a statistical and human geneticist with more than 20 years of experience in developing new computational methods and analyzing large-scale genetic data sets. Much of his recent human work has focused on resource building and genetic analysis of large cohorts in South and East Asia through the Taiwan Precision Medicine Initiative and Genome Asia 100K project. So uh, I welcome Dr. Jeff Wall to make his presentation in about 20 minutes. And uh, since 
Dr. Vinod's career, the next speaker, would like to leave at 12 o'clock for another meeting. We'll take the questions for this session together after the 20 minutes uh, of Vinod's career also. Thank you very much and uh, over to you, Dr. Jeff Wall. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nair, for that introduction, Dr. Santos for inviting me, and uh, to all of you for attending. I want to talk uh, about one, one of my scientific interests and then try to bring it into why I think it's relevant for the, the KGDC project. So, um, so what I'm, what I'm going to talk about is, is something called uh, inbreeding or consanguinity, uh, which is simply just uh, what happens when an individual's parents are closely related to each other. And we have known for a long time that this consanguinity is associated with bad outcomes, so increased disease. Um, and this is true in, in humans, animals, plants, all, all living things. Um, and it's, it's especially relevant in um, you know, those societies where you have uh, cultural practices that encourage marriages between relatives. And, and many of those are in, here in South Asia um, and, and in neighboring countries. Uh, but it's also true for animals um, and, and this includes, for example, endangered species that have very fragmented habitats. It also includes uh, specific breeds where artificial selection can cause the same type of problem. So uh, just a, a brief cartoon version of, of what happens when there's inbreeding. This is a, a picture of a pedigree, so you can imagine uh, a grandmother and grandfather, a sister and brother, and a, a child at the very end, or this could be more likely uh, in, you know, animal breeding, for example. Um, and what happens with inbreeding is that sometimes these, uh, these lines here represent different chromosomes, they're colored differently, and we know that uh, the general process of inheritance means that individuals inherit some mosaic of the chromosomes of their parents. And what inbreeding causes is that sometimes you inherit the same stretch of chromosome from the mother's side and the father's side. Uh, and this results in DNA where you have a long stretch of what we call homozygosity, or you can just think of it as a long stretch where the DNA is, is actually the same in the two copies of a chromosome that you have. Uh, and so it turns out that using uh, statistical techniques, you can look at this distribution of the numbers and the lengths of these stretches of homozygosity, and you can use that to estimate the degree of inbreeding. Um, and this could be, for example, uh, marriages between first cousins, or first cousins once removed, second cousins, or uh, uncle-niece marriages. So uh, I'll talk briefly about some of the data sets that I've worked on, um, primarily in South Asia through the um, Genome Asia projects, we've analyzed a uh, little more than 5,000 uh, whole genome sequences from individuals uh, from India, uh, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, um, primarily from medical cohorts, but also from uh, specific castes or uh, scheduled tribes. Um, and then we have 
a separate study um, that looked at whole exome data from uh, more than 1,000 families that had rare and at the time undiagnosed genetic diseases. So just to give you an overview, um, consanguinity is common. These are three uh, mostly urban cohorts, South Indians here on the, on the left, uh, Pakistanis in the center, and uh, Bengalis, both from Bangladesh and from West Bengal uh, on the right. Uh, and so these are color coded. So you can see that although many individuals are, do not have consanguinous, uh, or, or the result of consanguinous marriages, there's also a substantial number of individuals that do. Um, you can also look at this uh, for separate groups and within, uh, within India, so, so on the x-axis and y-axis are different ways of measuring uh, inbreeding and each of these are labels of different groups and just as, uh, as you might expect, the, the most isolated of groups um, are the ones that have the highest degrees of inbreeding. So this would include a small group called the Toto, found uh, in West Bengal, um, uh, the Jarwa and Onga from the Andaman Islands, and the Toda, which is a, a, you know, a scheduled tribe group from uh, the Nilgiri Hills in Tamil Nadu. Um, so, I don't have time to go into it here, but there's actually evidence that all four of those groups practice um, what's called active inbreeding and avoidance. So, uh, so roughly speaking, there's sort of, uh, most populations fall along a line here um, that corresponds something roughly like, you know, random mating or random choice of, of uh, you know, mates for marriage. But uh, individuals that are, or groups that are above that line um, are ones where the measure of, of inbreeding based on these long runs of homozygosity shows that there's less of that than you would otherwise expect. So these are groups that maybe uh, historically have have marriage patterns that discourage marriage with close relatives. Uh, one other thing that we uh, found that is, is kind of interesting and relevant is that uh, when we looked at individuals uh, from, a, uh, from a particular group uh, in, in the Birbham district in West, a uh, West Bengal that uh, individuals that self-identified as having, as their parents being first cousins, actually had a range of different levels of genetic inbreeding, including some individuals whose, whose parents were actually unrelated. Oh, that's over here. So like 40% of individuals who self-identify as having their parents as first cousins, when you look at the genetics, it looks like their parents were unrelated to each other. Um, and, uh, and even the ones whose parents do seem to be related, it's, it's quite a range. Um, so this is just, uh, you know, one way of saying that, that genetics itself can often provide information that's hard to tease out just from surveys of people. Um, so you might ask, well, why do we care? Um, you can look at, for example, how many mutations that you find within someone's genome that uh, are thought to be bad for you. Um, and it turns out that the higher the degree of inbreeding, the more of these mutations individuals have on average. And so these are different levels of, of consanguinity um, and color-coded for these different groups. And you know, roughly speaking, so, sorry about that. Um, roughly speaking, the more inbreeding there is, uh, the more of these harmful mutations you have. And, and another way of viewing that 
Uh, so in our familial study, we looked at, we tried to find causal mutations causing these rare diseases. Um, and there's a, a large difference in the degree of inbreeding in the, in the probands for dominant mutations where you expect that inbreeding has no effect at all and recessive mutations where uh, the inbreeding causes uh, individuals to inherit the same uh, harmful allele from both sides of their ancestry. So, so this gives us a way of quantifying essentially the increased uh, disease burden caused by consanguinity. Um, for these very rare diseases, um, individuals whose parents are second cousins, they have a threefold increased risk. Uh, but individuals whose parents are first cousins, it's, it's a 50-fold increased risk. So it, it can be quite substantial. Um, and this is, poses a, a substantial burden on the healthcare system as well. Um, so I'll, I'll return to, the, to this subject. I just wanted as a sort of side note to say that uh, you know, studies like this in, in humans are also relevant for other species. Um, so just as a, a totally unrelated side note, I, I have a side project that works with uh, an endangered species called the California condor, um, which is, it's a vulture found in North America and it's actually the largest flying, well, it's the largest bird of any sort in North America. Um, and this is, this uh, species, they actually went extinct in the wild uh, 50 years ago. Um, there was a captive breeding program that has been quite successful and now they have been reintroduced back into the wild. Um, and there are several hundred individuals currently. Um, but all California condors have, have undergone a lot of inbreeding because um, every living animal now is descended from 13 founders of this captive breeding program. And actually, it turns out almost all of them are, in, are descendants of only eight of those individuals. Uh, so uh, it turns out that there's a, a lethal disease that affects California condors called condor dystrophy. Um, and, and it seems like it's at increased frequency because just by chance or, or bad luck, two of the founders were carriers of this mutation. So it's a recessive disease, meaning that you need to inherit two copies of the bad allele before you're affected. Um, so what we did is we sequenced a bunch of, of condors, including individuals that had the disease, this condor dystrophy, some individuals known to be carriers, and other individuals that we knew to be unaffected. And we could use uh, the genetics to identify sort of the part of the condor genome where the bad mutation is. It, it's actually really difficult to identify the specific mutation, but we think it's, um, it affects this gene uh, that's uh, related to the set D2 gene in, hu in humans. Sorry again. And that gene uh, in humans is known to cause multiple neurodevelopmental disorders. So the, the value of this is that we can then develop a, a diagnostic tool um, to separate out the unaffected carriers of this chondro dystrophy mutation from individuals that are not carriers. And this allows for um, selective breeding to be able to diminish the frequency of this disease in this population. Um, so th this is, I mean, I think, to my knowledge, the first example of using genetics to, to actually proactively um, be able to screen in, in an endangered species. But I think that this is something that's probably going to become more common. Um, so for example, here in Kerala, you all have a, a species called uh, the lion-tailed macaque. Um, found only in the Western Ghats, 
and, and this is this is an endangered species. So its uh, population size is is low. The the um, international organizations are worried that long term that long term health or future of the species is in danger, and that's because um, you know the this lion tailed macaque lives in in forest, and the forest in the Western Ghats is becoming increasingly fragmented because of development, mostly of tea plantations, um, and the. And these monkeys, they don't move across the tea plantations. They stay only in the forest. Um, so, you know, my personal belief is that uh, endangered species like this are part of, of Kerala's biodiversity and potentially should be included in in the species that it will be studied. And, you know, for the 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 genome project that KGDC. Um, Related, and uh, and if so, then by sequencing and analyzing the genomes of individuals, you can understand more about the the health of the population, whether these groups are isolated from each other, whether they're suffering from inbreeding, and and that might lead to potential management um, decisions that might include. Uh, moving individuals occasionally from one forest habitat to another. Um, so in, in addition to uh, endangered species, we have the same issues that happen when you have uh, animal breeds or plant varieties, um, because these are often, uh, they often undergo very strong artificial selection. So the breeders determine uh, who breeds with who, and, and because of that, sometimes you have the same thing. You have a lot of inbreeding that happens because you're trying to breed for a certain trait. Um, and so once again, genome sequencing can be, and sort of the bioinformatic analysis that would follow that can be used to help check for the, the genetic health of a particular breed or variety. And it can also help with management decisions like whether you need to do some deliberate outcrossing, for example. Um, and, and this is something that's occurred over and over. Um, you know, one extreme example that's, it's not a, a, a livestock animal, but it's a, a dog breed. There, there's one dog breed called the Norwegian Lundehund, um, which has a whole host of problems, including very low fertility. Many of the uh, the puppies die within the first two weeks of life, um, and even the adults have this really common uh, gastrointestinal disorder that can that can kill them. And, and it's thought that all of these have occurred due to excessive uh, inbreeding among the breed, trying to keep a certain appearance. Um, but having very few individuals with which to work with. And so that, that's sort of an example that, you know, it, it's, it's not just, um, it's not just endangered species. It's, you know, any time we as humans control the breeding practices of a particular animal or plant, if you don't do it carefully, things like this do happen. So, just some final thoughts, uh, you know, on on my end, uh, you know, I, I think I'm trying to express that that consanguinity or inbreeding leads to an increased disease burden, and genomics can help with understanding if that's happening and to help solve issues that occur. Um, so, for example, in humans, you might imagine um, you might be able to develop for example, a, a diagnostic screening tool that could detect uh, potential carriers of disease, um, individuals that might develop disease later in life. You could even develop a diagnostic screening tool that is pre-marriage that could help identify if there are genetic incompatibilities among the two prospective uh, partners. Um, 
it, in a larger sense, human genetics can sort of discover new mutations that cause disease um, that might actually be easier to find because of this inbreeding, um, and that could benefit society as a whole um, in many different ways. And in a similar way, you know, the same types of methods can be used for monitoring and improving the genetic health of other animals and plants, both endangered species and, and livestock and, and uh, agricultural crops. Uh, and uh, finally, I, I didn't have time to talk about it, but, but genetics and genomics also will potentially lead to better understanding of, of diseases that cross from animals to us or diseases that cross the other direction as well as the, the vectors, the particular ways in which those diseases travel from one to the other. So thank you all for your time, and uh, I'm very happy to be visiting Trivandrum at Grin after uh, I was last here eight, nine years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. As I already requested, we will take the questions after the second talk. Uh, I now have the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Vinod Skaria. Is he online? Is Vinod online? He is. He is. Hello, Vinod. Uh, Vinod Skaria is one of the most prominent young scientists of India. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor Adhikshankar Nair, for the nice introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I apologize for not being uh, able to be there in person. Um, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, over the next 10 odd minutes, I will give a brief overview of uh, our decades of uh, collaborative efforts in genomics and informatics in Kerala. Uh, I will not touch upon every single project that we have handled, but largely touch upon just four stories uh, where uh, 
we could make a difference and of course there are far more number of failures that of course i would not uh, like to talk about uh, now when we talk about kerala uh, we should also think that kerala is also a land of uh, uh, unique problems uh, and also unfair advantages uh, in many aspects uh, there are very unique problems that are there in kerala uh, and of course it depends upon how you want to look at it uh, and one way to look at it is also to look at uh, as these problems are very unfair advantages which require many unique kinds of solutions now one aspect of uh, that is of course health and that's largely what i'm going to talk about and of course you are all aware about the health indices in kerala uh, it ranks one of the highest uh, in, in in the country uh, with the lowest infant mortality it probably one of the uh, highest in the doctor patient ratio uh, it also has a very large uh, expatriate population approximately around 2 million uh, or million people Uh, which work across the globe but it also has problems with infectious diseases and also with non communicable diseases or uh, i would call it a double whammy in terms of the diseases that occur in the state so our, our the next uh, four or stories is going to touch upon these two aspects on how genomics could be impacting uh, infectious and non communicable diseases in kerala now we should also keep in mind that uh, genomics at scale is actually creating a paradigm shift in microbial characterization and surveillance of pathogens and this is sort of exemplified uh, in this one simple slide earlier it used to take months if not years to be able to identify the pathogen which caused an outbreak in a particular region uh, of a country or a region of the world and it's largely because uh, the traditional methods of using microbiology was time consuming laborious and also resource intensive uh, intensive uh, in, in many ways it would take uh, thousands of tens of thousands of dollars to characterize pathogens but with the cost reduction and the high throughput of genome sequencing become available to the most laboratories across the world in fact kerala has probably the largest density of next generation sequencers today you could actually use this approach for Uh, rapid characterization and molecular analysis pathways and this is the slide from the wuhan uh, outbreak uh, in weeks time the chinese uh, researchers were able to characterize the pathogen and uh, put the molecular context and that is not because they used traditional microbiology that's because they used sequencing as the first approach to characterize the pathogen now uh, of course fast forward uh, to to do surveillance one of the first approaches uh, for high throughput surveillance was put together by the covid sick and uh, many people would not probably know this that kerala was one of the first states to actually implement covid sick as an approach for genomic surveillance and in fact kerala was the first state to uh, to actually lead the genomic surveillance program in the country which uh, which later led to the national program which is called insapo So sometime in, um, in mid 2020, Kerala used this technology to essentially uh, delineate the, or molecularly characterize outbreaks uh, within the state, uh, and to also glean this evidence to suggest that it is actually a transboundary spread from nearby states, which actually caused most of the outbreaks in the state rather than international travelers. Uh, and uh, the 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 health secretary uh, dr rajendra kobragade with uh, dr kantri actually put together this extensive program which ran for almost a year uh, which provided very early evidence of uh, emerging lineages in the state and of course in many ways this guided policy not just in kerala based on evidence but also at the national level uh, and this slide sort of exemplifies uh, this program the number of publications have come to it uh, but the most important program uh, aspect of the program is that this is very unique because it involved all the 12 government medical colleges it involved the state public health lab and regional laboratories it involved two university centers and all the district uh, public health surveillance units so in in many ways you can actually build collaborative programs at scale in kerala which can actually lead uh, or provide uh, uh, the, the directions for such leads across the, the country and from covid we learned a lot about how to build systems which could which could uh, uh, which could uh, contribute to the preparedness or academic intelligence and this relies on a lot of data many of this data is actually publicly available uh, so sometime in 2021 we put together this program called kaiser which is an open source initiative which is contributed by today uh, close to 400 or people which gleans evidence from multiple sources and also uses advanced informatics 
to to sort of uh, provide epidemic intelligence at a global level as well as a, a, a regional level. Uh, to give a, a, an example is uh, the Zika map and the Dengue map, which was actually put together by two medical students in, in, the, in the state, in the state uh, largely from Trivandrum. That's where the conference is. And Zika is very important because Zika and Dengue, uh, Dengue, there have been multiple outbreaks, almost annual outbreaks happening across the state. Uh, Zika and Dengue are essentially carried by the same mosquito. Uh, there have been outbreaks of Zika in the state uh, in Trivandrum uh, way back in 2021. And there have been outbreaks uh, then and uh, after that uh, in, in many other districts. Uh, and there have been a mosquito surveillance which uh, sort of uh, suggested a 0.05% positivity in mosquitoes, uh, which necessarily means that it is really too, uh, not too late to act upon uh, the information that we have. So what we really require is to have uh, a rapid and indigenous test and a surveillance mechanism, which uh, today uh, we might need uh, in a statewide uh, fashion. Now, shifting gears uh, in terms of human genomics, we are also in a very exciting period of time. Uh, exciting because uh, whole genome sequencing uh, prices are dropping, uh, not just dropping in the price, but also in the throughput. And we are almost in time where a whole genome with a whole exome sequencing cost is probably going to be the same with a faster whole genome sequencing compared to whole exome sequencing. Now, what this would largely mean is that you would be able to shift over from every single genetic test to just one genetic test, which is whole genome sequencing, which could uh, which could detect all kinds of genetic changes, whether they're single nucleotide changes, chromosomal abnormalities, or structural variations, repeat expansions, and deletions and duplications. And this has enormous implications in understanding genetic diseases, understanding sick, uh, the, the genetic basis of sick neonatal uh, uh, neonates in the ICUs for prenatal screening and genetic diagnosis. So on and so forth. And in other words, this could mean that genomics could become affordable and become a routine test in place. And this is essentially one area that Kerala could really, really focus upon. Now, of course, with the reduction in the cost and, and the background genomic sequence now available thanks to the Indigen program, it was, uh, I was fortunate to be one of the co investigators in this program. We have a baseline map of around a thousand odd individuals of cosmopolitan Indian population. And this could mean that you could identify very prevalent and treatable genetic conditions. You could look at pharmacogenomic variants to prevent adverse events and also look at uh, healthy cancer susceptibility variants. I'll give you just one example on how we could do this in the state of Kerala. And from the, the data from Kerala, we understood that there's a large prevalence of certain genetic disorders. I'll just speak about one of such genetic condition, and that is primary immunodeficiency disorders. We established this program uh, in 2018 in, in the Government Medical College in Calicut. And over the last five odd years, we have actually built one of the largest cohorts of primary immunodeficiency disorder from just one center in, in, in Kerala. And from 2018, with the treatment and diagnosis, uh, with genetic support, also funded by the SCRB and the DST, we also established a primary immunodeficiency clinic. And we offer today very specific diagnostic support, uh, which is funded by the Kerala State Government and FDID. And thanks to Dr. Gita Gomitaraj, who leads this program. And through this program, uh, there are multiple kids who have availed uh, genetic treatment. They have ac accessed hematopoietic stem cell transplant, which is a curative treatment. And far more large number of people have accessed genetic counseling and prenatal screening. And with the high burden of this disease, they are actually piloting a newborn screening program in 2023, and hopefully uh, we would have data in a year and a year and a half. And of course, there are multiple initiatives where we could actually go back and reduce the cost of diagnosis of very prevalent conditions. And one of these conditions is uh, for the pharmacogenomics of 5-fluorouracil. 5-fluorouracil is one of uh, the commonest uh, part of all solid tumor regimens, widely used within the state. Adverse or serious adverse reactions to uh, phytoluracil is observed in approximately around 10% of individuals and very severe adverse events in approximately around 1%. Of now, phytoluracil is very interesting because it has just one enzyme which metabolizes it in the DPYD gene. And therefore, you could look at DPYD genetic mutations in the population uh, scale genomic data. That's what we looked at. And we looked at uh, we found that there are only around 50 genetic variations in the South Asian population. We went back and revalidated these findings in the cohort uh, with Dr. Pavitran from the Hamilton 
medical sciences and we realized that there are just four variations which could uh, which could impact the pharmacogenomics in the population so today we have a very affordable pre-mp genetic testing for thiouracil which is widely used in the state of kerala uh, we offer this test as part of the government program which is fully of the mohammed farooq runs it's also been licensed to the lal pat labs for commercial test and there are many more institutes across the country who are using this test or information from this test to to offer pre-mp genetic screening for thiouracil pharmacogenomics so shifting gears what we should also keep in mind is that all this while we have been practicing with reactive medicine or in other words there is a patient who comes to the clinician because he or she has symptoms the clinicians make the diagnosis and of course in some cases do a genetic test and look for the variations which could match the phenotype now that that paradigm is changing where we would have a proactive medicine or a genotype first approach where individuals or newborns would have genomes in their hand and we could overlay evidence for the genetic variations and pathogenicity and act upon this clinical information or in other words it can prevent genetic diseases from happening and that is really the holy grail of genetics and to do this you need to have two components one is to have of course the evidence of variant pathogenicity and of course there are now international guidelines on how to go about variant pathogenicity and uh, and look at and reevaluate evidence so that's i think one opportunity that we need to teach our large clinician pool on how to gather interpret this variant variants and evidence and variants and the second part is of course digital solutions which can talk between the genetic variants and the clinical interpretation and uh, for that you need to have uh, very effective tools we have a prototype for this which is called the genome card which were released in 2019 a few thousand or individuals today already have it in the pilot phase and of course we would have a commercial launch uh, in a few months from now uh, uh, and what this card would essentially mean is that you could transact genetic information in a secure scalable privacy protected and the clinician enabled point of care uh, manner just like your credit or a debit card which can transact financial information or uh, finance uh, uh, finances at a point of care you could today now in principle transact the genomic evidence not a genomic sequence but the genomic evidence at the point of care when the clinician would require that but to do this and to fuel all this what is really really more important is to to create a genomics education platform because genomics is going to touch in the next 5 to 10 years every single human being in the state of kerala and that would mean that you need to educate every single person in kerala like right from school students to clinicians who are going to act upon this genomic information over the last 3 years we have put together a large number of programs which uh, today is widely participated from across the world and probably one of the largest initiatives globally for genomic education I think I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vinod. He spoke from his uh, direct uh, experience and intervention in the field of medicine using the uh, most cutting edge. advances in informatics bioinformatics and related areas and also how uh, throughout the presentation it was the collaborative mode that was being highlighted i think we the session is now open for questions first regarding the presentation of dr vinod's career thereafter of jeff So, Dr. Ramesh Hariharan, are you are you online? Oh, he's here. Sorry. <laughs> so, can you please come forward? The present. You want the presentation to be now, and the questions at the end. We know that you will stay on. Stay on for the. Yes, I will. Oh, thank you very much. Thank. You. Please come on stage. so a small change in the plan we will have the discussion for the all three presentations towards the end my pleasure now to uh, introduce dr ramesh hariharan dr ramesh hariharan is the co-founder and ceo at strand and an adjunct professor at the computer science department in the indian institute of science bangalore at strand dr ramesh has led teams building analytical tools for high throughput molecular profiling 
more recently, Dr. Ramesh and the team at Strand have been working on technology to make DNA sequencing for genetic disease diagnostics affordable in India. Dr. Ramesh Arhiran, over to you to make your presentation. About 20 minutes. Um, thank you all. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to Sam. And uh, um, I am really happy to be here. Um, I, while I live in Bangalore, I was actually born just across the road here, which is my... Uh, I didn't live much longer in Kerala, but uh, my family is from Karamana. My grandparents were both here. I spent all my summers here. So I'm very happy to be back uh, back home in some sense. Um, I didn't prepare a talk because I thought it was a panel discussion, but I jotted down a few points. So I'll just verbally go over those. Um, so my journey in uh, bioinformatics, since this is a bioinformatics session, um, begins about more than 20 years ago. Um, so, I was on the um, computer sciences faculty at the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, I was trained as a computer scientist. I did not do biology beyond my, um, I would say, class 10th. And, but as I was doing my PhD, um, biology was at the back of my mind. I was always intrigued by, um, by this mystery that continues to be a mystery that we call biology. Um, we've know a little bit more about that mystery than we knew 20 years ago, but there's still a lot more to be learned. And that kept at the back of my mind, and then various things happened as a result of which four of us from the computer science department started Strand uh, to explore. It was really an exploratory journey as opposed to a very definite vision that we started with to say, how do we bring computer sciences and life sciences together to understand biology better? And of course, translate it into benefits to humankind. Um, not that we were very clear about what those benefits would be, but we knew that understanding biology better would eventually translate. For the first decade or so, as we were um, really swimming in new waters, um, the ability for us to measure the molecular system inside the body was relatively limited. What could be done was um, what are called microarrays, which sample the genome at a small number of places, small relative to what we can do today. And what that allows you to do is not get a very personal feel, personalized feel for how are you different from me and how are you know each one of us different from the other, but get a very coarse, broad feel for if you were to walk out on the road and inhale some smoke, how would your body react? How would your lungs react? How would your um, muscles react? And uh, that technology was powerful enough that we could create all of these maps saying, if you inhale some smoke, then out of these 20,000 genes, these 5,000 will go up, these 6,000 will go, go down, and then start dissecting that to see what was really happening inside the body, what was eventually the result of all of that. So. It was fascinating to do these analyses, so I still teach it in my, I still uh, teach this class at IISC where uh, we pick data sets from biology and introduce statistical techniques and um, one of my favorites is smokers versus non-smokers, which are the genes that go up in smokers versus non-smokers. Um, I don't know whether you re realize it, but women react differently to smoking than men. And um, the reactions are different in such a way that um, while they are more prone to disease, they are less prone to mortality and, you know, the, the molecular basis of that, a lot of work has happened and that's some of that that I teach in this class. Um, there's also work on, you know, if you're a long-term smoker versus a never smoker versus a smoker who's given, who's stopped smoking, then do your genes settle back into the state that a, no, a never smoker is in or do they never settle back and stay where, um, where they were because of all your history of smoking. And it turns out that we understand sort of that, that it sort of starts settling down but doesn't go all the way back. And, you know, a lot of interesting insights of those types that we could get hold of. But we couldn't really pin down on a personalized basis what was happening, that that technology wasn't there. In the second decade, um, sequencing came about, costs of sequencing reduced. We've talked much about that. And this initiative today is really 
uh, a downstream corollary of the fact that sequencing is a lot more accessible. But about eight or nine years ago when, you know, this started happening, that was an exhilarating period where we could sequence an individual, find the variants in that individual and say something about why they are the way they are. I think that connection, making that connection was, a, was an aha moment that was big for me. And I'll give you three or four examples of, uh, of um, those connections. So the journey started with, I was really curious, my mother-in-law has a problem where she started going blind in her late 30s, early 40s. Um, vision started degrading and you know, at that point of time there wasn't a clear diagnosis what was happening. But that turned out to be the easiest case, sequenced her DNA, pinned down her mutation to one particular gene, it's called the APCA4 gene, and uh, understood the biology of that is really, you know, when light falls on the eye, it's a reaction that creates side effects, so there, are, there are side products that created, uh, are get created, those are toxic products, they get sequestered, there are garbage bags inside the eye apparently, they get neatly sequestered into those garbage bags and those garbage bags are neatly disposed there's a nice waste management system in the eye and there's this gene which is instrumental in that garbage disposal and if that goes bad then garbage builds up over 40 years and slowly kills the cells, right? That was, I mean, the analysis was easy but the fact that we could connect the biology at that level to here is a person that I know well and care about and, you know, that was a aha moment for me that um, really made a difference. Of course, the bonus was that I knew that my wife was not at risk anymore. I mean, that was... Um, you, we could predict that because we knew the biology of the disease well. Um, three more examples. Uh, so a friend of mine, uh, as this, as you know, this these stories started spreading. A friend of mine, um, he has a son in the autistic spectrum, and uh, he was curious, you know, why why had this happened, and sequenced his DNA, and again that led me to another end of biology, which is. Um, you know, each one of us, of course, inherits our DNA from our parents, but we don't inherit everything. At the time of our sort of conception, manufacturing, whatever you call it, nature introduces these few tens of uh, mutations completely afresh. These are called de novo mutations, completely afresh. Each of us has maybe 50 to 100 of these things, and it's complete shotgun. They go wherever nature feels like this, with some randomness it introduces them. And if that shotgun goes and hits an important place, then, you know, there'll be a greater effect. And about two or three of these shots go and hit the genes. And um, just two or three. And in a few people, those two or three hit at places that are create, disrupt the biology in an unfortunate way. And in this child, you know, it had hit this particular gene that was involved in various neuronal processes in ways we don't understand. But there was enough evidence to say this is the cause, but can't tell you anything more about it, but I, I can at least tell you that there's something de novo happening here. Um, what can we do about it still remains a question. The third example I'll tell you is uh, um, color blindness. Um, I, I'm red, green, color blind. Um, during my college entrance, they do this medical test where they show you these all of you might have seen these pictures with these dots in various colors and they ask you to recognize the, um, the number hidden. The number is a slightly different hue compared to all the other dots around it which are meant to mislead your eye. And so if, you are, if your color perception contrast is strong enough, the number will stand out. The gestalt will happen and the number will stand out, otherwise it will not. So I realized during my IIT medical test that I'm colorblind. I had no idea what is this, everybody was walking past, you know, two seconds they would spot the answer and go past and here I was, I was stuck there, I didn't know what to say. Um, and so that stuck with me for a long time and then when we started sequencing I said I need to um, figure this out. And so sequenced my DNA and uh, dug in and the cause turned out to be quite interestingly complex. So, the, so humans see uh, colors in three, three primary colors, right? red, green and blue. There are three sensors we have in our eyes, each responsible for roughly, you know, those red, green and blue wavelengths. Each of these three sensors has a corresponding gene. The red gene, green gene and the blue gene, there are three genes. The red and green genes are very special in the sense they are next to each other in the genome. 
and they are also highly homologous. The difference between those two is very small. So what happens whenever you have homologous regions where this region and this region are roughly the same, it's a source of a great amount of copying error. As you know, the DNA gets copied, if two regions neighboring each other are roughly the same, some mistake will happen where you'll take parts of this, parts of this and put it together. That's the nature of um, homologous recombination. So what had happened in me was half of the red gene and half of the green gene had come together, creating a hybrid gene. So I had one red gene that was good. My green was bad. My green was really something between red and green which has no name to it. It is a new color which is between red and green in wavelength. And so I see colors as a combination of red and red and green together, whatever that color is. Of course, blue is intact. Blue is far away. Blue never touches the red-green spectrum. So that again was, an, um, was a big aha moment for me, saying I can understand why I am this way. Right? Not that it is bothersome. Um, the last example is um, there was this case, uh, Stephen Kingsmore is a um, you know, famous, um, very famous geneticist in the US, famous for pushing the boundaries of um, uh, sequencing to do things within 48 hours, 24 hours in, in neonatal settings and I think they are at 16 hours now. I mean that's uh, really pushing the boundary of how fast you can do diagnosis in a, uh, in a, uh, uh, in an ICU setting for, for newborns. And he had this case where, um, you know, the case was not solved. It was a very strange phenomenon where the organs of the kids involved were, were shifted. In other words, if something is on the left, it was on the right and vice versa, right? So the uh, stomach is on the left, liver is on the right, that was shifted. But the heart remained where it is and so therefore the wiring sort of several things got flipped and some things remained where they are. If everything gets flipped, it's okay. I mean, it's just fine. But if some things flip and some things don't, that creates, um, you know, incongruences in the body and that was a problem. So they had run the analysis, uh, couldn't find uh, anything and then through various sources the data came to us and um, um, when we ran the analysis again we didn't find anything and um, then at that point of time we said we need to dig into this so we said let's let's look where people don't look. People typically when you do sequencing you take the reads you align them and then you look at the reads that are aligned. We said we need to look at the reads that are not aligned because that's where new stuff lies. Right? So we went digging into everything that did not have a reason to be there and eventually we found and these, these analyses are now standard but in 2016-17 these were not standard. Eventually we found that what was really happening was there was a huge chunk of the genome that was removed and the fact that the analysis was done the way it was you would never have guessed that a huge chunk was removed or that the person is actually homozygous. It, you couldn't differentiate between these two till you went looking for these reads out there and split them up into two pieces and allowed each of those pieces to match independently uh, in different parts of the DNA. So that again told me that we need to go looking in places where people are not looking if you have to find new things. So some of these stories are captured in my book um, Genomic Works where about nine such intriguing stories where we had to sort of dig deep and find interesting things. Uh, for for the lay, lay audience, so I'm hoping that might be useful for people who are interested in the field. Uh, again, at IIC, I teach this course where I take some of these stories and have the data as well available, and then people run through the data and recreate all of this th um, these things. Um, the so far, what I have talked about um, is largely your inherited genome, right? What are you born with? Now, there's a whole world inside our bodies that we are not necessarily born with because we are also dynamic. Um, our genome changes, by genome I mean of course the genome, then you take the surrounding epigenome, etc, etc. Our, our genome as a whole changes as we progress in life. And that is a whole different application area um, compared to measuring the inherited genome. The inherited genome, we've reached a point where we can sequence very well. We can identify how are you different from me very well. Costs are going down. 
there are still open questions though we can only diagnose for example people with rare diseases still we can diagnose 50 60 70 percent of those um, there are still a whole bunch that we cannot diagnose today we don't know why so there's still a lot more research to be done but when you go to the dynamic genome the evolving genome the genome that evolves as our life progresses that's a whole different story that's we're just scratching the surface of that genome necessarily that genome is different in different parts of the body because the various cells are evolving on their own right there's nothing that forces a cell in your leg to have the same genome as a set cell in your brain because random processes are happening very differently in those places and we can't go poking around at all of those places individually too many cells so you you look at where there is an aggregation and where there is an aggregation are in body fluids like saliva blood urine where which sample DNA coming out of all the parts of the body and integrate them into one whole. So if you sample there and read that DNA, you can potentially get signals that are present all across the body. And this is the notion of liquid biopsy that's, that's becoming more and more common uh, nowadays. But it's barely, I think, scratched the surface because the main challenge in a liquid biopsy is that your signal is very weak. You have a, however many trillion cells in the body and some fraction of them carry something that is problematic. You will get a signal in the blood that is, you know, if there are a million cells that carry the signal and there are a trillion cells of one million by one trillion will be a signal in which is barely anything, right? So you're going to get a signal that's very weak and that's where signal amplification me methods, better statistical methods, essentially better bioinformatics, very careful understanding of all of the errors because now you're pushing the error limit to its literal limit. You've got to, you know, operate in very fine margins. So that's where bioinformatics really gets, you know, the, the metal gets tested a lot more. And the applications are numerous. So a um, couple of years ago, we published this where you take saliva and you're able to identify whether there is oral cancer sitting inside in even in early stage cancer with about 75% accuracy. We are doing similar studies on, you know, all the, lots of people are doing studies on blood, urine, etc. And the ability to detect cancer early, potentially detect other diseases early, because every, many of the diseases will have some, imp, some genomic impact somewhere. I mean, we don't understand all of that yet, but some impact somewhere that could potentially be detected. So going forward, even as the inherited world gets very mature and very standardized, the dynamic world is going to see tremendous evolution over the next several years. Next several years. And the signals there are going to be, you know, not just the core genomic signals of reading the ATGCs, but looking at how the methylation patterns around this, there are many different types of methylation. Differential methylation leads to differential fragmentation. What are the fragmentation patterns at different places? Can you put these patterns together by aggregating across large data sets and find that actually in this sort of disease, in this sort of situation, this sort of fragmentation occurs. I think that's going to be a tremendous scope for really doing non-invasive disease biology and early detection. So as you can see, this, this is the perfect time for uh, Kerala, uh, Kerala Genome to launch. Um, I'm glad that Kerala amongst all the states has taken the lead. And um, a few points that, um, that I would like to perhaps, uh, it'll be great if um, you could keep in mind as you design and implement um, the program. Uh, I was particularly heartened, heartened to see the, the, the whole focus on local, local employment and you know, ensuring that the local ecosystem gets built, that's very important. Data sharing is key and I think as a society, we tend to be much more um, paranoid about data sharing than we need to be. Of course, ethical considerations are important, privacy is important, and we need rules for all of those, and we need all of us to follow those rules. But within the realm and the limits of those rules, if we can make data sharing as large as possible, that's when the institutions and the ecosystem will really flower. Because these are not easy things to convert to real value, right? I mean, this um, if you open it to 10 people, maybe value won't come out. If you open it to 100 people, maybe it may still not come out. We open it to a billion people, maybe suddenly lots of value comes out. How do you open it to more? Because who knows, where is that spark sitting? India has a billion people. There is a spark sitting somewhere that can take a data set that you and I cannot make sense of, but that one person will be able to make sense of, right? And somewhere 
that spark is there and if we can enable that spark, we can really, you know, leapfrog nations, um, other nations which are at the moment more advanced than us. Um, I think focus on bioinformatics is very important. Um, as I mentioned, I gave this one example of where we looked, where nobody was looking at that point of time, right? Do not just make, take the data, call the variants and make those open. Open up the raw data so that people can look where nobody is looking because that's where new discoveries lie. Okay. So open up things to the extent, to the greatest extent that we can open up. Of course, data is only as valuable as metadata, as valuable as phenotypes, etc. So careful design is always important. And the more we can get multiple disciplines involved, um, clinicians are, of course, very important, biologists are very important, molecular biologists, statisticians, statisticians are very important. If we can also get the engineers and the computer scientists involved, we can probably dig a lot more deeper into the data than we are doing today. So all the best to the Kerala genome. Um, I'm sure this will be um, a landmark program that will change the face of genomics in the country, not even, not just in Kerala. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ramesh. Uh, here is a computer scientist who studied biology up to 10th standard, <laughs> uh, but now knows deep into personal medicine, bioinformatics, and biology. And reminded of uh, famous computer science professor, Dr. Donald Nuth, who at the fag end of his academic career was asked, what do you see as the challenge of computer science? And he said, computer scientists have 500 years of work to do in biology. So what uh, Dr. Ramesh talked about here is a small indication of what that big challenge is. So now the session is open to questions. We start with questions for Dr. Jeff Wall or maybe we don't have any particular order for all the three speakers, Dr. Jeff, Dr. Vinod and Dr. Ramesh. Uh, the floor is open for questions. First question is to uh, Dr. Ramesh Ariharan. Um, so you mentioned about the smokers and non-smokers. In smokers, uh, I didn't understand the genome comes back. So uh, let's say that, you know, in smokers normally, one of the enzymes, aryl hydrocarbon hydroxide, significantly goes up and remains up. Now, if the smoking is stopped, in 15 to 30 days, it comes back. So that's the normal thing. But then you mentioned about the genome. You are talking about the mRNA still remains high or I, I didn't understand. Or is the pathway, the whole pathway is upregulated or that part I didn't understand. That's why I asked. Yeah, so, I mean, if you look at the whole sequence, there's the aryl hydrocarbon receptor that gets upregulated because it has to deal with the toxins coming in. It gets then metabolized and all the SIP enzymes go up. And then downstream of that are all the other things that you know of inflammation, DNA repair, this, that. I mean, the whole, whole stretch of gene expression changes that happen. Of course, the receptors go down very quickly, as you rightly mentioned, but the further downstream changes take longer to come down. So right? you are talking about all the proteins, proteins, not e the... Gene expression yeah. only, okay. So, yeah, that's what that so the first decade, as I mentioned, was a time where we could not look at the DNA. The DNA, I mean, if you follow the sort of, um, uh, the one-way hypothesis, the dogma that the DNA doesn't change except as somatic mutations, right? So I wasn't mentioning DNA changes. I was just looking at gene expression. That was my question. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, the organizers have warned me that we are running short of time. Yeah, okay. I think I think we'll have just one more question. Only wanted to ask a question, so over. Uh, that will question be the last question. Dr. Vinun Sakarika, how would you, I mean, with your experience of COVID, Nipa, and uh, virus, how do you, uh, 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 what do you think the steps towards creating a biosecurity plan for Kerala. Yeah, thanks uh, very much and that's uh, pretty much what I sort of mentioned that what we need to think about the future is, is uh, a system where every single outbreak is sequenced and understood within the first 72 hours. 
technology related it's possible today we have a number of proof of principles now done for a number of outbreaks that happened within the country it is not very expensive it is not rocket science what we need is to just have the will the, the dedicated resources and people trained to do that and and fortunately we are not really talking about large number of instruments because as i said before kerala today has probably the largest density of next generation sequences for any Uh, now, having said that, what we really, really need is the thought process and the strategy to be able to build that. I, I think there are many organizations probably interested to do that, but uh, yeah, that's all what I can say. It seems the genes that prompted the organizers to limit the questions have got subdued, and they are saying maybe there are a couple of more questions can be there. A couple of more questions. There are a lot of. students young students as scholars post doctoral fellows here i would also request them to raise questions from you sir you can introduce yourself um it was due to the deletion of a particular sequence and i'll just give you a, a quick so what happens when one copy of the genome is deleted is that all of the data sequencing data comes from the other copy at, because the reads are short you're reading the genome in short stretches so everything comes from the other copy and when you look at that you don't know that everything is coming from only one copy you think it's coming from both copies and then you see that whatever change is there is is there all through so you think this is homozygous it's present in both but it's actually present in only only one because the other copy there's a huge chunk that's gone completely deleted right? that's really what was happening there and if you sort of know the analysis of sequencing data you'll realize that this sort of situation is tricky to interpret but yeah that was what was happening you said you look at the data which we are not normally looking at what do you exactly mean um so the way sequencing works is that you 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 break the dna into short fragments and you sequence those fragments and then you get a lot of these you get a computer file where the sequences of these individual fragments are then you take each of these fragments and say where did it come from in my you know so i go and do a search and i say okay it came from here and so so typically we are able to take you know 98% 99% of all those fragments and say that they came from here they came from there so once we are able to put it back to where it came from then all the analysis progresses on that now you have this stuff left over here which is 1% 2% depending on uh, you know what your setting is that you're not able to put back into the dna into your genome and you don't know where it came from typically you just ignore it and move on saying you know and you know most industrial situations that's the right thing to do because you don't have time to look at all this but occasionally you've got to in a research situation got to dig into that and saying what is it where did that come from maybe that holds the key to something interesting unusual maybe there are new discoveries there that's what i really mean any other questions maybe we take one more yes please
Bangla. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Sumail from Digital University Computer Science Department. So my question is from Dr. Ramesh. Sir, can you throw some uh, aspect, computational aspects and statistical aspects that we can use on genomics? Techniques we can use, computational techniques basically. Sorry, computational you mean? Computational techniques. Computational, yeah. So computational and statistical, right? Computational techniques are a given because there's so much data that comes out. If you sequence one whole human genome, 100 gigabytes of data comes out. There is no other way than to do it um, uh, computationally. And um, just a couple of tidbits I'll give you on, you know, when we started building the algorithms for doing that back in 2012, 11, there was nothing available. And so all of us built our own, we built the entire thing and we got the timing for one whole human genome down to you know 24 hours and then we brought in GPUs and brought it down to six seven hours and then this other group came up um, out of nowhere they came from the electrical engineering hardware world and they built an FPGA uh, solution to this and that brought it down to like an hour and that's really the standard today half an hour one hour right so people with little biological background but a lot of computational expertise because the problems are heavy um, in terms of computation. So that's, uh, it's really, uh, the field is ripe for that. Statistics, I realized the hard way is one field that is applicable everywhere. I mean, whether you learn something or not, the statistical way of thinking is very important. Otherwise, you don't know how to design your experiments, how to make sure that you have enough sample sizes, how to make sure you're sequencing the right amount, what depth do you sequence at, Particularly as you go to the dynamic genome where the signal is very weak, unless you have a very good sense, statistical sense, you will not know, you know, what to do at that point of time. So, I think both of these fields are, um, they're just, uh, statistics is a very, uh, very old field, computation is relatively newer, but both of them uh, one needs to know enough about to be able to operate in this area. Maybe that can be the last question. So, uh, as you grow older, right, the right question to ask is what changes in your DNA? We know few things that change. One, cells build up somatic mutations. These are mutations that you're not born with, but as the cells are dividing, copying error happens or um, DNA damage happens and when DNA damage happens, um, it introduces changes, right? So, somatic mutations build up. Second, um, Methylation changes happen. Methylation changes are, you know, the methyl groups that get attached. So those changes happen. Those changes happen in characteristic ways that uh, that change with age. But then, there are, if there is a disease setting, then those changes are again characteristic in a different way. So for example, in cancer, it's generally known that wide scale loss of methylation happens in a cancer cell. But in certain regions, methylation gains happen. But so these are again characteristic changes. I've seen early evidence in cardiovascular disease that one form of methylation, which is um, hydroxy uh, 5-HNC, hydroxyl methyl cytosine, th uh, those patterns are different. But again, those are not fully proven yet, but some little evidence exists uh, that if you have heart disease and you know there is a pattern of uh, methylation that is different. 
in general it's reasonable to believe because methylation is very important for the control of the cell gene expression that a pathological disease state particularly cancer where gene expression changes massively will see changes in methylation aging leads to differences in gene expression so you will see changes in methylation um, so all of these are changes that are happening all over the body right? now it is for us to correlate these changes with disease states by doing enough clinical research and building enough metho methods to evaluate the dynamic genome with with the challenge that the signal is very weak Sam, we have very eager young people asking questions too. Maybe we admit two more. <laughs> we'll be happy to ask questions during lunch. We'll arrange for you to meet the speakers. Okay. You can briefly, very briefly. You can. Thank you, thank you. Actually, my name is Murli. I'm coming from Central Plantation Crop Research Institute in Kathmandu. Dr. Ramesh or anybody else, you said you are looking at the dynamic genome very closely what are changes taking place in that. Would you be also perhaps getting information about uh, how this dynamic genome would be affecting our life expectancy? Because there is a lot of study going on on how to improve our life expectancy. I mean, Dr. David Sinclair's book, you might surely have uh, heard about it. I think dynamic genome uh, could be having some uh, answer. Probably you may be looking closely at it. Just throw some light. Okay. Okay. So we um, uh, see it's a, it's it's a complex field where there are many signals. So we know that there is an aging signal um, that leads to differential methylation and methylation progresses progressive methylation changes with age. Why it happens? and why does it happen at different rates in different people. So what we can do today is to perhaps measure this notion of how fast are you aging um, in some biological sense. We can measure that reasonably well. But what we are trying to find out, not, I mean, I don't think we pers I mean, personally at Strand are working that much on that problem, but what the world is working on is why do different people age at different rates? Is it in the DNA, is it in the egg? environmental exposure is some combination, but there must be something in the DNA also. And getting those signals out, so that's where longevity research is heading, getting those signals out. What we are working on is, no matter whether you're aging at a fast rate or slow rate, can we measure your dynamic genome and see what can we say about it. So these are two distinct fields of activity, but a lot of action happening on both. And uh, I'm certainly not the longevity expert, but there is uh, David Sinclair's book, um, you know, sets off lots of thoughts. I don't think those have been yet tested. Intermittent fasting, for instance, has not been rigorously tested um, yet. There are a number of papers I've seen, um, but a lot more has to be done to really pin down, uh, you know, the, the uh, secret to longevity. We'll close. So it's time to close the session. I would like to thank Dr. Jeff Wall first for his very unique presentation which reminds us that inbreeding is not an issue with human beings alone, but animals in captivity are by design undergoing some inbreeding. I'm also reminded that many of our educational institutions have inbreeding. You know, you, you study masters there, you do your MPhil, you do your PhD, you become a professor there, you, know, you continue to be in the same institution. That what problems, intellectual problems can arise also was coming to my mind. Um, thank you, Dr. Jeff, for the very insightful presentation. <laughs> Dr. Vinod Karia is a uh, collaborator with the government of Kerala with scientific institutions in Kerala already in the field of health. And uh, he is a young pioneer in the field of informatics, in sequencing, and uh, allied areas. He has explained some of the ongoing work which makes Kerala proud and I am sure that he will be a collaborator in the coming years in the, this great project of Kerala Genome Data Center. Thank you Dr. Vinod for your very nice presentation. Dr. Ramesh, you were a proof of the machine learning principle that if you teach three data then the last data alone gets registered. You have to repeatedly 
uh, run through the data because everybody seems to have forgotten all the other presentations. Maybe it was a bad idea to have the question and answer session towards the end. Uh, we, could, we should have distributed it. But I hope that the young uh, students and researchers here will use the lunch time and you know other free time to come and interact with these three eminent speakers. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ramesh, for your presentation as well. And thank you, uh, KGDC as well as KDISC, Dr. Unikrishnan, Sam, all the uh, organizers for giving me this opportunity to chair this session with this very eminent panelist. Thank you very much and let us have a nice lunch. I, I request the panelists to please stay on stage. Uh, I invite Dr. P.V. Unikrishnan for giving a token of appreciation to the speakers on behalf of KDISC. I'm sorry, the lunch will have to wait. There seems to be a one more short session. The core part of KGDC will be the high capacity data center and that will initially be set up at the digital university. The center will become the storehouse and analytical center for all the genome data that will be generated. Dr. Saji Gopinath is the vice chancellor of the newly formed Kerala University of Digital Sciences, Innovation and Technology. Before assuming the position in 2000, he served as the chief executive officer of Kerala startup mission for three years and also worked as Director of Indian Institute of Information Technology and Management, Kerala. Dr. Gopinath was associated with the Indian Institute of Management over 17 years as its Dean in Academics and Development and Professor in Operations Management. He was also the Director of TAPMI, Manipal, and the Founding Dean of Bennett University set up by the Times of India. He also serves as visiting faculty to a few universities in Europe and Australia. A gold medalist in mechanical engineering 1988 batch from the Kerala University, Dr. Gopinath did his PG and PhD in management studies from the Insti Indian Institute of Science. Good afternoon and uh, I know that uh, I'm uh, standing in between you and lunch. So we'll have a short session. We have uh, two eminent experts. Uh, uh, who will be speaking on the topic on uh, data center and uh, AI applications uh, in the context of uh, KGDC. Uh, so we have uh, one of the uh, panelists will be joining us from US and uh, we all have uh, uh, the other panelist, uh, Mr. J uh, Jigar Halani, uh, is around, uh, please join. Uh, Mr. Jigar is the director of the enterprise solutions architecture in engineering team at NVIDIA as we know that NVIDIA is today synonymous with AI, uh, South Asia. He is a versatile professional with close to two decades of experience in supercomputing, big data, A infrastructure, A infrastructure background with uh, encompassing operations, business system design, implementation analysis, and process improvement in dynamic and challenging environments. Uh, Digital University is planning to associate very closely with NVIDIA in setting up uh, the infrastructure uh, the high high performance computing infrastructure for uh, multiple applications and uh, KGTC is going to be one of them. So without uh, 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 any further, let me invite uh, Mr. Jigar for his presentation, though maybe we could keep it around 10 minutes yeah. and then uh, we'll have the second panelist.
Thanks. Good afternoon, all. Firstly, thank you so much, Dr. Sashi and uh, Team KDC and uh, uh, others, other delegates over here for inviting us uh, for this talk. I know it's a 10 minute and I'm between the lunch and, and this discussion, so I'll be very quick. Uh, I've tried my best to cut short all the presentation because it was a panel discussion originally and then converted into a presentation essentially, right? But few good things which got discussed since morning. And they were about Moore's Law, the genome sequencing costing, how it has come down in the last two decades. Uh, and I do have some statistics which I would love to share essentially. The prices have further dropped than what the panelists talked about. It. It's, it's close to around $100 now, a genome sequencing cost. That's the speed at which the computing infrastructure is growing uh, and, and helping the acceleration in, in general, right? Uh, to, to begin with my presentation, I have a, a slide about what the ecosystem stack that NVIDIA has to provide. And I'm not going to talk about anything about hardware because today I think the hardware is well known from my NVIDIA perspective. We owe the market share which is which is greatly acceptable to everybody. And I'm thankful to Dr. Ramesh as well. He talked about genome sequencing done way back in his time frame as well on GPUs. Uh, and I was kid then, by the way. Uh, I was engineer when I used to install those clusters for, for stand as well as for ISC. So I very well remember GPU getting consumed uh, for doing the genome sequencing. And the progress since then and the evolution of AI and the way NVIDIA has picked up this AI to make these things work all together. And I'll talk about it, how healthcare industry is consuming all these things together on a one particular hardware, right? Using all these software stack. So the product Clara that we have, which is an open source product, uh, being consumed by hundreds of institutions across the world and very famous for federated learning because of the laws of the data, which is not allowing you to share too many things. And that topic also got discussed too many times uh, in, in since morning that being open giving back to the community and sharing this data within the stipulated limits that we have per country and within the country law as well is far more important. And that's where federated learning comes in the picture, right? Uh, and which is what we have it as flare part of the Clara as well. So you talk about medical devices and I'm very proud to say that today, uh, alternate medical device which gets shipped out in the world consumes a GPU part of it, okay? We have millions of devices including in India, which has GPU part of it, helping to do a lot of image processing and other computing stuff as well within those, uh, you know, medical instruments as well. Genome sequencing, I'm again proudful to say that GPUs are the one which are bringing down these costs dramatically. And every time a new innovation takes place, both on software and hardware, is only helping bring down the cost and help speed of light, uh, you know, achievements on the processing part as well. And finally, the drug discovery, and that whole process has accelerated. And I don't think so more than Kerala. Anybody else can accept this fact. Why did the dis drug discovery was important during COVID period of time? I think they, have, they were one of the biggest sufferers during that particular time, essentially, right? And thereby, uh, acceleration of this entire journey of how the drug discovery needs to be done and make it productionized as well. All these stacks are under a single umbrella with the open source community being contributing over here. I'll not talk much about it. Uh, only request is please go and read about it because of the limitation of the time. I'm not able to go into a detailing of each of them. Uh, but you name the stuff which is taking place in this segment, the portfolio of this software stack comprises of all these things. You might end up using one or few or all. You will have to run that on one single hardware, which is GPUs. And all these software stacks are bundled along with that, given to you absolutely free. Let me take a quick snapshot of what these partner ecosystems are who are helping us, right? So these are some of the device manufacturers. Uh, you must have heard of them because they are being consumed in the hospitals. Uh, these are some of the real world uh, implementation. There are some great YouTube videos which are available. I would highly encourage you to go and check them out. They are just three minutes videos, but gives you a perspective on what you could do in digital twins today uh, using the same GPU, helping doctors and nurses and, and medical staff people on, on getting the things simulated and, and as people rightly say, the more image you have, the better the you know, cure that you could do it. The, the more closure you are towards the images, the better the cure is, right? And last but not least, the genome sequencing requirement. And in 2022, we broke the world record by doing the whole genome sequencing process within seven hours, 18 minutes only, right? And, and that was at the cost of $100 or $120 to be more precise which is sub 200 dollars 
well affordable within the range of uh, India today, right? Uh, while we still say we are a developed country, we are the fastest growing na nation in the world, still affordability is very, very important and paramount parameter for the country like India, right? Uh, and, and, and $200 is well within the reach of, you know, any, any citizen in the country today. With all these things in play, let's see what our research collaborators have to speak about it. So a short video. require a convergence between life scientists okay. and data scientists. The Broad NVIDIA collaboration is an exemplar of how this can work. With NVIDIA, we'll be exploring applications with large language models. And one of the really important applications there is extracting information from clinical records. Large language models allow us to analyze these notes and understand the trajectory of disease with unprecedented resolution. Similarly, in biology, there's another set of languages that we care about deeply the language of DNA, RNA, and protein. Just as we train large language models to analyze human text, we can train these same models to analyze the language of life. Terra is a platform for storing, managing, sharing, and analyzing biomedical data. Our roots are really with genomics data, but over time we've added a lot of different data types to the platform. And by bringing together different kinds of data, we can enable much more interesting scientific outcomes. This partnership with NVIDIA will create greater access to those types of multimodal data analysis and bring that to a wider group of people who wouldn't necessarily have access to those sophisticated techniques previously. And something as complex as the human body cannot be assayed with a single modality. We don't just use chest x-rays or EKGs or DNA sequencing. We need to have a variety of different tools to interrogate physiology and health and disease. The, one of the great opportunities of modern machine learning is to develop multimodal representations of the human body. The partnership between Broad and NVIDIA represents an exciting step forward, where our two organizations will partner together deeply to integrate diverse genomic and clinical data sets into representations of how disease occurs and how we can better treat it. So large language model is what the world has started to know after the chat GPT came out. And I'm again thoughtful that the chat GPT is powered by NVIDIA at the back door. We have been talking about large language model for now about five years. And one of the first initiative that we had was in the biology, not in the traditional computing infrastructure that you see in the chat, you know, chat GPT kind of stuff, which is search, query, and QA and stuff. We first talked about the healthcare because we understand that knowing human body and working around those things is the most complex task. And solving that is going to consume a lot of bandwidth and compute infrastructure. We started this project about five years ago. Two years ago, we announced our first large language model called Bio Nemo Megatron. And today, it's available as API to you to consume as well. Okay. Uh, I'll be quickly, uh, uh, you know, jumping up on the data center piece of it as well. And I have just one slide. The piece of healthcare genome sequencing is not new to the world. Supercomputers have been built for, for decades together, right? Dr. Ramesh talked about it. I know for sure. You know, about 16 years back, I implemented the first cluster of Sun Microsystem at Stand, uh, you know, which they have, they have used it for many biological stuff that they were trying to do as well. Today, there are the most sophisticated supercomputers which are getting built out, and every nation has a special mission on healthcare and genome sequencing that they're trying to build in. I've just taken a few examples uh, just to show you where the world is moving towards it. And I'm, again, proudful being an Indian and, and, you know, coming to, you know, this place is Kerala, that you guys have an initiative around these areas as well, ahead of the curve that other states could think of it, actually. Right? And this covers all type of applications and problem statements that the healthcare and genome sequencing is trying to solve. The same cluster does all these jobs in one together. So, again, the concept that, you know, KDDC has it, which is, we are here to give you the infrastructure, while researchers from all across the world will collaborate on this particular platform solving any and every type of problem on healthcare and genome sequencing. That's the mission which could be achieved using these kind of supercomputer building the data centers that we are talking about. Right? right? Uh, la second last slide about NVIDIA in general. I only talked about healthcare and genomics. We have over 19 different verticals with 400 plus software stack which could help you in many different ways, again in healthcare and genomics. 
and many other segments as well where AI can be applied or the metaverse can be implemented or a supercomputing can be uh, consumed as well. Giving you a simplistic example which is not covered in my previous slide and that's my last demo which my team has been able to put efforts to build it last night itself as they saw that I'm doing a presentation and not a panel. Uh, and, and here comes the last demo. Kerala is a front runner when it comes to education and healthcare sector compared to all other states in India. Unlike other parts of India, Kerala is progressing rapidly with their active state government, literate citizens and modern infrastructure. Kerala is quite ahead of its time. It is also noteworthy that Kerala has the lowest infant mortality rate, the lowest maternal mortality rate and the highest female to male literacy rate in the country. Sounds good. With that, I want to end my presentation with a note. Think of the scenario where this large scale data center comes in, in this city or in, in this state, and you have genome sequencing with so much of domain knowledge. You are the powerhouse of all the medical stuff that the world consumes it in general. That is how the Kerala is known as. With that data and the other data which is going to come from your collaborators, someday, I will have my genome sequencing done using an API on this cluster at the cheapest price because it's government owned, not by a private firm. So I'm sure it will be subsidized at a great rate, assuming it is less than a thousand, you know, hundred dollars. Over and above, I'll be able to question the system. What are the things that could happen with me or why the cancer is with me or why, uh, you know, I have a, a RGB issue in my eyes with all these queries like how chat GPT works in that particular cluster. And that will be open to all the citizens. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jigar. In fact, I think uh, we will have a question after uh, hearing from Mr. Babu Shivadasan. Uh, Mr. Babu, uh, Mr. Babu Shivadasan is joining oh. us from uh, US. So as uh, many of you know that uh, uh, Mr. Babu Shivadasan is the uh, <coughs> co-founder of uh, uh, and president of uh, Investnet, one of the larger companies in Trivandrum, but he's also the co-founder and CEO of uh, Jiffy.ai, uh, which is actually making a, a lot of uh, positive press uh, recently. Uh, a very passionate serial entrepreneur, uh, Mr. Babu Shivadasan is a great friend of uh, Kerala. He's, he, he's from Trivandrum and he's also supporting us in a lot of uh, uh, events. He's also a member of uh, the High Power IT Committee of the state. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, we will hear from uh, Babu Shivadasan on the topic. Uh, over to you. All right. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. All right. Uh, both uh, Dr. Sadi and uh, Mr. Digger mentioned, both of them said, started their presentations by saying that you know, they are the ones standing between you and Lance. And, and uh, I'm just saying, you know, doing the same thing, but no, this is the last person to say that today. So, so lunch is on its way, okay? Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, uh, I thought uh, I'll introduce it if, uh, if we were to ask my children, what, what would they say? And uh, they would say, he's too weird. And, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't sleep at all. Right, so so they would say he disappears in no time. Like he was just here, like you know, and, and it looks like he's on his way to India. Right, so uh, he's probably penny wise and pound foolish, <laughs> and uh, uh, works all the time. Right, so and that's that's probably the introduction that you would hear from my kids. Uh, now, my wife would say, you know. He's extremely weird, right? No, so, so, uh, and uh, and uh, you would ask, you know, why? You know, so uh, how could you trust a person who drops my son in in my daughter's school and my daughter in my son's school, right? No, so that uh, there must be something wrong here, right? No, so I am still trying to figure out, you know, who am I? Like, you know, what what are those special characteristics? You know, so. 
uh, we all are wired very, very differently. So I'm really looking forward to uh, running my sequencing my genome and, and figuring out all those little things, you know, that make me special or different, right? You know, so uh, we are all different, every, each and every one of us, right? You know, we, we are wired differently, we have unique characteristics and uh, the, you know, purpose of technology to me, it all leads to eventually finding out what is that that makes us unique and how can we impact how can we uh, you know help right uh, each and every one of us there are a lot of unfortunate people who don't get to really experience you know, what life has to offer they they don't have that luck right you know, and and uh, you know it's all of us you know we deserve we I mean they deserve for us to work hard and figure out, you know, how we can enable them to, to fully enjoy that, you know, God-given, uh, 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 you know, life and, and to the fullest extent possible, right? Now, so that is, that's, um, so jokes apart, I'm a computer science engineer, right, by background. And, uh, you know, as, as the previous speaker mentioned, I have 100 years of biology learning to, to, to do, right? So which uh, hopefully, you know, uh, we can fast track with all the NVIDIA power, right? So hopefully, you know, that'll, that'll help. You know? So look, really looking forward to it. So uh, I thought I'll talk a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, the data center that we are trying to, I'm really excited about the possibility of a high performance data center because what you see, what do we know here today, right? Now, we, we know there is explosion of data. Now, as we speak right now, while you're waiting for your lunch, there is trillions of I mean, uh, bytes of data being produced, right? Now, so, and that the explosion of data, you know, you need to make sense out of it. And, and that's what um, um, understanding that data, like, you know, the, a solution to every problem in the world is in that data that, that we all have available. We just need to figure out and make sense out of it. And that's where all this great computing help uh, and, and our, our quest for identifying that, you know, and understanding, making sense out of that data. And, uh, you know, that requires a lot of, lot of uh, so-called data factory or data processing centers and, and that's where all the magic happens you know it's not you know you may find it boring because you know you it, it's it's uh, blinking all the time with you know b b binary ones and zeros you know but you know, it is it is doing all the heavy duty work you know that makes uh, this making sense out of data possible right you know, so I thought I'll uh, you know briefly uh, mention a few points about what is happening in the data center world right you know, so um, when I came to America at that time, uh, a data center was a small facility. Um, j just wanted to check you know, if, if you're okay. Can you hear? Yes, yes. We can okay. hear you. All right. So um, at that time, data center was, you know, um, regular computers and, and you stack them up and that becomes your cages in in racks and cages and you know that becomes your data center things have changed quite a bit today number one change and and advancement is the virtualization of data center right now which allows significant amount of uh, optimization so you you can you know the cost of processing data has been brought down continues to come down primarily because of that software defined uh, um, data center right now where uh, you are rewiring things you know you're you're creating virtual layers on uh, and, and and when uh, and making sure the resources are fully utilized you know uh, all the time right and that that brings so much efficiency and and that is um, a, a key trend that that you would notice you know, that has happened and then the second thing i would i would say is you know the hybrid nature of the uh, data centers. You know, so today you can have 
certain workloads you know being run privately and a different set of data and workloads being uh, done in public cloud you know, which is a lot more efficient a lot more cheaper right you know, because you know, you're you're tapping into a new power a new capacity somewhere else right you know, so you think a good mix of these two that hybrid cloud is is uh, really something you know that that uh, you know is continue people are continuing to make investment in and and, and uh, that that data centers are enabling that that hybrid environment uh, the third point i would make is you know the the real scale at which you know these data centers are operating these days you know it's uh, uh, vastly superior like right? you know, because you know the amount of data that we process the amount of information that we process is is growing rapidly computing power is growing rapidly and the scale at which you know you can do things uh, like in you know, the chat gpt they are talking about uh, the next generation which is a uh, model that is a, you know uh, a million times bigger right you know, so so uh, that kind of uh, computing power and that's what is needed the continued quest to uh, get that power so that we can understand solutions to every problem in the world that is right in front of us so that we can we can figure it out uh, and then the fourth Trend, you know, which is which is really has come of age is is uh, AI. You know, uh, the purpose-built hardware and uh, our friends at uh, Nvidia is uh, leading the charge. You know, and thank you uh, for for doing all the great work uh, and uh, purpose-built computer, purpose-built uh, architectures, purpose-built computers. You know, that have so much power that these extremely large language models can can. Ex- execute very very effectively and and uh, that kind of uh, purpose built uh, hardware and software that is changing the data center and and I wouldn't be surprised if one day you look at it you know all of your data center is just just those ai compute power because you know, ai can solve every problem in the world right now so um, and then you know something you know, that come close that's close to heart for me is is the trend towards automation right you now where a uh, lot of this orchestration a uh, lot of uh, you know enabling the ability to fire off a new computer in in no time the new compute power in no time um, significant amount of automation that is happening happening in the uh, data centers you know so that you know you are able to provide things uh, just in time you know j- Uh, in in few milliseconds, right? Now, so that kind of uh, capability is coming together, and um, finally, I would say, you know, the centralized data center focus. I mean, the compute being centralized is great, but you know, there is so much happening. Um, it is inefficient, right? And and so what you would notice is, you know, there is quite a bit of decentralized processing as well, or compute moving to the edges, right? You know, and and so you could see. uh mini versions of data centers you know these are things you know that are uh, out there uh, every sensor out there will become a lot more powerful right in terms of being able to compute a lot of the things uh in those devices and then then get sent summaries being sent to uh, the centralized processing areas you know so that you can you can aggregate them and and make sense out of it so those are few uh, trends you know that that you see as you look at the data center of tomorrow i mean these are these are not new trends these have been ongoing trends you know so and um, uh, i really wish uh, you know uh, our uh, state uh, that that high performance uh, data center and uh, and we can all uh, start making sense of ourselves and and really looking forward to that and uh, uh, really uh, you know wish you all a great lunch you know so so look 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 forward to uh, i sorry i couldn't be there but uh, look forward to look forward to being there uh, so thank you <clears throat> but i think i should also say that uh, you know you, you are a person who could cover a lot of ground in a very very short period of time you know you have <laughs> completely taken to the computing landscape in a very short period of time thank you for that so uh, before we break uh, any questions uh, maybe we can have yes
this quest. This quest. This question it goes to Nvidia. I'm Sinu Thomas from University. The high compu computing resources actually uh, have a disadvantage of emitting lot of CO2, and plus it draws lot of power. So, what is Nvidia doing on that front? I think we are only solving that problem, in my view, right? uh, because if you have to do the same thing with CPUs, that will emit, and the world record I talked about it on genome sequencing will do at least 80 times more CO2, uh, you know, uh, burning than the GPUs are burning it. Right? Ask me honestly, if I have to talk to an enterprise customer today and not a research academy a customer, the only discussion is how am I going to save power and space? Sole reason why NVIDIA is getting sold out, right? We saw chat GPT, they're claiming some numbers. If I only go by the internet number, I can't disclose the realistic number, but if I go by the internet Google numbers, they're claiming to have 11,000 GPUs working at the back door, right? To solve and give you the answer back on what you are asking as. And now they're charging for it. If I have to translate that into CPU, that will be at least, I am saying 200 times the CO2 that needs to be burnt out to, to power the same amount of chat GPT which is running today, right? I think accelerated computing is the way forward. Starting from AI to even the oldest technology like sort of databases are going to migrate towards accelerated computing. I'm not saying on NVIDIA, I'm saying on accelerated computing. Today it's NVIDIA, tomorrow it could be somebody else. There could be another disruption in the EDA world where the chip manufacturing happens at one nanometer, we are at currently five nanometer, and they might be able to offer it at a cheaper price with a better ecosystem on software, right? But it will be accelerated computing. Intel is talking about it. AMD is talking about it. I think we had a leapfrog mind share that we had with our customers, and thanks to their feedback, we could develop this product. question is to uh, Dr. Jigar. So this is going back to your very first slide. So, um, you know, four different things you have mentioned. The last one is drug discovery you mentioned. I assume that you are referring to the target identification of the targets, protein targets you are referring. Not the molecule, the pharmacophore or the biologics. I assume drug discovery you mentioned. Yes. It is, it is the targets. Yes. Okay. Number two, you are also mentioning about the genomics. I assume that you are referring to the SNP analysis. I am referring to all three phases of genome sequencing, although I am not an expert on genome sequencing. But what I could understood is first stage, second stage, and what they call it as uh, the third stage, which has a name to it as well. And all three pipelines are today accelerated on GPUs with the software stack that we have to offer it. Right? So I have a deck and details with the application which are supported at the back door. Maybe during the lunch time, uh, I could take it up and, and show you what, uh, you know, our research team has worked together with each of these stage of genome sequencing teams. And that's how end-to-end -end genome sequencing has become a world record for us. Yeah, mainly for uh, the purpose of, you know, drug discovery or target right. identification, SNP is the key thing. Okay. And if you are going back the phenotype, for example, the very first one you mentioned about artificial intelligence. That's correct. I assume that, you know, the, the digitization of the images that you are getting, is that what you are referring? The so very first one. Within AI, there are many segments within the healthcare that we are trying to support. Across. Image being one, and image has many variations. One which are there in the devices. The second which is what the radiologists are able to see at the end. So, for example, if my device is old, and this is a new phenomena, by the way, in the device manufacturing world, which is software-defined world. Nobody's replacing their devices in 10 years or, or, or 15 years. These are the kind of contracts that you want to go. Like a CT scan is not replaced every five years. It is replaced every 10, 15 years. Now, how do you upgrade these CT scans? These are happening because of the software stack, which are getting upgraded every two years, right? And there are cycles. When I work with Siemens, for example, in Bangalore, this is what I learned from them. And I'm, again, not a domain expert. This is what I learned from them is that you have a capacity of that hardware which you can upgrade it and thereby you can upgrade the software. So the cities can be used to, let's say, for a 2D uh, five years back, are today are able to generate a 3D images as well. So that's one type of images. Second type.
asking that that images you are correlating with SNP, which is finally involved in developing novel targets or metabolic pathway. Could or be the one changes of the, in the metabolism. Yes, could be one of the pipeline that we are talking about it. There could be other ways as well, which I can make you talk to my experts, okay. and I'm sure they come from that domain. We have doctors as well in our company. We have genome sequencing specialists. We have acquired a company apparently who used to write these genome sequencing software called Parabrix. And they run completely end to end stack on cheap waves. Uh, so, maybe if you have an interest, very happy to have a, some discussion around those sure. things as well, and we could take this thing forward. Thank you. Happy to do it. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Judy. I'm head of the Department of Computer Applications from QSAT. So, this is not too technical to the speakers. In fact, we, we were just trying to figure out, we get some idea about the actual data center that is coming up right now. Mm -hmm. So, because you have been uh, you have been talking about the federated learning and the GPUs and all. So, this, what is your suggestion or is it a too, too early stage? I don't know. What is our data center that we are talking about today is going to be like, is it a hybrid one with GPUs, CPUs and what could be the performance in teraflops? And how is the storage going to be? Is there a plan already built or are we yet to take that? Like, is it going to be a cloud-based? And what could be the data policy? So those kind of things we are like a bit curious to know about. Uh, many of these things are yet to be uh, formulated. But uh, as of now, on a day on now, we are primarily will be providing a, a DGX A100 machine, which is available right away. Uh, and uh, as, uh, and, uh, which will have uh, reasonably uh, enough storage for because uh, as as this database increases, we are going to uh, put across. But we are also looking at uh, at the digital uh, 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 science park. We are planning to set up a super board. Uh, a super board is primarily around 20 odd H100 machines, which is uh, how much? Uh, uh, which is yes, so 100. Yes, 100 uh, petaflops. So basically, uh, I think uh, this is on, this is not only for KGDC. Obviously, KGDC will be one of the key uh, uh, applications, but this is going to be an AI uh, center in general. So uh, I believe at this point of time, we were discussing with KGDC the type of uh, their plan of development. This seems to be a, uh, a good configuration to address on. But that may be one year down the line because we need to have time to do that. But at this point of time, if you have uh, data uh, and uh, we wanted uh, uh, computational power, uh, uh, DGX 800 machine uh, is available. Sir, uh, so then you are talking about DGX, uh, HGX machine is that you are going to purchase for this purpose, H100, HGX. Yes. It's DGX and what no, you No, no, DGX has got 800, right? Yeah. So, and sir said he is going, we are going for H100 cards. So, DGX has variations. A100 is the previous generation, which is just, you know, uh, was announced about two and a half years back. Yes. H100 is the one which was announced just last year. And because of the supply chain, the availability is starting now, essentially. Uh, and that's what, uh, you know, the digital okay. industry is planning to do. Okay, one doubt on that is, we, we are just focusing on the GPU applications and the AI applications. Mm -hmm. What about the number crunching that involves with bioinformatics applications? Are you not uh, going to uh, give a suggestion on the CPUs or the CPU nodes? That's because a good question. Yeah, Very good question, right? And, yeah. and I'll answer to your first original question as well, which was on the federated learning, because I also know QSAT also has GPUs, yeah. uh, which we have supplied it to you guys. Uh, and let me start from there because we have we're talking about it. Assume that QSAT is working on a, uh, you know, on a on a breast cancer issue, for example, right? And the data set that you have got is because of your collaboration at a local level within your university that you have it, which possibly is not shareable. Let's assume that. Uh, with this data center because of the data privacy issue or because of some other issues and stuff, right? All you have to do it is because of the federated learning and it's open source again. Everybody is supporting federated learning today is bypass just the metadata, which is weights and biases, which means the model that you have trained using your data set, that weights and biases of metadata can be transferred to the data center here centrally and the model can be further enhanced and that model can be made available to you back so that you could also have the data set that they have it, which they have to train the model on. That's one way to look at right? uh, You know, coming back to the question that you have, each DGX today or any GPU system that comes in, by default comes with the CPU. So the system that, uh, you know, uh, team will have it here, for example, what they've already purchased, which is DGX A100, already has 128 CPU cores. And the A100, H100, which will come in, 
will have at least 156 cores part of that particular process and two terabytes of memory. So if you need to do anything which is bound to be CPU, and there are many things which CPU does, for example, operating system, uh, you know, data ingestion, Kafka queues, and few other things can be done using those CPUs. And the pipelines for that is available, which is, we call it as Rapids, again, an open source uh, product that is the highest downloaded product last year in the GitHub repo. Yeah, one last question. And uh, since the solution looks too much into NVIDIA products, and you said there are around 400 softwares in the stack that you have, what is the mm. compatibility with other open source uh, frameworks for frameworks that we have for bioinformatics solutions? So good news is we are built on TensorFlow and PyTorch, which is Google and Facebook respectively, right? We have not invented these, uh, you know, frameworks that, that Google and Facebook has invented. But we have leveraged them to build each domain-specific use cases and again made them open source, which is what the world is using it. Today, the same framework is available via any of the cloud providers that you can think of it. Uh, it is contributed by Indians. Uh, to be more precise, we are one of the third largest contributor to this community that AI is talking about it worldwide, right? So many of those innovations that NVIDIA has done it, which has been made open source, and out of these 499% of these software stacks are open source, uh, it is Indians who are contributing it back and enhancing those products. And I'm sure Kerala will lead that front once this large-scale infrastructure comes in as well. Okay, thank you. Fine, I think uh, uh, we will close. And uh, thank you very much, uh, both uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Babu. I think it's early morning for you, I believe, right? Yeah, it's around 1 o'clock. <laughs> okay, so your other uh, characteristic that you don't sleep also is uh, proven. Uh, <laughs> And uh, thanks to Mr. Jigar. And I think uh, let's uh, break for lunch. Thank you. I request the panelists to please stay on stage. Uh, I invite Srimati Sajita PP, Executive Director, Management Services of KDIS, to hand over a token of gratitude from KDIS to the panelists. Receiving on your behalf. Thank you. Requesting everyone to uh, split for lunch. And hope to see you all back in the hall at half an hour. Recording stopped. Let's all uh, gather back at 2 o'clock and lunch is served near the entrance.
I request you all to please be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. We're now going to proceed to the next session. As Sam mentioned before, Kerala is famous for its biodiversity. It's also famous for its medicinal plants and famous for its Recording black pepper, progress. coconuts, and various other agricultural products. Agricultural genomics is going to be a very crucial part of KGDC. Dr. Murli Gopal is currently working as principal scientist at ICAR, Central Plantation Crops Research Institute, Kasargod, Kerala. He had completed his BSc in Agriculture from Tamil Nadu Agricultural University, Coimbatore, MSc and PhD in Agriculture Microbiology from Indian Agricultural Research Institute, New Delhi. He has done his postdoctoral at the world's oldest agricultural research institute at Rothamsted Research in the UK. He put in more than 28 years of service and works in areas of soil and plant microbiome, agro residue, recycling and biofertilizer technology in coconut, arachnid and cocoa. His research in the area of soil health using microbial and non-microbial technologies has fetched recognition from ICAR and DST Lockheed Martin India Innovation Program. He has published about 40 research papers in international peer-reviewed journal. I welcome him on stage. A very, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank KDISC, Dr. Unni Krishnan, and uh, a very good uh, long-term collaborator, Dr. Sam Santosh, uh, and all of you. I think everybody had a good sumptuous lunch. Would you agree? You had a good sumptuous lunch? H had you? How did you get this lunch? From where did you get this lunch? From agriculture is what one of the speaker has told. So uh, the session now is on agriculture genomics and I think you should appreciate that the lunch which you had, very, very sumptuous, very nice lunch is coming from the agriculture. The farmers who are working, the scientists who are working and now the genomics that is going to also help in uh, our agriculture. Uh, uh, briefly, I would like to say that uh, uh, agriculture genomics would like to improve the crop productivity, the crop quality, and the sustainability of the environment. Uh, because we are in a position, we are in a condition where climate change is affecting our agriculture. We are in a position because of climate change, new diseases and new pests are uh, affecting our uh, agriculture production. And we are also in a stage where the new technology of genomics is emerging and that can help us to overcome the climate, uh, climate challenge as well as the pest and disease challenge. Uh, unless we get food, I think nothing else in this world will matter. Uh, so uh, let's, let's uh, uh, try to focus our attention on today's speakers. Um, we have two, spe we, have, we had three speakers listed in this um, session. Uh, Mr. Aju Jacob, Dr. Vijay Reddy and Dr. Rajiv Varshne. Mm, uh, we have uh, 
Mr. Vishal Menon, who is uh, going to stand in place of Mr. Aju Jacob from Synthait Kochi, and uh, he is going to uh, talk uh, on a totally different aspects of what agriculture genomics uh, would be trying to, uh, you know, like focus upon. So, as I told, agriculture genomics would like to use genomics in structural genomic as well as functional genomic and see how we can identify the genes and crops that can help us overcome this uh, climate resilience or overcome this pest and disease problem. But off late, we are realizing that this is not enough. We have to have value addition. We have a, we have a, we have a project or we have a uh, thing going on or doubling farmers' uh, income. I think one of the most, uh, one of the most uh, potential way of doubling farmers' income is through adding value to the product that farmer is producing. And uh, Synthite Group is, I think, working on this area. And uh, as was mentioned in the morning, very, very low profile, but having a very high uh, impact in the outside world with their uh, work. Um, I would like to introduce Mr. Vishal Menon. <coughs> he is the Chief Development Officer of the Synthite Industries Limited, where he is engaged in the research and development efforts that are linked to building new products, business, brands for the group. In a prior role, Vishal helped build one of the world's largest mortgage banking operations employing several thousand people and spanning four countries. Over the past 25 years, Vishal has developed functional expertise in intrapreneurship, not entrepreneurship, intrapreneurship strategy, and we would like to listen from him about this intrapreneurship strategy, innovation and organizational development across industries, domain, as diverse as financial analytics, information technology, consulting, agribusiness, tourism and hospitality. Host hospitality. Vishal has a keen interest in natural histories, equestrian sports, visual arts, and music. I think uh, earlier we had a chair, Dr. Um, Achyuta Shankar Nair. He also has a wide range of expertise in his uh, foray. He's a good musician. So likewise, we have uh, Vishal uh, Menon also, who is interested in national, natural history, equestrian sports, visual arts, and music. Uh, he is an alumni of Indian School of Business, Hyderabad. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of uh, KDISC and uh, on behalf of everybody, I would like to uh, welcome Mr. Vishal for his presentation. Uh, I would ask uh, somebody how much time uh, Mr. Vishal has, uh, 15 minutes. Mr. Vishal, you are uh, given 15 minutes. Let me know when the time is up. Yeah, he says, let me know when his time is up, but I am sure he would be uh, very punctual. Yeah, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, am I audible? Am I audible? Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I have the onerous task of keeping you guys awake after a lovely lunch. So uh, hopefully we'll try and do that. Um, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Sam and uh, KDISC for uh, inviting me uh, to uh, stand in uh, for my boss, Aju, who unfortunately was not available. So hopefully uh, I'll do my best to fill his very large shoes. So uh, to get started, uh, uh, I I'm actually wearing two hats right now. One as a representative of a private company, which is one of the leaders in the world of uh, plant extracts and botanicals, and the other as a patron of uh, 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 a brand new initiative uh, in partnership with QSAT, which is the CVJ Center for Synthetic Biology and Biomanufacturing. So I'll, I'll just touch upon uh, this area because it's, it, it's more closely linked to what uh, um, uh, the, the KGDC project also espouses. But before that, I'll just give you a little uh, something to think about uh, from an application perspective about uh, the use of genomics, right? How many of you have heard of an organism called, a, called the flounder? The flounder. Any of you? 
So the, the flounder is actually a variety of fish that uh, halibut family, right? Dr. Jayesh, aquatic, right? Yeah. So, uh, so these, these are actually inhib inhibit the deep oceans around uh, the Arctic Circle, right? So uh, they actually help solve a very interesting problem, theoretically, right? And that was, uh, had to do with something that we eat every day, which is the tomato. So can you think of a correlation between the Arctic flounder and tomatoes, right? Now that's the power of genomics. Now, uh, it so happened that uh, the, the uh, tomatoes were having a significant problem in the northern hemisphere. They were uh, constantly prone to frostbite, right? So uh, you would have crops completely destroyed even though they were grown under relatively low, uh, I mean relatively controlled conditions. They were often susceptible to frosts and uh, the, it would destroy the skin and pretty much the, the, the crop would be rendered useless. So. Um, the, uh, uh, there was a very interesting uh, way this, this problem was thought through. It was found that the, uh, the Arctic uh, flounder actually has a protein within itself that creates a antifreeze. So it's able to survive under minus 30 something degrees uh, temperature in the Arctic uh, at the same time, uh, you know, thrive, right? So uh, the, the, the way they thought about this problem is very similar to how Sam and KDISC and all of you are thinking about genomics. They figured that if they could isolate that gene that was responsible for creating this antifreeze, right, and incorporate that into the tomato, they would allow the tomato to develop resistance to frost, right? And uh, there was a large company that actually went about and proved that this was possible and this I'm talking about 2005-2006 uh, much before uh, genomics and all the other mix uh, you know kind of revolutionized our thinking right so uh, that's that's a that's the way that I think lateral thinking really enables organizations enables uh, innovation and, and growth so uh, uh, from a more closer perspective, uh, we uh, definitely have a huge interest in extremophiles. You familiar with the concept of extremophiles? Extremophiles are organisms that live under extreme conditions. Like for example, you have bacteria that are halophytic, right, which uh, thrive in extremely high uh, concentrations of salt, right, or uh, ultra-thermophilic, right, which at high degrees of uh, temperature. So these extremophiles, if we could figure out how, what their survival strategy really is, we can come up with a lot of innovations in industrial use, right? Now we are a hardcore industrial application based company, right? We, are, we do not invest in basic research. But imagine if we could sequence the, the genomes that would enable um, these extremophiles to survive, we could make a very, very successful, uh, for example, if we're considering an extremophile that's very, uh, um, um, that thrives under very, very low pH, right? You could actually come up with a solution for probiotics by sequencing bugs uh, and sequencing those extremophiles and using that specific uh, sequence within probiotics that would enable pro probiotics to be more effective under gut pH. Right, you know that your the hydrochloric acid in your gut actually destroys a lot of the, uh, the 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 probiotics, and therefore probiotics are often quoted, and it's highly questionable in terms of what their actual efficacy is within the gut. In fact, the EFSA has not recognized probiotics as a legitimate form of treatment for that very reason. Right, so th that's a huge opportunity. Right, and sequencing is a very simple way of actually going through that process of finding a solution to a problem that is actually quite vexing. So uh, another example is better pest management, right? So we know that uh, as an agribusiness uh, where we uh, uh, import in excess of uh, 65 botanicals from all over the world, we have a huge problem not just with pests but the downstream impact of pests which is pesticides. So. <laughs> Uh, our battle largely is not with the pests itself, but what human beings are doing to rid the crop of the pests. And that is indiscriminate use of pesticides. 
and uh, uh, our ability to kind of control the indiscriminate use of pesticides can only be solved if we address the problem at the farmer level or the farm gate level which is how does the how do we enable the farmer to prevent the pests from attacking his plants in other words can we provide him a more pest resistant plant to start with right so it eliminates the possibility at a very very early stage and saves a lot of money right so again genomics can play a, a critical role in this because a lot of plants basically create secondary metabolites as a result of environmental stress and most of these environmental stress for example have you heard of capsaicin it's the principal active ingredient in chilies right now capsaicin is believed to be produced as a result of uh, the activity of a, of a fungus called fusarium so uh, if there is a, a huge fusarium uh, um, um, manifest in the in the plant then and which happens during high heat and high humidity conditions the plant's natural defense system is to create more capsaicin right so uh, you can actually breed plants uh, on the basis of its metabolic activity and its ability to generate such uh, forms of secondary metabolites so uh, where i'm going with this is that these sort of initiatives in genomics have a very very strong practical application that may be lost sometimes at the research level right uh, if if only we can find use what are called inductive principles of thinking and try and build those concepts into solving practical problems this sort of technology can really leap from now uh, the idea behind uh, uh, my coming here is also to see how we can work with uh, kgdc at some point to create a cluster create an information cluster where for example the the cvj center for synthetic biology uh, and biomanufacturing uh, kgdc and other life sciences programs within the state can actually come together and contribute towards solving uh, you know what are called bhag problems big hairy gorilla type problems right that face uh, that face us in common so uh, with that initiative uh, we've kind of uh, partnered with qsat and we'll hopefully uh, be launching the center it's purely a center for academic research uh, and technology uh, as well as entrepreneurship and and applied research so the uh, our first goal will be to build capacity in that area you know how do we create bring the right faculty on board how do we create uh, the the right uh, pedagogy around uh, you know creating robust manpower that can be employable in this very cluster and hub Uh, how do we build the expertise around uh, you know whether it's intellectual property creation its application of these kind of uh, technologies uh, for industrial benefit or for larger benefits uh, building enterprise how do we equip faculty students in that institute to actually develop entrepreneurial skills because uh, it's it's a sad fact that a lot of uh, very good research brains are unable to convert their academic prowess into value right and and that's a very sad reflection right they they don't share in the fruits of their own intellectual labor so sometimes it's very difficult for them to stay motivated in that journey so one of our endeavors with this uh, institute is to teach entrepreneurship as a integral part of the curriculum so that we incentivize academic researchers to also be able to apply their knowledge in the field of activity now uh, the the near benefits of uh, this sort of capability is also reflected in the kind of uh, research that we are doing as a company we have a program with the university of windsor in uh, canada where we are doing research on plant metabolites and its impact on uh, uh, carcinoma uh, cancer cell lines so just uh, it's it's a paper due to be published but i just wanted to let you guys know that there's a very unique tea that is grown from around munar that has shown amazing results in terms of inducing apoptosis in uh, triple negative breast cancer xenografts which is a huge deal i mean triple negative breast cancer has one of the poorest sort of outcomes and this is just a tea that is grown in our own backyards that we can drink at least the rats have drunk it and the xenografts have definitely shown very very positive results 
and I'm not professing that a human being is a giant mouse, but it, it's definitely a huge area for us to think about, right? And, and again, uh, our ability to sequence that specific genome could possibly lead us closer to find out what are the specific metabolic pathways that are inducing apoptosis. Uh, uh, just so you're not lost, uh, apoptosis is, called, is, is a, another fancy term for programmed cell death. When cells basically decide that they don't have enough work to do, they go into a state called either senescence, where they do nothing, or they commit suicide. So apoptosis is the ability of, or, or inducing a cell, a ca cancerous cell, to commit suicide. And really there is no difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell, right? So the, the, the trick is how does this T or this metabolites within the T actually convince a cell that is impaired in some way that is not clinically measurable to commit suicide. Now that's an area of, of, of uh, great uh, research possibilities that, you know, uh, my company is definitely investing in. Now, uh, the other aspects that uh, we are also looking into is a plant called uh, Piper Longum. Have you heard of this plant? Piper Longum is again uh, the long pepper. It's called Peepli in Sanskrit, used in Ayurveda, integral part of Trikatu. You heard of Trikatu? Trikatu is basically uh, one of the most powerful adjuvants in Ayurveda. It's go it goes with almost any Ayurvedic preparation because it basically inhibits the glucuronidation pathways and enables hepatic uh, digestibility and things like that. So, uh, Piper Longum is another plant that we are studying uh, extensively with regard to its ability to uh, affect uh, uh, only uh, cancerous cells selectively. Um, the other, uh, one of the other important things that I'd like to mention here in the context of genomics is that uh, we are very aware that our business, agribusiness, is going to be disrupted very significantly by this idea of biomanufacturing, which is using bugs to create products as opposed to uh, uh, you know, extracting products from plants. For example, right now there's a huge product that uh, is, is known worldwide and this is a carotenoid compound that is extracted from marigold called lutein. Now lutein has other isomers like zeaxanthin, cryptozeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin. So it's a family of carotenoids that are used in the area of eye health, managing age-related degenerative diseases of the eye. Now macular degeneration is an example. Now, traditionally, this has been produced by farmers planting marigold plants and the flowers being harvested and these being silaged for the season and then they are extracted in huge plants with solvents and then purified progressively to create this 99.5% pure USP grade lutein or zeaxanthin that is then administered to human beings. But you know what? There is a very specific metabolic pathway within bugs that create these same carotenoids that can be replicated. So you can do the same thing that would take a, a, a chemical engineering uh, facility uh, to do, you can do the same thing in a petri dish, right? I'm exaggerating, but maybe a round bottom flask. But so the, bottom, uh, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that traditional chemical engineering is soon going to be replaced. At least 60% of it is going to be replaced by biomanufacturing. And an integral part of biomanufacturing is your ability to use bugs, use the right bugs for the right job, right? And, and genomic sequencing is a significant part of that. Understanding metabolic pathways, studying metabolomics, which are actually the metabolites produced through those pathways, uh, and all the other omics that go with it. There is volatile omics, there is uh, epigenomics, there's all the other things that are happening that, you know, are of immense interest to us when we study these, these metabolic pathways, right? So we are very aware that, and we want to avoid what is called the Kodak moment. Do you guys know what the Kodak moment is? There was a time when the Kodak film cameras, uh, you, know, you remember those cam uh, films used to be put in cameras made by this company called Kodak? Well, we call it a Kodak moment because Kodak was sleeping while Canon and other guys were developing the digital camera. Right? So uh, while they said a smile is a Kodak moment, their Kodak moment was 
when somebody came in with the digital camera and stole their business. So today you hardly find anybody who buys film cam, 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 uh, films anymore, right? Photographic films anymore. So we are very keen as a company not to have a Kodak moment and therefore we are definitely investing in the idea of uh, uh, genomics. Am I doing okay on time? All right. So, uh, so the idea for us is to uh, create this infrastructure within our hub which will have uh, uh, you know, centers of, ex uh, ex uh, cent centers of expertise in the area of synthetic biology, in the area of biomanufacturing, and co-opt various life science programs and see how we can collaborate through that, have an open collaboration framework, uh, and, and I think the Kerala Genome uh, Data Center can be a very important part of that uh, initiative. Now, uh, there is one uh, big hairy challenge that, you know, I, uh, because Sam spoke about biodiversity and that's again, natural history is one of my pet subjects. And uh, I don't know if uh, uh, any of you are aware, but just like uh, COVID hit the uh, human population by surprise, there's an apocalypse that's actually hit the amphibian population in the world, right? Uh, it's called, uh, uh, it's called chytriodimycosis. It's a fungus caused uh, by, I mean, it's a fungal uh, disease that has wiped out almost 6% of the world's amphibian species as we talk today. So it's, it's a virtual apocalypse. And uh, it's, uh, it's caused by a fungus called Batricochytrium dendrobatidis. So that is a BD for short. Now this uh, fungus has practically wiped out populations in South America, uh, especially highly biodiverse areas such as Costa Rica. Uh, and you know that uh, uh, amphibians are one of the most critical uh, bioindicators, one of the most effective biocontrol agents. So imagine when the middle of your food chain pretty much collapses, what a disaster it can be from an ecological perspective, right? So even though not many of us are losing sleep over this, I hope there is somebody who is, because this is a, a, a huge ecological disaster. Now what's interesting is, that the Western Guards has been spared of it. It's affected literally every part of, uh, you know, North America, South America, certain parts of uh, Asia, uh, and they're not as biodiverse as we are. So uh, they've lost, thankfully, we've lost only about 7%, which is a lot, but still, you know, not as, uh, the, since the, the density of uh, species de densities are much higher in our areas, what we call biological hotspots, We've been, uh, uh, we've been safe so far. So an interesting problem would be for somebody to actually look at the frog population uh, here. I know Sam had a, a slide on the uh, Nasicobatricus sahyadrensis, right? The, the purple frog. Uh, now he seems to be, not Sam, but the frog seems to be uh, immune to BD, right? And, and it's basically, uh, at least it's not, uh, showing clinical signs, even though uh, I think there was a group from CCMB that has actually isolated the BD fungus in the population uh, of the Western Guards, but they don't seem to be showing any adverse effects. So what is the opportunity? And the opportunity is that if we could figure out what makes these frogs uh, resistant to this fungus, we can probably save 20% of the frog species in the world. So that's the importance of biodiversity. And that's probably, if the genome center already existed, guys out of Columbia University or uh, University of uh, Costa Rica could have pinged SAM or uh, KDISC at uh, KGDC and tried to figure out, hey, can you give me the sequence of this, of this frog and let's see if we can do some work collaboratively to solve this apocalypse, right? So I just wanted to sensitize all of us to the impact of, of this sort of an initiative. It's one thing to have this on paper or one thing to have this on a program, but the ability to kind of build in the mechanisms around technology transfer, uh, lateral thinking, collaborative ecosystems, uh, and, and uh, joint development is, can never be uh, uh, overemphasized. So uh, I think that's food for thought and uh, I really appreciate you guys making the time and giving me the year. Thank you so much once again. Thank you.
Thank you, Vishal. I liked inductive principle thinking, uh, which I think as a scientist, we all need to really um, uh, go in this direction so that we can make several things uh, come together and make it more successful. Um, Biomanufacturing, yeah, I think uh, the, the precision fermentation is one of the area which is now picking up and as in the morning, uh, Sam had suggested that can we have meat substitute coming out of uh, precision uh, fermentation and likewise what you have mentioned uh, using a small petri dish or a flask to produce so many um, high quality, high uh, um, end materials. So these are the, some of the points which you have mentioned and you are uh, uh, looking at how genomics can help your, uh, your synthite industry to uh, reach uh, more uh, to the public and how to help the farmers also. If there are questions for Mr. Vishal, maybe we can have three or four questions and then we go to the next uh, presenter. He ended with food for thought. Maybe if not now, uh, after the next speaker uh, has done his presentation, we can uh, go ahead. So next on uh, our panel is uh, Mr. V.B. Reddy. He is uh, um, a doctorate uh, in rice functional genomics from University of Hyderabad with 16 years of experience in genomics. His expertise includes genomics, molecular biology, molecular genetics, bioinformatics, applied aspects of agriculture research for crop improvement. He has published over more than 30 peer-reviewed publications in the field of genomics. His expertise includes genome sequencing, capture genetic diversity, association mapping in crop plants, and he has taken several initiatives in characterizing genomes of various plants such as curry leaf, cardamom, guava, sesamum, brassica, osimum, phyllanthus, etc. Currently, he is a consultant for Agri-Genomics Division of Med Genome Lab since 2022. And uh, prior to joining SciGenome, uh, Mr. Dr. Vijay worked with uh, various levels of Vibha Seed Group, like DGM, General Manager, and Senior uh, Manager. His contribution includes establishment of various divisions in biotechnology, like molecular diagnostic, marker-assisted selection, candidate gene identification, and many more. Uh, I think. Uh, Dr. Vijay Reddy would be the right person to uh, uh, make a presentation on the agri-genomics. Sir, I welcome you online. Uh, Dr. Vijay Reddy is uh, going to present online. Uh, I welcome you for this uh, um, afternoon's talk, sir. Hello. Yeah, you are audible, uh, Dr. Reddy. You can go okay. ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, for your kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to congratulate the KGDC for uh, uh, setting up such a wonderful center for uh, storing the genomic data and analyze and get uh, the real output of this uh, kind of a genomic data. And uh, I congratulate uh, all of you. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Sam uh, for giving me an opportunity to work with uh, you know, various uh, aspects of genomics for the last 10 years. I've been associated under, uh, with AgriGenome and I'm very close to Kerala actually. I've been working with uh, uh, various uh, problems uh, of uh, especially associated with the genomics based at Cochin. Uh, and uh, of course, AgriGenome has been working in uh, you know providing uh, solutions for various kind of a, a, a genomic solutions for uh, various crop plants but uh, i'm today i'm going to talk about uh, some efforts that we have uh, uh, some initiatives which we have taken up a uh, few years back especially to characterize uh, the genomic diversity that we have in kerala and also kerala is known to have uh, you know uh, the, basically the spice hub of uh, india right so we have very, uh, various kinds of spices uh, and uh, various uh, aromatic plants originated and having the rich diversity over there. But, uh, I mean, I, 
have the various extracts as the speaker uh, previous speaker mentioned the extracts of uh, various metabolites of various uh, medicinal and aromatic plants are being utilized in uh, treating various uh, diseases and kerala is the center for uh, all kind of ayurvedic treatment but uh, at the same time uh, with the initiative of sam uh, kerala also emerged out to be a center for genomics basically uh, facilitating the genomics of various crop and animal uh, species uh, right uh, right from kerala for the last 10 plus years so i am fortunate to associate with sam and uh, where we took some initiative to sequence some of the medicinal and aromatic plants since uh, the kgdc is being established to store various kinds of genomic data i thought it is more relevant to have some discussion uh, some of that work which we have carried out uh, uh, which is which is having the close connections to the food and uh, the ayurvedic treatment habits which are uh, widely practiced in kerala so i'll start um, and, uh, in order to adopt uh, the technologies basically we have been working with various uh, sequencing technologies which basically fall into three buckets i would say so short read and long read and uh, various mapping technologies these are quite common both for human as well as the plant species we have been using all this kind of a technologies a combination no one technology is really good uh, for uh, deciphering the complex genomes such as plant species so we have used a combination of uh, uh, sequencing platforms in order to decipher the various complex uh, plant genomes so as you know uh, it's a right uh, initiative that kgdc has uh, taken place today uh, the genomics basically unless it is uh, put in a systematic order and interpreted in a proper way it is not going to make any sense so here the informatics is going to be uh, play a big role and uh, the tools and the technologies and the platforms which are required both for the assembly annotation as well as the interpretation of the various path pathways associated in each of the genome and how do we make use of those uh, variations which are found in the uh, genomes Uh, to come out with the uh, uh, basically various metabolites or how can we en enhance those metabolites uh, which is a real uh, need of the hour so basically if you look at uh, i mean since i'm basically uh, working in more of the appl applied aspects of the genome sequencing side especially on the trait development sites uh, which have been working for a long time so basically uh, the fundamental thing which is required for uh, for all kind of downstream analysis in, even in case of plants is having a good quality reference genome for most of the food crops today we are fortunate to have uh, with the in, with the efforts of various uh, genome sequencing consortia so we have a very good genome sequences but whereas the medicinal and aromatic plants especially which are, which are uh, very rich in, uh, in kerala so there are no reference genome sequences available uh, for most of the spices and aromatic plants so we took some initiative to start there and have a good reference quality genomes and uh, not only having the reference you know but how can we uh, basically leverage the uh, genetic diversity that we have in kerala and to capture those uh, genetic variations and associate with the phenotype so on this aspect basically we are trying to uh, drive more towards breeding by design concept by having the characteristic genome genotype information of uh, diverse uh, uh, flora we have in kerala and uh, fine mapping those i mean identifying genetic loci which are associated with various uh, traits of importance and taking them to basically pyramid multiple genes and come up with the uh, improved uh, traits uh, avoiding the linkage drags this is what something that we have made as a road plan and uh, and ultimately having the information about the uh, genome sequence and the variant information how can we leverage this information basically in edit uh, those genomes so i'll try to show you some of the Uh, examples that we have uh, worked on basically uh, both on the trait innovation side as well as the integration side and uh, using this in kind of information on uh, intellectual property protection so these are some of the various initiatives that we have uh, taken under the cygenome research foundation uh, uh, it is very difficult for me to talk about all of them but uh, i'll try to uh, emphasize uh, some of the work that we have done especially on the medicinal uh, plant genomics side but uh, before that actually we have initiated uh, our, our work basically on this uh, rice which is very famous in kerala called purple puttu which is used in um, many of the puttu uh, preparations uh, which is basically anthocyanin rich uh, rice so we have uh, sequenced this uh, purple rice you know and uh, we have identified the color of uh, the rice which is basically uh, it is found in all parts of the body especially uh, except pollen as well as the internode 
and uh, we have identified the key responsible locus which is uh, associated with this is earlier it is re reported to be a protein based pair deletion in a gene called bhlh gene in uh, chromosome 7 uh, and this is also called rc gene but uh, we have proven that uh, this is not only the deletion there is other uh, regulator factors which are working on it uh, especially in order to produce uh, this uh, particular purple rice which is again happened to be unique when we try to analyze with the three thousand uh, genomes database available from the URI. So if you see what you see on the right side, which basically forms a unique clade uh, of purple genome uh, when we try to look at their uh, variations. So similarly, there is another interesting uh, line called uh, Samba Masuri, which is also called BPT 5204, which is uh, the most preferred uh, rice, uh, especially when you take the consumer uh, interest, basically uh, eatability and palatability. So eating and cooking qualities of this rice are uh, superior but at the same time when you look at uh, the purple rice even though it is rich in anthocyanins uh, which are basically good in antioxidant properties but uh, very poor in cooking and eating qualities so this is another rice which we have sequenced and characterized and identified the variations and uh, if you look at this basically only 0.5 percent of uh, total variations that we have observed uh, in, in uh, bpt 5204 are having some association especially causing the missense uh, variations so we try to map those genes and identify uh, the, the genes which are uh, associated with various uh, eating and cooking qualities along with other resistant and morphological traits and um, using this genomic information and the variation that we have and we know how many variations are there between the purple rice as well as the um, uh, samba masuri which is good in cooking quality the one you see on the left side uh, is basically the seeds of uh, the purple rice they are pu purple in color because of the anthocyanin accumulation but they're not good for uh, in terms of the eating and cooking qualities especially for the south india whereas on the one in the middle if you see that is the uh, bpt 5204 which is most preferred rice uh, of course uh, it is uh, uh, not uh, having the basically antioxidant properties which are exhibited by the purple photo. So we made a cross between uh, these two and identified uh, a population and uh, identified some lines. So basically this line 120, 20, which, uh, which I'm showing on the right extreme right, which has again cooking qualities of BPT 5204 and uh, accumulation of anthocyanin, which is there in the purple photo. Now we are in the process of characterizing those uh, variations which are got, which have got interpressed from purple photo. Uh, with the targeted uh, genome sequencing approach so one you see the panicles again so we are we are working again using the genomic information we have uh, developed this line and now we are trying to identify and characterize those uh, specific genomic regions which have got introduced in this particular line 120. so similarly we have uh, taken some initiative so so we added, we, uh, we 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 know that uh, the having the good quality uh, reference genome is very much essential so so we started working with uh, one of the oil seed crop called brassica juncia so which is a basically a tetraploid uh, crop and uh, we combined various strategies of genome sequencing basically the long range sequencing optical mapping strategies as well as the traditional linkage mapping strategies in order to derive a high quality uh, tetraploid genome of uh, brassica juncia in collaboration with the university of uh, delhi which were published in plant biotechnology journal so so having that uh, basically the platform established uh, uh, for genome sequencing and uh, uh, assembly and annotation so we thought we should focus and try to uh, decode some of the genomes of interest especially for a uh, uh, kerala region so if you look at uh, kerala kerala as i mentioned uh, it's known to be a spice hub of uh, uh, india so um, of course uh, the previous speaker mentioned one of the uh, piper species uh, of course, piper, uh, black pepper is basically considered to be the king of spices, but the queen is the cardamom. So we try to decode the cardamom genome. Similarly, there is another important uh, plant called curry leaf, uh, which is called burgera koengi, which we use it in garnishing and uh, preparation of various curry dishes that we eat. And uh, for, various, various, for uh, various treatment, we use uh, basically uh, uh, osimum uh, and also uh, philanthus, which is basically uh, a species of uh, emblica now it is being uh, considered as philanthus so likewise there are many important uh, plant species for which the genome sequences are were not really available so we took the initiative in order to identify uh, the genome sequence uh, of uh, curry leaf uh, to start with so basically why the curry leaf basically why we get that uh, aroma from the curry leaf the moment we put in our preparations 
So basically, it is because of the uh, suspiterpenoids and carbazole combination, and uh, some of the indole alkaloids also, which are used in the various medicinal properties of uh, the curry leaves. So we wanted to understand uh, what are the metabolic pathways which are uh, working behind this in accumulation of these essential oils. So that's why that's how we started with the combination of uh, strategies for uh, genome sequencing, and uh, we got a very high quality genome with. Uh, uh, with the total number of scaffold happened to be nine, where the chromosome number is also happened to be nine. So this is the kind of quality of the genomes that uh, we have we have developed, which served as a source of reference for us, and so which can be also compared with other species. Especially if you look at in rutaceae, this is the only uh, the closest member that we have is only citrus. So, but the accumulation of the metabolites in citrus are quite different from the curry leaves. That's all combination of various essential oils which are leading to the accumulation. So this is basically, even if you look at the synteny, so this is highly conserved uh, across, uh, I mean, within the species, within the rutaceae family. So similarly, we have taken a big initiative, but there was a big problem of um, uh, adulteration in, uh, in um, cardamom. And uh, of course, Kerala is a center of origin for uh, cardamom. And um, so we took this initiative of uh, sequencing and identifying the gen complete genome sequencing of uh, cardamom. And as part of that, uh, we have uh, developed uh, a genome assembly of uh, uh, cardamom uh, with around 24 uh, scaffolds, which is again equivalent to the uh, number of chromosomes present in the cardamom. And uh, this again, we used a combination of optical mapping strategy as well as a long read and short read uh, sequencing strategy. So this is the genome of uh, the cardamom, which uh, has been decoded, which is yet to be published. And uh, similarly, we have collaborated with the uh, Central Institute for Medicine and Aromatic Plants uh, Research, uh, CIMAP in Lucknow, as well as the National Center for Biological Sciences uh, in Bangalore, in order to identify the Asimum genome, which Asimum is a very small genome of around 350 MB genome, but uh, it is known to have accumulation of uh, various, um, uh, especially eugenol is the, and uh, linalool and carvacol. Carona, are the major or the secondary metabolites. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, we just try to look at, uh, you know, what is the current issue with the, the, the genome sequence assembly that is published. There's a draft quality genome which was published in 2015 by, in collaboration with CMAP and as well as the NCBS published independently. So, but it was not a great quality genome. So we again, we collaborated with the CMAP in order to have a genome assembly of Asimum which is, uh, again, uh, we found that uh, total number of uh, scaffolds, basically, which are more than 10 uh, megabases, we have around 21, which is, again, equivalent to uh, the number of chromosomes of genome, and which is, again, 98.3 percent complete. So this is a kind of high quality genomes are uh, possible only when you have used a combination of sequencing strategy and not with a single strategy alone. Similarly, we have uh, taken another initiative uh, in collaboration with the uh, Central Institute for Medicinal and Aromatic Plants Research, Lucknow, and, uh, and tried to characterize uh, the genome sequencing of uh, uh, Philanthus, which is again uh, used uh, in wide uh, kind of treatments in Ayurveda. So this is a genome sequence of, uh, I just try to put it on, on the right side, what you see is around uh, and, uh, around 450 MB of uh, genome is uh, characterized and uh, which is again 98.4% uh, complete uh, when you look at the Basco. So, uh, so generation of this sequence and assembly requires high level of computational uh, resources and uh, more importantly, analyzing this data further down and to characterize the specific uh, metabolic pathways as well as characterizing the variations in those pathways requires collaborative effort. I think this initiative uh, from Kerala Genomic uh, Data in, uh, Center is going to play a, a key role in interpretation of such a useful data. And not only this, there is an opportunity to work with various uh, uh, other medicinal plants which are again uniquely found in, in Kerala and their diversity, especially when you look at, we have, law, we have evidences to show that uh, Kerala has a rich diversity, which is not only seen in, in terms of uh, their phenotypes, but also in, in terms of their uh, genetic data. So. The, the, the genome, Kerala Genome Data Center, if it can put an effort towards uh, characterizing and uh, curating all kind of a data and put them uh, in, a, in a very curated fashion accessible to all the public, uh, of course, there could be uh, possible uh, data security measures can be taken care. But uh, so if it is provided, it is going to provide a lot of information resources to the uh, 
students and scientists who are working in the medicinal plant uh, uh, research area. So having this in reference genome information, is it going to be enough? No, definitely it requires, it forms the basis for us to form, uh, to identify the variations and characterize them and associate with the particular trait. So it's not in the medicinal plants what I'm showing, but it is in a rise which we have uh, shown the, the uh, genome-wide association studies that we have done associated with various uh, yield traits uh, and uh, how, it, how they can be uh, mapped using the naturally available germplasm and genomic data. So, so this is a kind of uh, diversity uh, information which we have utilized and uh, try to characterize various traits of importance in another plant called P. And this is quite possible in other plants also, the cutal mapping which we have done in case of P again. So, and not only that, especially in the field crops, in order to avoid the linkage drag and uh, to inter specifically interpret the genes of interest, avoiding the linkage drag, it is quite possible using this uh, genetic variation data which is, which could be made available for even medicinal plants. So, similar effort actually we have done in uh, rice uh, to characterize the variations uh, in collaboration with IRI. And this data is also so more than 10,000 accessions data is available, uh, which again uh, it can be effectively deployed in order to characterize uh, them. But having the genetic uh, variations uh, uh, is one from the um, from the natural populations. But besides, this genomics can be effectively deployed in order to characterize uh, the induced variations uh, by mutation breeding approaches. So we have taken this initiative and. Uh, developed a, a BPT-5204 derived uh, uh, rice and uh, this is also patented uh, with the PPV FRA authority and uh, which which provides 25 percent higher yield and we know where the gene, gene, genetic variations are there and, and which uh, QTL they are sitting in and which gene, uh, which gene they are affecting. So all this is possible uh, just because of the genomic uh, data. Similarly, there is another uh, variation which we have created and characterized and there are around uh, 14 stop again mutations were created and the, everything is possible to decode uh, with the genome sequencing information. But that is in the natural, uh, that in the induced populations. So today with the emergence of genome editing technologies, it is quite possible to uh, know which a variation is affecting which trait and we can create uh, variations or we can induce the variations in the genome at the targeted locus. So this exercise we have done in case of rice uh, by inducing, uh, the, by basically uh, creating a genome edited plants of uh, Puso Basmati, uh, which are associated, especially targeting uh, uh, the starch synthesis pathway. Previous speaker was mentioning that um, uh, from uh, uh, keratin, uh, importance of basically the keratin and accumulation of it and all this uh, in, a, in a petri plate. But uh, here we show an example where we could uh, really uh, edit a, a tomato in order to produce increased uh, keratin uh, instead of lycopene. This is one such example which we have published in the PCR and uh, this tomato is no need of plate, you can just grow the tomatoes. Now this kind of uh, uh, tomatoes are basically compared to uh, uh, genome edited plants are relatively uh, having the ease of uh, regulatory regime also. So this can be effectively used to produce the as much of keratin as required. So I think these are some of the thoughts that I, I thought uh, we should, uh, I should emphasize over here uh, to uh, highlight the importance of genomics and their applied aspects into the uh, plant genomics. And uh, with this, uh, I'd like to stop my talk and uh, thank uh, KGDC for giving me this opportunity. Over to Chairman. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Vijay Reddy, for a very elaborate presentation of uh, the work carried out by AgriGenome. I think it's uh, one of the leading um, service providers for all of us, uh, and uh, uh, the, the kind of work uh, AgriGenome is doing is, uh, uh, is really excellent, and it has a tremendous scope for our um, agriculture area. Um, I am told that one of the next, uh, one of the speaker in the next se session has to leave early. So if uh, I'm permitted, uh, we, would, we would close this session so that the next session can uh, begin and maybe we can have the question and answers at a later time. Uh, 
thank you very much. I once again thank uh, KDISC for giving uh, me this opportunity to chair this uh, session and uh, a very wonderful presentation by Mr. Vishal Menon and Dr. Vijay Reddy. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, I just request you to stay back on stage for a moment. I invite Dr. Uh, Deepa Gopi, Executive Director, Consultant, KDISC, to kindly hand over the token of gratitude on behalf of KDISC. It is interesting for us to learn that our planet Earth is ruled by micro microbes. Without microbes, none of the larger complex organisms in Earth would survive. For example, for humans, there are more microbes and microbial genes in the body than the human genes. This applies to plants and animals, birds and aquatic orga organisms as well. All of these depend on microbes from digesting their food helping their immune system function and often providing them important nutrients. Hence, the ge genetic data of the microbiome becomes a very important part of the KGDC. I'd like to invite Dr. C. N. Ramchan, who is currently serving as the CEO of Thyrogen Molecular Innovations, Private Limited, a biotech startup in Chennai. He's also the co-founder and CSO of Mac Genome Labs, Private Limited, Chennai and Kochi. He is a key advisor to several companies including Cygenome Labs, Medgenome Incorporation and also holds the position of Director at Therogen Life Sciences. Thank you, Vajas, and thank you, Dr. Raju, for organizing so fantastically. And may special thanks to Dr. Nikeshan, Sam, and uh, Kerala Genome Center. <clears throat> there is slight changes there. I was supposed to talk for two, three minutes initially, so I am not doing that. Instead of that, you know, two of our uh, speakers has become panelists, and one talk will be there. That talk will be by Dr. Sabu. And what we are going to do is that I may I request all three of you Dr. Sabu, Dr. Padmanabh Shanoi, and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Aravind to come to the stage. The reason is that, you know, Dr. Shanoi has to leave. Uh, by 5.30 flight, and he has to be there by around 4.15, the airport. And it is by Indigo, and if he's not in time, then Indigo will go, and he won't be able to go. I have a lot of earlier experience. That's why we are doing like this. So let me first introduce Dr. Shanoi. <clears throat> um, you know, I know him for quite some time, and one of the most brilliant doctors, and one of the, he's like a scientist an exceptionally good scientist too, because he's doing a lot of research and really a, a very good humanist, actually. So let me just go through briefly. So he's, uh, he did both his MBBS, MD and DM from India, and MD from internal medicine and DM in clinical immunology. After his MBBS from Kerala, Alapi Medical College, you know, he is first rank in every subject which very rarely happens. And you know, after that he went for his MD and also DM, and he's doing a lot of research. And interestingly, about few days back, three, four days back, he invited me to give a talk in his place for doctors. So I realized, first time I was going to his place and realized that about 200 patients were sitting. 
and I do not know, and he told every day he is seeing between 200 to 250 patients, and uh, he works from almost 9 o'clock to uh, 7, 7.38, and if you want to talk to him, only in the evening is possible. So um, instead of he is going to talk, what I am going to do is that I am going to ask some question to him, and let us complete his session so that, you know, he will be able to go to the airport. Then after that, I will introduce the other panelists or speakers, then we can continue. So, um, Dr. Shano is an immunologist, which you know very well. So my first question, immunology is a very complicated subject. I don't think there is any drugs, medicine is there. If you inject an antigen, you will produce antibody. There are adjuvants to improve, but really immune, that immune response or, you know, accelerating the immunity, is there something? So that is first my question, is there really something other than exercise and how does microbiome, according to you, uh, can improve your immunity? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Ramchand. Ramchand has been very kind and he's very fond of, somebody is very fond of, so uh, let me, uh, so he's because of uh, uh, affection he's telling, doubling and tripling about me. Now, first of all, uh, thank you, Sam, and it's a wonderful initiative. I wish all the luck for this uh, grand initiative, and I hope uh, Sam's and Unisar's vision become really true in another 10 years. It will be one of the role models for others to follow. So, uh, what uh, Ramchan told, immunological diseases do not have treatment. I totally disagree. Immunological treatment, because what happens is Ramchan is looking at cure. That's what he's telling. He wants to cure, which is not possible for uh, now. But uh, as he said, uh, immunological diseases have treatment. They have, they are treatable. Yeah, yeah, they have treatable. I think he misspelled what when he was telling. Basically, he is trying to, t trying to tell that there is no cure. But what has happened over time, as a windfall of uh, development in cancer immunology, uh, the patients who have been benefited maximum is autoimmune rheumatic diseases. And we have fantastic th therapies have evolved over the last 10 to 12 years with a, uh, most of the patient, 99% of the patients, we can control the disease at least. And, uh, it is possible now. Having said that, uh, as he told, uh, what does microbiome has to do with autoimmune disease? As we know, microbiomes are, uh, uh, especially gut microbiome and oral microbiomes and the lung microbiome, all of them has contributed, they have antigens. These antigens stimulate the immune system in multiple ways and the interaction of the microbiome with the host immune system is what determines a lot of diseases which we never knew. Previously, we thought these things, if you look at the DNA, what is said is that microbial DNA, sir, will, sabu, sir, will correct me if I'm wrong. The amount of DNA in the microbiome is 200 to 300 times that of the human DNA which is present in the whole body. That much microbiome we all of us contain, which we never realize. And a human microbiome starts the day you are born. It is from the vaginal tract you get a lot of microbiome. Since then, the microbiota, it keeps changing depending on lots and lots of stuff. So people used to say, I always used to wonder, there is an ancient knowledge. Our patients are saying, Doctor, I used to say, this is psychological. All of us used to say, I used to say, I used to explain to you. Then there were studies which has come up from various parts of the world, which has very clearly shown, somebody is in US, they suddenly go to Norway or somewhere, your entire microbiota changes because your food habits change. Is the, this thyroid, does it change your microbiota? Can this really influence the antigenic load it has on the immune system? Does, will it help to change the way we treat diseases? It's a huge question. If that can help, that's what the science is. Today what we saw wrong may be become the right thing tomorrow. And, that, and we need to adapt. That's what the difference between scientists and those believers, we are all scientists. We believe in science, not in the beliefs what we have. And uh, that's what, so the immune system has a lot to do with microbiota because microbiota is full of antigens. For example, uh, let me uh, come to an example called spondyloarthropathy. Spondyl is spine, arthritis is joint pain. So there's a disease called ankylosing spondylitis which affects the spine. What people found out was that this has a lot to do with gut microbiota. People have shown, uh, and the, this disease has a relation with a disease, uh, gene called HLA B27, HLA subtype of B27. Those people who have a B27 gene has lot of increased incidence of ankylosing spondylitis. 
then people found out that there are certain bacteria like uh, I don't want to get, go to details of the bacteria because it is confusing from there are a lot of regional variations and uh, these bacteria if those who have this bacteria along with B27 they get disease this is the recent finding so what must be possible this bacteria will have certain antigenic epitopes which will be binding to this B27 MHC which will be producing the uh, T cell stimulation and causing the disease. So what I am trying to tell you is, this, and there has been lot of evidence, I am sure, I'm not sure how many of you really understand uh, immunology, at least 60-70% will understand, I am sure TH17 is the pathway which causes lot of autoimmune auto diseases and lot, there are lot of bacterial species which induce autoimmune disease uh, TH17 pathway. So by treating this, uh, changing the microbiota, we can do lots and lots of stuff, especially in immune disease. Let me give you another example. For example, uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, those who have gum inflammation, they develop rheumatoid arthritis more. But how it happened was recently revealed about three or four years. There's a, there's a uh, bacteria called Porphyromonas gingivalis, P. gingivalis or Porphyromonas gingivalis. Other, it will cause a lot of gum inflammation. It has an enzyme called PAD, PAD, arginal demination. It will cause a lot of citrullination. This citrullination will produce anti-citrullinate and antibodies. And these anti-citrullinate antibodies are the one responsible for rheumatoid arthritis. So what I'm trying to tell you is there are lots and lots of stuff which has been linked to the microbiota, especially in immune diseases. Only question is whether we can really change these diseases by, modify these diseases by changing the microbiota. My gut feeling is yes. But the problem is the amount of research gone into it is uh, very little because of, from, uh, from what happens in India is completely different from what happens from US. We cannot, uh, uh, what is that, uh, extrapolate stuff from one region to another and amount of those people who work on microbiota, sir will say, tell, me, tell us the complexity of interpreting the data what we get and how to really implement we need to see. But I am sure another 5 or 10 or 20 years, it's only a matter of time, humans will be able to manipulate this in one way or the other. Yeah, my uh, next question is related to autoimmune disease. You are working on a lot of autoimmune disease. For example, diabetes, type 2 diabetes is also an autoantibody. Those are attacks, the pancreas, rheumatoid arthritis. You know, so there is so many out there. Now, the question is that is there microorganism, whether it is present in the gut or anywhere, has to do anything with this autoantibody formation and uh, autoimmune disease? Let me take the example what I told earlier, rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, I told you, is related to gingiva. Gingiva, the, what will happen is, basically, you know where the citrullation happens. Citrullation happens in cells which are going to uh, do apoptosis. Once there, people know gingivitis is there, smoking is there, rheumatoid arthritis happens. So what was the link people never knew. What actually happens is, once you smoke, lot of cells undergo apoptosis. On the top of that, you have gingiva is inflamed. In gingiva, you have P. gingivalis, which has an enzyme called PAD. What it will do? It will citrullinate the peptide. So there will be lot of fibrinogens and lot of, uh, lot of uh, antigens will be citrullinated. And this will lead on to anti-citrullinated antibodies. This will go to the joint and then they will cause the disease. So basically, although the direct bacteria does not, uh, the uh, antibody against that bacteria does not really cause this, there is a indirect link. And there is another disease called reactive arthritis. You must, uh, uh, basically somebody develops a diarrhea or something, or you must have heard rheumatic fever, where streptococcal infection body reacts abnormally to the streptococcal infection and it goes into, attacks the heart because there is a molecular mimicry. There are certain antigens in the streptococcus is similar to certain antigens to the heart wall. So what happens is there is a cross reactivity. So the immune system and COVID also we have seen a lot of COVID, a uh, lot of autoimmune disease it has precipitated. So definitely yes, these infections uh, in the RNA uh, stimulate the immune system in such a way that immune system overreacts and the autoimmune rheumatic disease results. Um, slightly different question. You know our skin is full of microbiome. I mean various microorganisms, whether it can be fungus, bacteria, and they are all living comfortably. The reason is that our body itself has a lot of peptide and the, uh, it works as an antibiotic. It's actually interact with this, uh, with the, 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 the microorganism and do not allow. Now, is there, I mean, there 
are some of the diseases like you know which comes to the skin including psoriasis do you think it has it is because of this microorganism or you know change in microorganism or your diet pattern or some of the uh, you know other material soaps etc what we are using yeah fantastic question basically uh, what happens is there is a homeostasis namalaru uh, ecosystem is there which where innate immune system regulates the adaptive immune system being uh, very frank we know very much very much little about innate immune system which we should actually know so people very clearly know that in psoriatic patients the human the skin microbiota completely changes but idu koli ana koli motta ana adhi unda ennallana whether the microbiota changed cause psoriasis whether the, or the psoriasis caused the microbiota change we people don't know so to prove that you need a longitudinal studies but definitely yes change in microbiota will aggravate the disease that people have very clearly shown and we need to see mechanisms how we can prevent that change which may result in a earlier this thing for example as i told you in spondyl arthropathy there is a change in entire microbiota in the gut so what people did people treated them with anti tnf which is a very effective drug for uh, biological it's a biological drug for this ankylosing spondylitis so the moment the disease comes under control the microbiota also completely changes so it is a why this happens nobody knows which is first whether the microbiota change is driving the disease or disease is resulting in the change in microbiota people don't know so this is a yan parayir koli aanu koli motta aanu adhi unda ennu ariyathilla pakshe definitely there is a way we, we should be able to manipulate this or we should be able to modulate this in a positive way where the immune system is less and less stimulated so i think there is a lots and lots of studies needs to be going to this and as i told you earlier why kgd uh, this uh, genetic studies in our population is important we cannot extrapolate because uh, for example tnf is causing the disease in india and uh, australia or us so if you give block the tnf you can treat the disease all the places but what is the problem with microbiota is change in microbiota is not uniform in india australia and us so if you have to manipulate the microbiota it is most probably going to be center specific or region specific so we need to be really really uh, understand that whether the, it is really true in our population we cannot extrapolate this kind of stuff uh, from area to area what indians are very good at is nammal uh, made in india and they, we will do generics or we will do biosimilars that's what we are good at in this kind of manipulation i don't unfortunately we not be, we may not be able to do that easily so these kind of initiatives are the need of the hour and we should study able should be studying what is happening in our population then only we can try to modulate this um one more last question after that you know some of the audience want to ask some question can one or two questions can be asked um you know there are hundreds of probiotics are there uh, i'm not telling it is approved probably 600 700 are there in india too there are some genetically manipulated in the sense means novel genes are introduced and to some extent this is approved also as a grass product um do you think um, a probiotic can be expected very soon with a disease claim that means it like a drug claim not as probiotic as so uh, that is my question are you expecting something very soon i think sir the problem is we find a nutraceutical and try to find the application for it that is not really the way we should be doing it see we, we most of the time we don't find in clinically most of the probiotics there is a recent study which has been published from india itself whether in ankylosing spondylitis where there is a lot of change in the gut they try to give the probiotics there was a no change and as i told you the nutraceuticals which is maximum studies is curcumin we had recently done a curcumin trial for randomized placebo control means you randomize people into curcumin versus placebo and continue both for long term at for two years we have done and curcumin was worse than placebo what i am trying to tell you is uh, see nammala palapolum seriyanennu karunna aayikkathile seriyanundu that's how science has to follow and fortunately with the current probiotics current methods what we follow i don't think we will be able to see a huge change in disease patterns to change the microbiota we should understand what is uh, what is happening with microbiota which we have not studied let us be very frank about it honest about it then only we will be able to manipulate and we need to understand what the manipulation cause is going to cause to the immune system and as i knew you know immune system is really really complex 
there is lot of redundancy there is if you knock out one cytokine another cytokine will be upregulated so it is not that easy to manipulate immune system so we have to be very very careful before we go ahead and manipulate the immune system but my, uh, most of the time as i told you this uh, uh, all these nutraceuticals or uh, probiotics they really act as placebos uh, only evidence some evidence is there in antibiotic induced diarrhea and other stuff but to treat a autoimmune disease is a long long way to go um any questions from the audience you know you can ask yeah please i am a clinician so you can ask lots of questions yeah. <laughs> okay uh, so my question is uh, you know the establishing a particular microbe niche in an environment is related to the genotype of that individual also so is it possible to permanently change the microbiota even if you say you uh, transplant uh, or you give a cocktail of microbes how long is going to stay because it's a permanent association needs a like interaction between the genome also right very very true extremely important we don't know really speaking we don't know how long it will change whether the genetic makeup of the, of the thing is going to change after some time the whether microbiota changes but people have shown that by changing the diet itself you can really uh, change the particular one. for example performer romanas the people have shown rotella species fusibacter all these people have shown that introducing certain foods can really change this microbiota to a different phenotype the to, 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 to a different type of uh, in a microbiota can be uh, the gut microbiota completely changes so that's possible but as you said uh, th there's a lot of number of kori ana kori motta ana adhi undanu we don't know we don't know whether the genetic makeup made the microbiota or the microbiota is influence the genetic and most of the time is a mutual is a mutual stuff and uh, there's lots of uh, what is the black it's not black and white it's lot of shades of gray to it uh, did people take up uh, twins identical twins to study this i'm not aware of identical twin studies there must be something i'm sure there there can be data okay thank you Dr. B. Vijay Lakshmi, uh, postdoctoral fellow from Department of Computational Biology and Bioinformatics. Like so much was told about uh, how much the genome is being affected. So actually, to the central dogma where uh, the DNA influences RNA, R, in turn the protein, and the protein decides the metabolism. Is central dogma that happens like the exogenous metabolites influence the proteins, and in turn the proteins influence the DNA. So uh, that aspect. is to be considered along with the study of any genomic study the omic as well as the uh, metabolomic studies uh, needs to be together with the genomic study for addressing all these sort of issues yeah yeah we, yeah it's very true this central dogma epigenetic modifications all these things needs to be factored in the reverse thing also needs to be factored in cytokines influencing the gene expressions we need to factor in all these things that's what i was telling there is not 1 plus 1 is not never two it may be 1.5 2.5 it is not that easy to manipulate this kind of immune system uh, for example if a monogenic disorder it is very easy to treat and mind you none of these diseases are monogenic diseases there are multiple factors involved there are multiple environmental factor there are multiple cytokines so it is not at all easy i totally agree with you thank you i think uh, dr raju um, Doctor, so I will have to leave now. I invite uh, Shrimati Sajita P P, Executive Director, Management Services, K Disk, to hand over the token of gratitude on behalf of K Disk to our panelists. so uh, next is a presentation by uh, dr sabu thomas 
So Dr. Sabu Thomas is going to establish a microbiome center in Kerala Life Sciences Park. And uh, that uh, discussion is going on. I, yesterday, Chief Minister has announced that also. And Dr. Sabu Thomas is the faculty scientist and principal investigator in Pathogen Biology Division at Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology National Institute under the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. Um, expert member in surveillance of foodborne pathogens from Northeast India, ICMR, Government of India, and Program Advisory Committee of Kerala Biotechnology Commission under KCST, Government of Kerala. May I request you to give the presentation? Thank you. afternoon to all. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to say a few words regarding the coming up uh, Center of Excellence in Microbiome. Yesterday, actually it was in the, a milestone in the history of the Kerala development because our Honorable Chief Minister has declared two important programs. One is on the uh, Genome Center and the other one was, is on the, the ex establishment of a center of excellence in microbiome. Why it is so important? Actually, we know the DNA structure was elucidated in 1953, and after that, several such discoveries have been done, and many such advancements are going on in this particular field. But even in our state, we are also looking into this kind of molecular wave or in the genetic level, the discoveries, we are combining all this together and to come up with some kind of movement by using this genomic data for the welfare of the mankind or the human uh, in the state. The state of Kerala, as you know, we do have a number of uh, aquatic biotopes and uh, different types of uh, SRN systems. Many such systems are available, but we don't have one such detailed establishment or detailed study regarding the, the microbial world or the microbes inhabiting this particular niche. And also considering the heterogeneous population inhabiting the state, the, there lies the importance of this particular program. Anyway, the KDISC has initiated one such program and for the last uh, one or two years, we do have uh, several such meetings have been going on and based on that, we have a uh, developed some kind of ideas what how we wanted to proceed and how what kind of work we have to do in this particular uh, domain so before coming to that uh, that particular thing i just wanted to highlight what we are doing in our uh, rajiv gandhi center for biotechnology laboratory my group is working on the bacterial pathogenesis the major pathogen circulating in the state and the bacterial biofilm inhibition in the context of uh, the antimicrobial resistance and the, uh, next is about the human microbiome. In this particular, we are working on the development of the probiotic uh, microorganisms inhabiting the, uh, the infant microbiome. And also, we are looking for the other uh, impact of the, the two interventional studies. One is on the, the intervention of the antibiotic, the excess use of antibiotic into the gut microbiome and also the the effect of yoga, is there any, any impact on this particular human gut microbiome? I am not going in detail of this work. Today, I have been asked to make a small presentation on the, the objectives and the, the way how we are taking this forward to the, uh, the center of excellence in microbiome. So in that context, I am coming to that particular part. So for the last one year, as I told, we do have a number of meetings and we have collected the exp uh, called the different experts from the different domains to come up with some ideas to establish this particular center in the in the uh, in Tiruvannathapuram, the capital city of Kerala. Uh, actually, as I told, the KDS has taken some initiatives and uh, they have constituted an expert committee in the state by collecting the different members from the different uh, domains. Based on that, we have formulated the major uh, domains in this particular field. The microbiome research, a 
when we are considering the importance of this particular microbiome you know the initially the bacteria is generally divided into the good path, uh, good bacteria and the bad bacteria initially the scientists and the community was behind the pathogens why you know because they are causing the pathogenicity or the virulence and also they are producing uh, the disease, causing the diseases so uh, definitely we are definitely uh, behind that kind of but later on it has been found that this particular group of bacteria can help the community the human not only the human all the biotic and the abiotic compartments it is very essential and it plays a pivotal role when we look into the 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 research activities that is going on for the last two decades this has been started in 2000 some kind of initial research has been going on but for the last 10 years tremendous progress has been done even initially 400 500 publications this is based on the pubmed publications only 400 500 publications are available but right now even into uh, for the last 5 years tremendous progress has been developed in this particular field all this shows the importance of this let's see so about the vision and the mission of this the center of excellence in microbiome vision to understand the microbial systems and their interactions for what to tackle the health related concerns of all domains of the life and also to catalyze the microbiome mediated interventions especially in the context of the post flood scenario and also in the post uh, pandemic scenario and uh, our uh, ultimate mission is to catalyze and support the research and the development of the need based therapeutic interventions to address the identified challenges that means the states based on the state needs that is what the final uh, mission of the this particular center then considering the objectives these all these are formulated by uh, by the experts assembled and based on their experience and considering the needs of the state we formulated the objectives since it is a beginning if you have some kind of suggestions we will look into that also this should be a, a global a center par with the other national and international centers and uh, coordinates interdisciplinary research cross domain collaborations and also the innovative product development to popularize the importance of the microbiota especially in the context of the one health right now we know that the one health approach is very important to if you wanted to look into the health of the human we want to, uh, to look the health of the other domains that means the connecting the animal domain and also the plant or the environment and also to uh, to create the spatio temporal mapping of this microbiome data utilizing the big data technologies such as the artificial intelligence and the uh, other uh, internet of things and also the data analytics and also to create a genomic database that could harness further research and development to understand the microbial interactions and also to develop new tools using the emerging technologies leading to the explanatory research work and uh, another important function is to promote and support the startups yesterday also we have noticed that uh, the new innovations technology uh, uh, new from among the among the young innovators in the state so the center will catch the attraction uh, will catch the attention of the young innovators those who are interested in the scientific field to come up with some kind of uh, uh, new new ideas and also to contribute the social and economic and the environmental development of our state towards the fulfillment of the sustainable development so as i told the microbiome and the one health you know the human health if you want closely connected to the animal and the environmental health so the one health concept stresses the ecological relationship between the uh, as you know the the microbiome plays a very important role in the biotic and abiotic compartments and also among all the biotic compartments like the animal human uh, environment plant all those things are considered so the major domains identified in this particular microbiome this is not specially regarding to the human this is connecting to the human plant aquatic and the environment and the animal so initially in the morning session you have a detailed investigation lecture by dr sadish chandran regarding the impact of the the human microbiome so i am not going in detail to all these aspects
these are the major domains that we are included in this particular this thing and also the human microbiome the the first importance will be given to the microbiome variations in various human diseases conditions prevalent in the state and also we are as per the suggestion of the the then health secretary uh, mr rajan kobregadai is he also suggested us to make a study on the centenary centenarians those who are living in the in the in the country and also uh, compare with the japanese people and the development of the prebiotics probiotics symbiotics so when all the people are when talking about the microbiome the people are looking into the into the metagenome data alone but right now in this particular organization we are planning to establish a culturomics center also culturomics means the culture of this the desired bacteria that can be used for the health benefits but the metagenome data we can go ahead with some predictions or the diagnostic all those kinds of things uh, this also we are planning to do this and uh, with the the animal microbiome to understand the best microbiome as by thera therapeutic products from the production perspective and also the better health and uh, uh, the environmental conservation point of view then the plant microbiome to develop the synthetic microbiome uh, for the selected crop for the enhanced based on the needs of the uh, state aquatic microbiome also there is immense scope for the production of nutritionally enriched safe fish for the improved human health right now you know the pesticide pollution and the antibiotic pol antibiotic polluted uh, this kind of fishes and the meats are available in the market though the, uh, this should definitely provide this pollutant free flesh or the fish to the market the environmental microbiome also uh, we are looking into this for the sustainable development and the data labs this is also another important uh, component of this particular organization why you know the this big data analysis requires the expert uh, efficient expertness from the bioinformatic people and also from the other uh, related uh, artificial intelligence like uh, field so the proposed incubation model of the coe in the first part as we discussed the first one is the outreach program to spread awareness actually the people are not aware that this kind of uh, kind of work is going on right now we do have a number of uh, pieces of work has been isolated pieces of work has been done in some uh, government college hospitals and also in the university centers and the national uh, research centers also and the, the, so we have to come up with some new uh, program to spread awareness among the young researchers in the state yeah, as well as in the national and international level in future so the selection of the startup based on the uh, set criteria and the signing of the agreement between the uh, coe and the selected startup and there is the, to the possible level help for the product development of the uh, various services and the marketing and the post marketing these all those things are uh, in future only so the performance evaluation many such things are being formulated the important thing is collaborating with academia as well as with the research startup research centers and the industry experts actually right now we do have a number of researchers are going on in this particular field we are also doing some in the uh, in agri uh, in rajiv gandhi center and some in the agricultural and some in the kufos or the kerala fisheries university also but there is no such definite uh, a particular platform to collab to uh, to make a common platform to assemble all these domains and to come up with something after the development of the research finding that is what the ultimate goal and the mission of this particular center going to establish in the state this uh, already i have mentioned so with this i would like to close this uh, uh, center of excellence of microbiome in the state i hope Uh, this can be definitely come in close association with the uh, the data genome center also we do right now the the medical college hospital and the other uh, sri jitra tirunal hospital and major hospitals and uh, major universities are also right now assembling and uh, uh, as a, um, have some collaborations with our unit so we are expecting more interaction and more collaborations in future from not only from the government institutions it's all, it can also be from the non governmental agencies and also from other uh, private sectors also that, that is what our ultimate the private 
and the uh, government agencies come together to come up with, uh, then only we can meet the uh, needs of the state in all the major domains identified. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, one or two questions regarding this new center going to be established, you will be able to answer. Possession of, possession of the diseases. Yeah, right now it is, uh, <coughs> all those things are well established in the morning session, I think, to my uh, understanding. Because the microbiome, right now it is well proved that it plays a major role in causing some kinds of diseases and it can be rectified. As Aristotle mentioned in the BC, all these things uh, originates in the gut. But right now we can rephrase the statement, all these things can be cured from the the, uh, from the uh, elementary canal or the gut also. That means whatever the disease that is causing, yeah, uh, right now there is a saying that everything that is uh, uh, happening under the sky is due to the microbiome. But we have to prove that it has some impact on, uh, uh, the impact on this particular microorganism. Yeah, definitely there is uh, some kind of particular, uh, if there is an imbalance in your gut microbiome, that will lead to some kind of immunomodulatory things and by the secretion of the metabolites and finally it comes to the some kind of diseased conditions. And the malnutrition also plays a major role and uh, I think that uh, that kind of explanation is not required here. Uh, we do have a central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. In addition to that, the scientific community now referred to as this particular gut microbiome as the second brain. And uh, this can modulate all kinds of uh, actions connecting to the nervous system. So that kind of uh, nervous disorders can be connected to the, to the uh, imbalance in this uh, microbial uh, system or the, especially the gut microbiome. The center of excellence of microbiome is not focusing, uh, please don't confuse that, center of excellence of microbiome is not focusing only on the microbiome because uh, we do have n number of uh, uh, biomes or the domains we have to, whenever we are doing this kind of, pro, uh, supporting this kind of research, definitely we will look into the, the, the whole uh, domains that we collect, uh, selected for, uh, through the One Health approach. Yes. Exactly. <coughs> yes. Actually, we do have a, in our Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology also, we are doing this kind of a microbial work and uh, our experts okay. from the different domains, one is from the QSAT uh, under the Professor Deviga Pillai. So they are also doing something for that part of the collaboration. We will uh, take care of the advice from the respective collaborators. and. Uh, from Srijitra Dhirinal and from the medical college also we do have collaborators and uh, last meeting I think I don't find anybody from the QSAT. QSAT is also a potential uh, university in the, uh, in the state so uh, next time we, I think we will have some collaborations with the QSAT those who are interested from any of these domains. Many people are working uh, in the QSAT also. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, working on environmental microbiome, aquatic animal health. Exactly, correct. Uh, gut microbiome. Correct. In all those uh, areas, we do have people working on that. Yeah, <coughs> actually the center of excellence of microbiome is not focused on any of this particular. That is what our ultimate motto. We wanted to uh, collect this, the researchers or the scientists from the different domains working in the state come forward or assembled in uh, on a uh, common platform. From that, we can come up with something. Then we will go ahead with the other uh, kind of startups or something like that. And also to encourage the new, new startups or the ideas, especially from the uh, any domains, based on any domains or from any, any geographical location in the, in the state. Any more questions, sir? Uh, this is a very general question. I am Achyut Shankar from Kerala yeah. University. I am wondering whether uh, there would be a scope for documenting the microbiome diversity of Kerala. I am a lay person's background. We are having a chat in the chair uh, sometime back. I am a diversity of Kerala. Now it is wiped out. You have only Milma. Correct. So, there is a lot of fears and protecting. I remember that my mother, the word used is Vora Murunyu. Correct. I remember that we didn't watch it on the day already. Because we have a family of microbes living with us for many centuries. And you want to eat only a curd or, uh, you know, buttermilk milk, which is fermented by that. I mean, if you eat a white food, you can almost. Exactly. It's a very interesting and relevant question, especially in the post-COVID era. Yeah, as Sir suggested, we don't have any that kind of uh, aura right now. We all are looking, collecting all these things from the supermarket in the form of the packet and getting using the same thing. Uh, but we have to take care in all this to store or the preserve these kind of indigenous microbes meant for our uh, health benefits. Right now, we don't have. All the uh, things circulating in the Tiruvannathavaram district or in the state of Kerala is the same because it, it comes from the other side. As Sir has suggested, it don't come from your own kitchen. We wanted to keep all this kind of uh, indigenous uh, required or the core microbiota meant for our uh, health. That should come from the, from, the, from the home itself. Then only we can, in, a, in all the field. He is talking about only from this particular area. Yeah, another wiping out example is uh, the COVID we are always using this kind of uh, anti this thing. So uh, I don't know what happened after some time. This microbiota may not be disappear from our body. Maybe considering all this, there is a microbiome. The, in 2030, I think, uh, in the Arctic, just like the seed vault, the people are planning to establish a microbiome vault in the Arctic region to store all these indigenous microbes available elsewhere in the world. You know the seed bank which is in the, in the Arctic region. Like that, the people are thinking about, we wanted to store the, the available microbes, the maybe good or bad, but people are interested, or the scientists are interested in keeping the, the, the good microbiome, so that there is a, uh, an initiative to set up one such vault in the, in the, uh, in the northern hemisphere in the Arctic. Thank you, Dr. Sabu, and uh, we are slightly running out of time. I think we can, you, I, I suggest that, you know, please interact with him once uh, the session is over, uh, because, you know, we are running about 15 minutes uh, late, that's why. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Aravind. He's also not going to give a presentation. It was part of the panel discussion. So uh, let us start that. Dr. Aravind is currently is the head of Department of Infectious Disease at Government Medical College, Trivandrum. And uh, he has also completed his MBBS from um, Alipi Medical College, MD in Internal Medicine from Government Medical College, Kota. He's a certified antibiotic stewardship from University of Dundee, Scotland. So, um, um, maybe you can... Yeah, my first question, or the only question is that, can you please explain that um, uh, one health 
domain, what is going to be established or established in Kerala, and what are the different domains, and how do you think that, you know, this microbiome project can interact with your domains, especially when you are thinking about antibiotic resistance. So there are three, four questions are there in one. Respected Chairperson, good evening. I would like to uh, thank Munikrishnan uh, Sir, Sam Sir, and the entire KDS team for this uh, opportunity. And uh, since we are running short of time, I will briefly encapsulate all the activities done under uh, done by the government of Kerala over the last uh, five years. The most uh, under the umbrella of One Health. So why this is important is that you know in uh, 2017. Kerala became the first state to have its own strategic action plan to combat antimicrobial resistance, which is referred to as the, the CARSAP. And uh, last year, Kerala became the first state again to have its own One Health action plan. So the phase one is targeting the Pamba Basin districts, that is uh, Patanandita, Kotem, Alapi, Idiki. And then uh, last year and yesterday it was announced we are going to have the center of excellence uh, on uh, to coordinate the the, the research in microbiomes. So the, the, the common theme for all these three projects is actually One Health. As far as Kerala is concerned, One Health is very important for us because of multitude of reasons. One is actually the density of population. When you are looking at uh, the, in our density of population, it's twice that of the, the national average. The second is actually our uh, the diaspora foreign diaspora. The reason why, you know, COVID-19 was diagnosed for the first time in Kerala in India and monkeypox, no exception. Why? Because, you know, Keralites are everywhere in the world and they have faith in the health system and so when they become sick, they just take the next flight and land here. The reason why, you know, we had students returning from Wuhan with COVID-19 to Kerala and with monkeypox from uh, Dubai. And since our health system is strong, we are able to diagnose those cases. This is actually a challenge for us. Because, you know, if you're having an outbreak of Ebola in Africa now, Marburg virus outbreak there, and even in uh, remote countries like Sierra Leone, etc., we have around, say, 10,000 Malayalis there. One of them gets an infection, they might take the next flight and uh, land in Kerala. So that is one threat, that threat of emerging infections that the state is facing. And the second, third aspect is because of the forest cover. We know that, you know, everywhere, you know, we are uh, living in close connection with nature. For example, Alapi, we are ha always having the deaths uh, to the poultry, etc. At any point of time, this avian influenza might cross over to humans. So the threat of uh, zoonotic infections is very high in the state. The next aspect is the aging population of Kerala. We know that COVID is actually a deadly disease for the elderly. And we know the life expectancy of Kerala is around 10 years more than that of the national average. So any infection is likely to impact Kerala much worse than other states in India. And along with that, the problems of, you know, becoming slightly developed. The uh, issue is that we are having problems with obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and all those things. And above, uh, the people above 45 years, two-thirds of them are having some sort of a comorbidities. And this is the reason why the One Health program was introduced by the government of Kerala. And almost all aspects of this environmental microbiome, etc., were covered by Sabu Thomas in his uh, brilliant presentation. Also, the, the role of this uh, human gut microbiome in, that, in the genesis of auto-inflammatory as well as autoimmune diseases was covered by Dr. Padmanabhashanai. I will be briefly touching upon one aspect which is not often uh, recognized. It is referred to as the silent pandemic. That is the pandemic of antimicrobial uh, resistance. And uh, uh, last year, you know, Kerala published its, its surveillance report on antimicrobial resistance which showed that this AMR has actually, the problem of AMR is becoming acute in the, the state of Kerala. So many of the patients in the ICU are dying because you know the antibiotics are not effective against the, the infections which are get acquired from the ICU. Why is this happening? It is because of the changes in our gut microbiome. So infections can be acquired in two ways. One is exogenous infections. That is if you are in an ICU, if your infection control is not state of art, obviously the pathogens in the environment, that is ICU environment, can find its way into the human body. That is known as exogenous infections. And this can be prevented by targeting on infection control aspects. The second aspect is actually endogenous infections. 
so our hostess initially said that you know uh, the human so when we say that i am a human being actually there are i have around 10 trillion the human cells in my body and 100 trillion microbes living in my body so i am basically a microbial man i have more dna microbial dna and microbial cells than human cells and it is actually widely dispersed the microbiota is dispersed in the skin as well as the gut suppose you are in, a, in an icu or hospital with an infection say uh, due to staph aureus and you are using an antibiotic so it's not targeting this particular pathogen alone this antibiotic can alter your gut microbiota and this can lead to selecting out of drug resistant pathogens so this is uh, uh, referred to as collateral damage so this is actually the concept why endogenous infections are occurring means that anything that we consume which is having an antimicrobial property for that matter so we will say antibiotic can alter our, our gut microbiota and this can lead to endogenous infections now comes the elephant in the room that is where one health steps in it's not only through antibiotics that we consume that our gut microbiota is going to be affected it is through the food we consume it is through the water we drink also to an extent by air why is it happening because 70 percent of antibiotics globally is being used in animal husbandry fisheries and environment is agriculture only 30 percentage is directly consumed by us in the form of antibiotics so whatever is being used in other sectors this animal husbandry aquaculture etc indirectly will enter the food chain directly or and we will get exposed to this antimicrobial residues antibiotic resistant genes or this multi-drug resistant organisms together we refer to it as the environmental resistor so this environmental resistor is impacted by activities which are happening in all these sectors that is what is happening in animal husbandry poultry farming dairy farming agriculture in agriculture also the weed seeds etc they are using their is chemically similar to the antifungal drugs and all and then the pollution control board also has a, a big role to play because ultimately all these things will find its way into our food chain and will end up altering our gut microbiota so just for fun sake we used to say that no it's not enough not to take these antibiotics if you are taking chicken it's equivalent to taking ciprofloxacin that just means that if you want to address the problem of this antimicrobial resistance we need to have a one health approach and that is the reason why the CARSA, that is the state action plan on curtailing the menace of amr we have stakeholders from all the sectors we have stakeholders from animal husbandry we have stakeholders from fisheries and aquaculture dairy sector food and agriculture uh, as well as the, from the environment control board and this is not actually headed by the health department because so many ministries are involved so it is directly under the supervision of the the chief minister so this is uh, you know the importance that the microbiome the environmental microbiome can actually play in the genesis of antimicrobial uh, resistance and uh, probably this is the reason why you know state has been focusing so much on the one health led initiatives over the the last uh, five years or so i will end up by saying one who project that is a tricycle project this project actually uh, you know attracts the the resistance in a particular bacteria known as e coli so studies the samples from humans studies the samples from poultry as well as studies the samples from the shared environment and see whether the e coli which is developing resistance is sharing the the resistance genes and this study is actually being replicated in many universities in kerala and certain universities have switched over from e coli to klebsiella because it's more of a significant pathogen to us in the ICUs is more of drug resistant compared to E. coli and I will uh, end up by uh, I also had doubts like what Dr. Parvati from Kusat asked whether it is a correlation or is it causation the alteration to microbiome and interestingly one article which was published uh, last week on World Kidney Day they uh, is it was an RCT and one of them they had uh, around 250 patients with end stage renal disease who was who were underwent dialysis the other group the control group okay so what they studied was in those patients who were undergoing dialysis they assessed the, the shotgun metagenomics was done and they found that you know the fecal samples the secondary bile acids were more and they identified the more presence uh, the presence of uh, two bacteria was more uh, compared to the control group that was uh, you know 
on Agathella uh, as well as Fusobacteria nucleatum. And these, ad they identified the genes which could code for the production of uremic toxins. So the uremic to toxins are the reasons why, you know, the patients with uh, end-stage renal disease are very sick. You now they feel omitting always is because of uremic toxins. And what they did was, from this, uh, the, the fecal samples of ESRD, they inoculated into healthy mice. And there also they demonstrated increased production of uremic toxins and the, the mice became sick. So probably one of the examples to say that, you know, the correlation can result in causation as far as, you know, this study is concerned. And they applied, uh, you know, a probiotic that is uh, Bifidobacterium animalis was given to these mice. And this Bifidobacterium animalis could bring down the production of the secondary bile acids and actually can put, bring down the the production of this uremic toxins in mice. So from mice to humans, you know, is a long way. S still, I like, believe that the future is promising and Kerala state has taken uh, this One Health as well as uh, studies on microbiome on a big way. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, thank you. Um, th uh, thank you all the speakers, especially Dr. Arvind. Then uh, I was told that, you know, <clears throat> there is little bit time is there. So what I, I will tell you is that, you know, I will just tell some interesting anecdotal experience what I have got. I was not supposed to speak, but then suddenly it came up. Uh, <clears throat> I was uh, seeing your presentation and uh, realized that, you know, all probiotic, the papers started coming from 2009, 2010. That means only this is a 10-year-old research. So it's not like that. I'm just going to tell something like 45 years back, part of my PhD work. So I was working on, there are two, two different, my experiences I will tell. I was working on MS University Baroda. I was working on Lathyrus sativus neurotoxin. Lathyrus sativus is a seed which is taken mainly in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh. And during drought condition, no food, it's not like uh, current situation. There was no food at that time, this lathyrus sativus they were taking. What has found is that, you know, over a period of time, a large number of people become crippled. They get paralysis. So this is the background. And I was working on that. What was it? So we identified a toxin called beta in oxalate, alpha beta diaminopropionic acid. It is an amino acid derivative. So it was more of a neurochemistry because how this affects the central nervous system and everything. But one, inc incidentally, what we have found is that, you know, in the survey, not everyone gets this disease. Like whoever is consuming, normally if you are expecting that, you know, especially a toxin like that, almost everybody should get disease and it was not like that. There is a large number, 40, 50, 60 percent is not getting the disease. What is the reason? So my professor at that time told that, you know, that was the time microbiome, gut microbiome research was coming up. He told that, you know, along with your research, please find out what is the type of bacteria. Is there, is it possible to isolate a bacteria which breaks down this lathyrus that I was neurotoxin. So suddenly about 10%, 20% of my work became microbiology, this type of work. And what we have identified is that a bacillus species which break down lathyrus sativus neurotoxin and which we have identified in human also and many animals also and we have identified the metabolic pathway. Now, many people at that time told, why can't you make this bacteria and give to people? So that was a thought many times came but then nobody knew about uh, this microbiome and we only knew at that time aerobic organism, anaerobic organism, facultative organism, and how to cultivate facultative or anaerobic organism. And this is what we have done. So what I wanted to tell you is that as, as early as 45, 50, or even earlier than that, you know, some kind of work was going on, human gut microbiome. Now, second thing I would like to, again, especially when you are mentioning about, you know, uh, this um, antibiotic resistance, etc. In one of the very interesting uh, fi uh, findings we found that you also mentioned about many of these antibiotics are coming through chicken or other animals because, you know, there is something called antibiotic growth factor. Antibiotic growth factor is not given 
as to kill the bacteria theoretically it is basically it is supposed to increase or what is called feed conversion ratio and nobody knows how it is working so this is the background and what we have found is that you know there are two types of chickens are there layer and broiler chicken mainly in this broiler chicken suddenly we found that you know they get diarrhea some of them die and we identified some are not getting at all what we have done so our lateral thing came up what we thought that you know we took the feces diluted identified eventually i'm telling about the one year work a bacteria which is called bacillus it's a bacillus species we named it as pb6 this bacteria we studied further it is a patented now it's a product we also identified two circular peptides inside that is not only for antibacterial especially we found that it kills clostridium so we thought that we should develop it as a for clostridium difficile associated that you know resistance but then it has to go as a drug then we will have to isolate that peptide so that was a work which is going on anyway i just wanted to tell so these type of things can be done eventually this bacteria came from where from the gut of the chicken now this is a 1000 crore project product i think in india and this bacteria can be used right now is they are they are improving this for you know to remove antibiotics from the the food source so i thought that you know um, uh, i mean this type of lateral thinking should come when we are setting up this microbiome facility there is there will be lot of opportunities will be there so i thought i will just uh, tell this one and uh, thank you very much now now i think you can ask more questions 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 sir. yeah any any questions so you can ask to the panel or uh, to anybody uh, you had a question isn't it hello sir thank you for the informative session my name is maya i am a research scholar at mahatma gandhi university kottayam i have already talked with you in the morning and this is regarding the database which we are currently working on me and my friends and uh, this is an antimicrobial resistant gene to survive so it is uh, started as a part of the initiative brought up by kerala startup mission and it is for a duration of total 8 months so up to the 8 months can be connect with you uh, with the center of excellence of microbiome for the same if so how can we connect with you has been declared by the chief minister so we have to uh, go forward little bit also first of all we wanted to anchor the the institute or the center of excellence of microbiome in the state mainly it is uh, decided that it should be in the in the rajiv gandhi center for biotechnology campus for the coming two years under the guidance of the uh, center state council science and technology council and after that it moved on to the other uh, its main campus in the life science park this is what we have decided so far but meanwhile you can uh, if you on the very few months within few months that means we are, right now we are starting some agenda how to straight it forward from the april 1st onwards so that i think you can contact me or the any of these centers the state council or the rtcb or the kd school so you can contact the officials so that you will get some uh, get updated on that definitely we will help in the in the coming up startups especially from the youngsters that is what our ultimate motto there is no doubt for that okay sir thank yeah, you yeah uh, my personal suggestion you have to wait for some more months that's all yes we are currently working on it and we'll wait yeah you can correctly. proceed with your research work or the uh, the activities that is going on in the in your university or in your center wherever it is but if you wanted to come up with some kinds of startup we have to follow some official procedures that's all so that then we can go ahead with some mou with the center of excellence of microbiome and your university department yes. right now we are formulating all those rules and regulations okay 
Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, that was the end of it. Thanks a lot to all the speakers and uh, thank you very much. So, uh, I invite uh, Srimati Sajita PP, Executive Director of Management Services, KDISC, to hand over the token of gratitude on behalf of KDISC to the panelists. Kerala has a number of unique breeds of livestock like the Vechur cow, the Kasa goat dwarf, the Malabari goat, etc. It is also the home of many rare species of frogs, butterflies, amphibians and reptiles. We often hear about the human-animal conflict occurring in different parts of Kerala as nearly 30% of Kerala is forest and humans have been encroaching into these forest areas. To shed light on this topic, I invite Dr. Arun Zakaria Chief Veterinary Officer, Kerala Forest Department on stage. In fact, uh, thank you very much basically for uh, KSDC and organizers and uh, Sam sir for having me in. Unfortunately, I selected my topic in a different way. It's not human wildlife conflict, which I did yesterday. So I just want to emphasize on a subject. It's called conservation genetics and the role, the importance and the significance in, in our scenario, Kerala scenario. So, conservation genetics is actually a branch of genetics, as you know. It's rapidly increasing its influence in conservation teams. It got direct in the impact on, uh, uh, conser it's, a, it's a conservation tool, basically. But at the same time, it got direct application in human welfare as well, and indirect by conserving, you know, as a conservation tool. So. So applications of conservation genomics in the current scenario, we can look at as um, the role in disease ecology, especially wildlife disease ecology, or wildlife population genomics, and wildlife forensics. These are the major three areas where the application comes. And um, I just want to uh, uh, talk about the uh, uh, wildlife disease ecology a bit. The, uh, so all, you know, so many people talk about that. So our concept of disease has changed. Now it's a triad. There's a host, there's a role of agent, and environment. Okay, previously we thought the agent, the, the disease causing agent is important, but now we know the host immun immunity is important, host genetics is important. At the same time, environment change is also important, especially in the changing climatic situations. So, the role of uh, disease ecology is really big. For example, this is a book called Serengeti Story by Sinclair, and it's a very quite interesting book. It shows disease ecology, how the disease, real disease change a landscape. This is talking about the Serengeti, the world famous national park, a single disease, you know, till 1888, Serengeti area was totally uh, uh, inhabited by Maasai Maras. And Maasai, you know, they are cattle uh, uh, grazers, their livelihood is cattle grazing. And in 1888, actually, they brought some cattle from India, okay, and the cattle having Along with that, they brought a virus, Rindapas virus. 
Okay, so Rindapas virus is basically evolved in uh, Asia. When they brought it, they wiped out all the cattle from Serengeti area and they have to move, the old Maasai Maras to move towards the Central Africa, leaving the area barren and they become slowly, bushes came up and become abandoned. After some time, the disease outbreak over, people try, try to come back to Maasai, but meantime, the whole area was, you know, shrubby area and there was lots of tsetse flies and which causes sleeping sickness and they have to abandon. So a single disease actually, a disease ecology actually, change a landscape. So that's a significance of it. And again, the question, does wildlife disease cause extinction? And which was, you know, uh, a, a question for many times. Previously, uh, wildlife diseases mainly concerned as, uh, you know, a density dependent mechanism controlling the population size. Okay, when there is an over increase in the population size, some diseases really manages to control them in a density dependent manner. But things has changed. For example, this is called story of chytrid fungus, a fungus which made extinct 80% of amphibians, beautiful amph amphibians from Central America. It's a free-floating fungi called the Betrachochytridium dendrobatidis, a mouthful term. And this is the first evidence that disease caused extinctions now, but we have more and more evidence coming up. So while looking into diseases, okay, why I'm talking this, basically wildlife diseases occupies niches. Okay, this is a coevolution process. A disease in a species or in a particular landscape occupies a particular niche in a species. So any change in the niche concept actually brought back emerging diseases. So we have wildlife EADs there, wildlife emerging diseases. We, the last 10 years, we identified so many emerging wildlife diseases. And, you know, human EADs are the, we have Nipah virus, coronavirus, Kaisenu forest disease viruses and lots of domestic EADs, bird flu, for example. So actually these all are interconnected and there is an interface in between them. And this interface has many implications, especially, especially due to anthropogenic reasons or due to climatic changes. So in wildlife disease ecology, which uh, we are dealing with, there are lots of microparasites and microparasites are emerging and affecting Sorry, I have a fever and a sore throat. Uh, um, so, affecting multiple taxa like anthrax. Anthrax cases are really emerging in wildlife, especially in elephants. Of course, it's a multi taxa disease. It can affect in wild boar, it can affect in gore or elephants. And same time, there are many emerging diseases, for example, tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis. You know, mycobacterium tuberculosis is a human pathogen. It's evolved in humans during the civilization. Actually, this, wire, uh, this bacteria is actually jumping from uh, uh, human to wildlife. For example, we reported the first incidence of outbreak of mycobacterium in the wild. In the, it's, re, uh, it's really surprising. You know, TB need to have a close contact, but wild elephants are getting TB. It's a uh, 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 surprising thing. Again, spillover in wild boars is also quite increasing. It's really emerging in wild boar. You know, wild boar acting as an interface between the human and the wild. So this may be the one of the reasons for the TB in emergence. And, you know, the canine December emergence in wildlife, which is increasing worldwide. So many species got extinct. And at the verge of extinction, so African lions, uh, um, um, so many species. So we identifying emergence of, again, canine December in so many wild species, including leopards and wild dogs, massive death in wild dogs due to canine December, never been reported again. And again, classical swine fever in wild boars. Classical swine fever is a domestic animal disease, which is again uh, um, um, spilled over to the wild, wild boars, and there is a mass mortality. And surprisingly, the new one, endotheliotropic elephant herpes virus, a, a deadly virus in elephants, which is first reported in US in 1995, and 2007 we reported, and um, mass mortality is happening, and these diseases are really emerging in wildlife. So these are the EHV in captive elephants and again the free-ranging wild, ele wild elephants for the first time. So again, emergence of some diseases which are quite unique, for example, systemic mycosis in elephants, wild elephants. I can't find a model even to, to explain this. It's due to uh, uh, a host immune response failure or whatever. So these things are really happening. The question is, what's, what's behind this? So this is a futuric parrot 
you know, it's, it's reaching extinction mainly due to uh, uh, loss of genetic variability, the population loss, so leading to uh, inbreeding. And again, wildlife cancer is also a concern. Previously, there was very limited report of wildlife cancers. Now, there are lots of cases reported and in turtles and Tasmanian devils and also in other species. We reported many cases in elephants also. So, the conclusion is actually that diseases play a major role in wildlife and pathogen host environment interactions are the determinants of the diseases and pathogen pollution is the major of wildlife threat and wildlife diseases are the source of many human emerging diseases and wildlife disease ecology does need to be studied both for conservation and human welfare. So basically wildlife disease ecology is quite interdisciplinary at the same time conservation genetics play a major role to address the wildlife disease ecology. So why we are embarking genomics in conservation? The question the one is our limited knowledge of evolutionary process in wildlife. We don't know the evolutionary process of many species and how they are related, genetically related, phylogeny and everything. We have very limited knowledge to elucidate many situations. And again, revamping concepts in conservation strategies. For example, we look, in, we look into uh, population size. <coughs> population size as a marker of uh, 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 conservation you know, uh, 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 index of a species. If you say the population is increasing, we say everything is good. But this is not a situation. Uh, around the world, things are changing. They're looking at the fitness of the population, genetic fitness of the population, and assessing the future survival of the species. So there should be some conceptual change. And this can only be only achieved through the conservation genetics. And genetic diversity analysis. We are not doing the genetic diversity analysis, how inter they are, how genetically diverse they are, uh, what is the heterozygosity in the population is nothing being answered and without that we cannot come into a conservation uh, uh, strategy to save a species and the use of new non-invasive genomic techniques you know the sampling in wildlife is quite difficult very 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 difficult because of strategic problems and uh, most of our endangered species you cannot collect samples from them but at the same time by using genomic tech, for example scatter genetics you can collect the fecal samples or excreta and you can do the genomic analysis them and application of new genomic technologies. I can tell you two examples. There was a mass mortality of elephants in 2014 to 17. So like in the Botswana situation, and uh, we were trying to elucidate that, and it's almost mimicking like anthrax, then we confirmed it's not anthrax. Then the problem is that it undergoes heavy putrefactive changes quickly, within hours. And so there are lots of invasive bacteria, so uh, uh, we, we cannot deduce actually what is the reason. So we went for, uh, bacterial metagenome before we find sequencing and we found that the profiling found mostly it's due to Clostridium novae type B and Clostridium novae type B never been reported in wildlife except in one condition in uh, Africa not in elephants in wild species so and again we are doing a currently doing a work with SAMSER actually uh, doing coronavirus uh, surveillance in bats then the problem is again you know the viral titer is very low so we are applying viral metagenomic to elucidate the situation. So current lacuna in conservation genetics, there are lots of uh, 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 role uh, conservation genetics has to play. Number one is the population structure and level of inbreeding in wildlife population. This has to be addressed. And disease as a selection process. Our view to disease is entirely different. Apart from uh, the emerging diseases, this is re really playing as a selection process to evaluate that. And emerging diseases and genetic variability studies in the host population, again, why, what's the role of genetic fitness and uh, genetic variability in emerging diseases. For example, we did a, uh, a whole genome analysis of the herpes virus cases and we find that uh, genetic diversity is very low in the death cases. And human wildlife conflict genomics, and which is quite interesting in our observation, especially in the elephants, we found that large number of elephants which are conflicting having a behavioral genomic role. Okay, they are habituated conflict animals, almost just like a risk-taking behavior. So there is a behavior genomics can a real role in, in, in uh, 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 identifying human wildlife conflict situations. And there are, there are so many genes, you know, risk-taking genes are uh, 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 seen, and actually we are looking into that. So there is a huge scope of human wildlife conflict uh, genomics developing that. So, and again, the forensics, you know, molecular forensics is an important subject. It's fast growing. There are lots of pet trade. There are lots of wildlife crime. Uh, uh, so, and this is a field where really we have to focus. So, thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you.
question um, there's a uh, there's a disease in, uh, in cats which is caused by an organism called toxoplasma gondii mm -hmm. which is known to take over the brain right and, and induce risk taking behavior mm -hmm. any correlations of that in terms of your elephant conflict studies in the risk taking behavior by some of these animals in uh, human dominated landscapes uh, because it's very similar in terms of how rats and cats yeah. behave when they're infected with toxoplasma yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, actually, we did screening. So we did a lot of postmortems in elephants, 600 more postmortems in elephants. So we took brain samples and we did the toxoplasma non PCR and um, we couldn't identify many cases, especially in particular conflict death cases. They may die due to electrocutions and all those cases. We take samples and we did the PCR, toxoplasma non PCR. So no. But there is another situation. For example, I, uh, I uh, told you about um, uh, canine distemper virus. There was a huge modality of uh, civets going on the last one, two years. And so many cases of road kills happened. We found that the road kills in civets were increased tremendously during the last two years. And we could identify canine distemper virus in those roads, road kills also. You know, CD can affect the brain, it can change the behavior, it lose fear. It lose coordination and cause maybe that is the reason for you know road kills in civets. But toxoplasma, no, we couldn't have any correlation. Right. Thanks again, Samsa. Thank you very much. I invite Srimati Veena George, Honorable Health Minister, who's going to be joining us online right now.
I invite the Honorable Health Minister Srimati Veena George to address our gathering. Good evening, all of you. Namaskaram. I am Anurag Sharma. I am going to talk about the topic of Agrahi. I am going to talk about Agrahi. I am going to talk about the topic of Agrahi. Orang ini dengan cerai naik itu boleh aja. Aduh, kau ni ni rata abdek aja tan kadiye ni lla. Paksah balade balade samboshan mula. Kedis kende itu punya inisiatif. KDDC, Kerala Dinam Data Centre. Idu mai bentuk petir tu lla uru sastra semena. Balade mikit ceri diil sangkut pike petu endul lla. Kerala ke sambandu cerita orang bodoh diil. Orang tuh kecik arugya mekale sambandu cerita orang. Walau deh perdeksha nalgara mai tulah uru kari mat. Agora dah lakukan dengan wajib sastra mekale sambandu cerita tulah arugya mekale sambandu cerita kari show padgal. I samiipa kali kali beliya tu dili mari tu. A matatina perdana karena mai tulah do covid pertumbuhan pola ulah pagarccha biaki galan maha mari galan. Kerala ke sambandu cerita tulah nippa. Aduh boleh abis session covid. Nampre arugya mekhela eh sambandhi cerita tola mula, perwakilan engalil, aduh boleh perjuangan engalil, adi ke sengkaya engal, wajib sastra mekhelil kondo beri nanda dende, ani wajib dek kucu mula bocah tu lekang valiye reveal macam undaki tu. Nian paranya tu, arugya mekhelai sambandhi cerita tola, awaganik yang kaya tu ur mekhelai ayi, idu mari tu. Kerala tu nana, iyo ru khatte tu, loka jogya sengkara ayi ke rasa sapa. Egaru juga umai bentuk petir tulah kaccha padgan rudi ke dicah uru khatta tel ter. Perdeh dicah anti mikrobial resistance umai bentuk petir. Aar ideal uru AML literate state agama dengan berani tulah perwakilan engal aar ini di game. Atuh nalar ideal mundur tu kurtu boleh change uru state agama Kerala. Agola dengan tel ter. Angen ini tulah uru kurta kap Kerala tel. Aadiya kala khatta tel ter. Unda iya mula tu balade perkhidmatan petir ter. Iya bahasa tel ter. Jangan orang kerja. Nipa, ada samai itu, madu boleh dengan ni. Ipol, COVID mahamari ni udah beli beli pernah mai itu, nama bintu mari tidak. Mungkin tarikh tarikh ni nama kita diberi kian kali ni. Paksa ini khatat itu lakukan dengan dinamik sequencing, beli ribu nama sahaja. Ini um tu daru, rawangan lu mai bentuk petu, atau dapat dengan ni, wkti kalu dia haru gigi lu mai bentuk petu. Atau treatment cilsa, ada dengan apa pura. Well-being, wkti lu deh. Ah, uru aling de, well-being yang mana, susu bi yang mana, barangan perthana mai tu mana aja. Apa adil, itu um perthana perlu tu khadaga mai tenne, itu ne kandu gaya ana. Perkara kicir, ini nama Kerala karma pathadi ranting de bahaga mai, ardha mission lu de. Ini sekarang de kali alamin, nama fokus ini de patu gaya ni. Patu gaya ni lalu mana, ega rugi tu lapis ti dama. Apo, aduh manusia ni um, perempuan ni um, ni um, paksi mazal ni um, mawasa lepas ni um, ni um, arugya beri mai tu, mana sahabat kita mana, adun de adistan beri mai tu la asy. Apo adil le, nama kami yang orang orang spesies ni um, unique mai tu la microbiome um. Apo adil le, sama dite tu la orang orang understanding, darah ni gel, bukti ni gel, wala ni wala ni critical ana ni um ni gel, orang tarco mila tu kaya mana. Ia bersama itu, saya ini dengan karena itu, Kerala itu satu wajibnya juga semua makhi makhi edukkan itu, makhi edukkan itu. Karena, namu karya, ada kerajaan ini kalau itu, sarwa putri yang biar biasa naik itu, tudangi, buat diskerana niya manggil oke tenet. Namun Kerala pun dah ke pudian niya manggil. Tamu ke yang kesana itu ada, ada juga mereka ni lalu biar biasa mereka ni lalu bunyai tengah pun dah ke samstana um samu kau mana namu. Apo ini satu Nampu deh aru ke suruh jangan galu, adu boleh bidya kaya sama ikhlas ini lula nampu deh netang lula bokke. Bicara sedar aja galu mai tarik dulu cie perlu mada. Kon nampu lana poyo ur lead role edukai enda. Eng engot, ini engot an nampu sanjiri kaya enda deh lula. Adil seria ya di sini lana. Kerala mana, bekta makan na, ida benda lana, ida enda lula dana, ida mai bentuk pete pertiaga mai KDDC. Adu kur deh lundu kuri, adu bekta makan ya. Kerala seria ya di sini lana, bukan ada enda lula. Iya pasal itu. Kerala itu ruh wajibnya ni kan semua makii makii itu tu nade. Ini dinamik data center nak, itu mai bentuk peta perwakilan yang tu kadi itu nula dale, satu tak kau mila, agola dale tu. Itu mai bentuk peta jenis yang ni, sastra yang ni, adu boleh, bidya api gale, ini mai kene ini kene, ni kene kene, kundu kene, itu mai bentuk peta perwakilan itu nade. Angen itu, balik itu, 
ശൃംഖലയുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെട്ട് സൃഷ്ടിക്കുന്നതിന് കഴിയട്ടെ എന്ന ആത്മാർത്ഥമായി ആശംസിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് ഈ രീതിയിൽ നല്ല രീതിയിൽ ഇത് സംഘടിപ്പിക്കുന്നതിന് വേണ്ടി പ്രവർത്തിച്ച എല്ലാവരെയും കേരളത്തിന് പ്രത്യേകമായിട്ടുള്ള അഭിനന്ദനങ്ങൾ ഇതിൽ പങ്കെടുത്ത എല്ലാവരോടുമുള്ള ആദരവും അറിയിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് എന്റെ വാക്കുകൾ ചുരുക്കുന്നു കേരള ജിനോം ഡേറ്റാ സെന്ററിന്റെ സയന്റിഫിക് സെമിനാറിനും ആശംസ അർപ്പിച്ച ബഹുമാനപ്പെട്ട ആരോഗ്യ വകുപ്പ് മന്ത്രി ശ്രീ വീണ ജോർജ് അവറുകൾക്ക് കേഡിസ്കിന്റെ പേരിലുള്ള നന്ദി അറിയിക്കുന്നു അതോടൊപ്പം ഈ സെമിനാറിൽ ഭാഗമാക്കായ ഓരോരുത്തരോടും പ്രത്യേകം പ്രത്യേകം നന്ദി അറിയിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് വാക്കുകൾ ചേർക്കുന്നു നന്ദി നമസ്കാരം In continuation with the uh, animal and aquatic health session, I'd like to invite Professor Valsama from Cochin University to join us on stage. Good evening all of you. First of all, uh, let me thank the organizers for giving this opportunity to represent Cochin University of Science and Technology in this very important seminar organized by Kerala Genome Data Center and Credisc. And Professor uh, K. N. Madhusudhanen, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, could not come over today. So he has delegated four of us to represent Cochin University here. and thank you all of uh, all of you for staying back after the tea and after the minister address so as uh, i am uh, standing here to present the capabilities of cochin university to contribute to this uh, genome data center as in, in everybody knows cochin university is the only science and technology university in the state and it has completed 50 years and over the years it has transformed into an international institution of eminence and university also has gone so much of transformation with the translational research center creating an innovative ecosystem creation of a startup ecosystem and also an innovation campus all these has happened over the past few years in, in cochin university and university has several i am not going into details of the other capabilities but whatever is relevant to the genome data center i am presenting here cochin university has life science departments such as national center for aquatic animal health department of biotechnology school of environmental studies school of industry and fisheries department of marine biology microbiology biochemistry and uh, a dbt bioinformatics center is instituted at national center for aquatic animal health cochin university of science and technology in 2021 and uh, it is in collaboration with other life science departments of the university as well as the department of computer science and computer applications and university has a pusa tech foundation uh, to support the activities of uh, uh, students and uh, this is relevant to the previous session the department of biotechnology is conducting extensive research on marine microbiome especially several uh, transects data sets are collected by cruises onwards sagar sampada and sagar kanya uh, starting from the coast to 2000 meter depth on 10 cruises several extensive data sets have been collected for uh, uh, functional uh, meta genomics which are correlated with the carbon nitrogen and sulfur cycle 
and also for enzyme screening and resistome study. So uh, the Department of Biotechnology is having extensive data set on marine metagenome. And also, uh, this is also pertaining to the previous session, we have a center for excellence in neuroscience and uh, there is uh, microbiome related studies on the gut brain axis, especially on neuroinflammation, neuroplasticity, fetal brain development, aging and neuro degeneration. And also uh, the studies are ongoing on understanding crosstalk between human gut microbiome and metabolome in health and neuro uh, degeneration. And also in plant uh, genomics, uh, developing genome-wide simple sequence repeats for studying population genetics and the spatial genetic structuring of important mangrove ecosystems and in the west coast states of India is being carried out and ex extensive data set on markers for population genetics have been uh, collected. And uh, recently, uh, Cochin University of Science and Technology has entered into a MOU with uh, Carcinos Healthcare, uh, Healthcare and especially uh, for cancer genomics, cancer diagnostics, discovery and development, cancer therapeutics, discovery and development and also on basic research in which our Department of Biotechnology is uh, playing a very important role and which is also relevant to the earlier uh, uh, sessions where uh, this, uh, in, uh, this seminar which was discussed. And uh, coming to the aquatic and um, uh, aquatic animal health, the National Center for Aquatic Animal Health of the university has been working for the past two decades uh, in extension research and teaching of uh, aquatic animal health and marine biotechnology. And as a Department of Biotechnology Government of India has instituted a bioinformatics center for marine biodiversity conservation and sustainable utilization of marine bioresources at this center. So we propose uh, this center as a satellite uh, center of Kerala genome data center uh, for uh, marine genomic resources. So if we uh, look at the institutional capabilities of uh, this center, conducting a national education program, MTech in Marine Biotechnology. We have several national facilities, National Viral Repository, a national synthetic biology platform, national facility for sustainable aquaculture production systems, national facility for marine extracts and genetic resources for bioactive molecules. And uh, we have, uh, we, Cochin University is one among the four universities who are awarded Indo-US 21st Century Knowledge Initiative sponsored by University Grants Commission in which the center has been collaborating with the UCST and Virginia Tech and Indo-UK Newton Baba Fund for Global Partnership in Aquaculture. And uh, this year, uh, under, with the support of KIFBI, a next generation sequencing facility has been established and also DBT skill began in collaboration with the Kerala Biotechnology Commission is established at the center. So there are several, uh, three startups, two, uh, one, one is Oceanus uh, Biopolymers, Messrs. Microbeside uh, Private Limited, all these are, you know, uh, from utilizing marine microorganism uh, for various biotechnological application. And uh, we have a faculty startup under Kusa Tech Foundation, IGY based diagnostics and therapeutics. And as I already said, this DBT Bioinformatics Center, it is in collaboration with the various other departments of the university such as computer applications, computer science, marine biology, microbiology and biotechnology and Department of Biotechnology, Goa University. And as we know, Kerala University is the, uh, in the forefront of bioinformatics. Professor Achyushankar S. Nair is a mentor for our, this center and Professor I.S. Pricing also is a mentor for this center. Core activities uh, in uh, bioinformatics and computational biology, we have trained several candidates at various PG level, plus two level, postgraduate and research scholars and teachers, and also we are also working on research in the application of NGS for creating a reference model to represent perturbed ecosystem, targeted drug discovery, synthetic biology based production of biomolecules, assessing effects of xenobiotic using aquatic model based on gene expression data. And recently, uh, the Cochin University of Science and Technology has established the central genomics facility which is hosted by the center 
uh, a next, next seek, Illumina NextSeq platform and a capillary DNA sequencer with all activities. And uh, we uh, repurpose that this uh, uh, NGS facility, genome sequencing facility, as well as the bioinformatics facility be linked with the Kerala Genome Data Center. Now, some of the specified areas which are identified in uh, uh, this aquatic animal health is the genomics pathogens. Genomics of aquatic pathogens. We are approved diagnostic center for fish and shellfish uh, disease diagnosis by the Ministry of Fisheries, Government of India, and under National Viral Repository Project funded by the Department of Biotechnology. We are holding a national viral repository of aquatic pathogens. So uh, we can uh, initiate with the genomics of these pathogens to, and also we can study the host pathogen interactions of various uh, cultured species. It is very important because uh, especially to control the mass mortality events, to understand the viral replication cycles, host immune system, and we have biosystems systems and aquatic animal cell culture facility at the center. Another very important aspect is the gut microbiome of the culture of fish and shellfish species. We are... Uh, we have trans translated seven uh, uh, health aquatic animal health uh, probiotics and other products to aquaculture sector for the past 20 years. This is continuously in use in several aquaculture settings in the state and outside the state. And what we could observe is that the, the zero water exchange systems which are following the strict application of this probiotic are having uh, a healthy ecosystem. So it is very important to study this gut microbiome to control the bacterial infections in fin fish and shellfishes. Another very important area is sediment microbiome in relation to biogeochemical cycles in the sea and aquaculture system. Because uh, ammonia uh, uh, and uh, hydrogen sulfate and the development of anaerobiosis is a very critical issue in aquaculture. So to manipulate and understand the microorganisms in aquaculture environment, is very important. Another important area proposed is genomics of novel bioactive and marine natural product. The center is holding national facility for marine extracts and genetic resources. So uh, we are doing genome mining for novel natural products. So uh, we, uh, so for, with a long term vision for metabolic engineering, it is very important to develop genome uh, database of this uh, Bio, biotechnologically potent microorganisms. Another very important area proposed under this is genomics of indigenous fin and shellfishes of culture importance in specific regions. For example, Kutanad, Macrobacchium rosenbergi, Etroplus, Anabas, Chana, Silla serrata, Pinae syndicus. These are some of the species which have been identified of importance for which you know, genome database is required. And for the stock improvement, it is very important to have this uh, genome database. And we have developed capabilities over the years in CRISPR uh, genome editing, especially CRISPR-Cas based genome platform for genetic improvement of uh, um, aquaculture species. We have developed a fish specific CRISPR vector and uh, under different programs, the gen genome editing of pearl spot, microbacchium rosenbergi, orange spotted grouper, all targeted growth, zebra fish, all these programs are ongoing. And very importantly, now we have uh, Mr. Vishal from Synthetis here, Cochin University has taken up a very important um, step in this direction. C.V. Jacobs Center for Synthetic Biology and Biomanufacturing has been established in Cochin University in last month. So uh, we are very much collaborating uh, with the Synthite in developing synthetic biology tools. And uh, we have a very strong uh, computer science and computer application department. We have high performance computational facility coming up at CUSAT of uh, 350 tetraflops uh, HPC system. AI server with uh, a 100 GPU facility. And we have experts in AI, ML, and data analytics specialized in the field of computational biology and bioinformatics. So having all these institutional capabilities, uh, we are proposing uh, to collaborate with the Kerala Genome Data Center to open new horizons in genome data resources generation for biodiversity conservation and sustainable utilization. Thank you for your patient listening.
like to invite Dr. VJ Rajesh Kumar, Assistant Professor, Department of Agriculture, Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Studies. So very good evening to all. So I represent Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Studies, KUFOS, Kochi. So being a dedicated university to cater the requirements of uh, fisheries and aquaculture sector, we do a lot of research to, to ensure the sustainability of uh, fisheries and aquaculture sector, especially in the state of Kerala. So what we are... Uh, we are highlighting the, the, the significance of this uh, KGDC in, in terms in the field of aquaculture and fisheries. So for the ease of discussion, I just uh, listed the points under the three major categories, that is aquatic animal health management and uh, genomic genetic improvement and biodiversity. So coming to the aquatic animal health management, uh, we do a lot of disease diagnostics and uh, we do work on the antimicrobial resistance and microbiome analysis and also we also uh, develop a lot of probiotics for the application of aquaculture as uh, bioremediators or probiotic and as a single cell protein. So we have a national surveillance program uh, for aquatic animal health disease which is running in our university for the past uh, more than five years. So under this program, we, uh, we are doing active and passive surveillance of major aquatic pathogens. And also we do a lot of awareness program regarding the aquatic animal health. So a lot of genomic data is generated through this uh, surveillance program. And also that can be useful for the diagnostics of uh, aquatic diseases. Coming to the AMR surveillance, we are an active in, in, involved in the Kerala government antimicrobial resistance strategic action plan, CARSAP. So one of our uh, research team headed by Professor De, uh, Deviga Pillai. So we are working on the, the, the antimicrobial resistance in the aquatic ecosystem. So one of the interesting thing we found that the, the antimicrobial resistance in aquaculture systems is not mainly contributed by the antimicrobial use in the aquaculture itself, but there is a severe contribution from the human as well as from the animal sector. So we found that the hospital effluent, there are a lot of antimicrobial resistant bacteria, belongs to the escape pathogens, Enterococcus, uh, Staphylococcus, Klebsiella, Cinetobacter, etc., are coming to the aquatic ecosystem and they are finally reaching to the aquaculture systems which, because we are sharing the same aquatic environment, aquatic ecosystems. So we have detected a lot of uh, multi-drug resistance bacteria from our aquatic ecosystem, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, Enterococcus, from the pungaceous ponds which using poultry waste. So there is, uh, it is not a uh, best management practice, but still some of the aqua farmers use poultry waste as a feed for the fish to reduce the feed cost. So through this, some of the antimicrobial resistance bacteria is transferred to the aquaculture sector also. And we have detected vancomycin resistance staphylococcus and carbapenem resistant enterobacteria and quinolone resistance E. coli isolates from of the near the, the water bodies sharing the or uh, uh, the emitting the hospital effluence from Cochin, Kollam and Wynad region. We didn't get any antimicrobial resistance from the Wynad region, but from the Cochin and uh, Koilon region, we got antimicrobial resistance. So these are some of our uh, publication regarding the MR. We do also do the gut microbiome analysis. We have seen the intricacies and complications of gut microbiome. And coming to the aquaculture, it's uh, again complicated because 
the gut microbiome of fish is uh, modulated by the microbiome of the water and sediments. So that makes it highly complicated. And uh, from the uh, past research, uh, there is a, a few conclusions. We have reached few conclusions. The gut microbiome, the major groups in the fish gut microbiome is by proteobacteria, firmicutes, bacteriotes. That is the 90 percentage. And I, we believe they, they play a major role in the physiology of the fish. And the another thing, uh, the, the gut microbiome with higher diversity is uh, indicating healthier fish compared to the diseased ones. So in general, the diseased ones are with uh, lower biodiversity compared to the higher biodiversity in the healthy fish. So that is one. Another area is the application of microbes in aquaculture. So there is uh, uh, to, to ensure the sustainability in aquaculture, there are, uh, the, we use a lot of uh, microbes in aquaculture as probiotic, immunostimulant, as a quorum gunging organism. So the, as uh, rightly pointed out by Dr. Sabu Thomas in his uh, earlier uh, discussions, we have to ensure the safety of the probiotic uh, when we apply to the aquatic system. So for that, it's better to have a sequence, a whole genome sequence, this probiotic or whatever microbes we use in aquaculture before the application. So these are some of the, our works in the probiotic area. Another very important is, as pointed out by one of the keynote speakers, how to improve the protein, the food security, so for the genetic improvement of the cultured organisms. So the whole genome or world uh, transcriptome analysis will help to, to develop the traits like growth and immunity in aquaculture species. So to improve the traits, you can either go for a transgenic way or you can go for selective breeding. Uh, in, in, all, in the two way, we have to depend upon the basic genome data. In transgenic, we can use that for gene editing using CRISPR and other things. Whereas in selective breeding, we can go for marker-assisted selection. So for that also, we require some basic genome data. And also, if the genome is uh, fully sequenced, we can use it as a model organism also. Because we are still lacking a brackish water fish model organism to study the effect of uh, different pollutants in the brackish water. So we do a lot of uh, breeding and standardization of indigenous fish in our university. Uh, this is a, a fish known as uh, uh, Shishtomas sarana, Purva Paral. And we have standardized the breeding and culture. And we do give these seeds to the tribal community in the Adamalaya region. And they will, uh, uh, they will uh, put this in the, in the dam. And this will be act as a livelihood for the tribal community as well as this will enhance the natural fish population of that particular region. Because it's a native fish to belongs to that particular region. And we uh, have a program of selective breeding of Atropolis suratensis, uh, Karimin. And we did a transcriptome analysis to, to study the growth, reproduction and immune related genes in Atropolis suratensis and the data is available in the NCBS also. And coming to the biodiversity and molecular taxonomy aspect, we do a lot of work in uh, mitogenome analysis and phylogenetic and also in the evolutionary aspect. And there is also a scope for environmental DNA analysis to elucidate the biodiversity in a particular water body. So coming to the fish diversity, as you know, the Western Ghats is rich with uh, fish biodiversity. There are more than 30, uh, 330 species have been reported from the Western Ghat, and uh, uh, there is a 70 percentage of endemism. So most of them are endemic species, and most of them are endangered also. And coming to the Kerala, we have 196 species of freshwater fishes in which uh, 51 are endemic. And we have two endemic families and six endemic genera. And this is uh, some of the, uh, the species which we have sequenced the complete mitochondrial genome in our own laboratory. Most of them are endemic and endangered. And many of them are uh, relevant in, in, in terms of uh, ornamental aspect. These are some of our publication related to the mitochondrial genome. So and some other, uh, we have one uh, another group of uh, uh, biodiversity group working in our university. They are mainly concentrating on subterranean fishes. So subterranean fishes are basically leaves in the aquifers of the under the under the land. So accidentally they will come to the well water. 
So we will uh, collect, we, we are uh, monitoring the well waters of certain regions and we will collect and this is very primitive fish and without any eyes and other thing, very much endemic to the Kerala and we have reported uh, two new species and genus of subterranean fishes and this is an ideal species for uh, evolutionary studies because it's a living fossil with uh, very limited uh, sensory organs and other thing. So we have reported new genus related to this uh, subterranean fishes. So these are some of the areas which CADIS can help or we can collaborate in terms of uh, aquaculture and fisheries. And uh, we have some challenges also that uh, basically based upon uh, we are lacking the expertise in bioinformatics, uh, especially in areas like quantitative genetics, population genetics, and uh, regarding the transcriptome analysis. So that is one of the major challenges we are facing in the aquaculture sector. And also we have to ensure the accuracy of the data because right now one group is doing the bioassay, another group is doing the sequencing and the third group is doing the analysis. So there is a mutual uh, discussion uh, is very much required to ensure the accuracy of the data. I think the CADIS can do, so the, sorry, the Kerala Genome Data Center can work on this aspect also. And especially the training part is very important. Uh, we are lack, especially in the bioinformatics area, some training is required. So that also can be addressed by the Kerala Genome Data Center. So I, I take this opportunity to thank the, the organizers of the CADIS uh, to giving me an opportunity to discuss this uh, very interesting area regarding to the aquaculture and fisheries. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thanks Dr. Rajesh uh, for the patient listening. Uh, we'll take uh, one or two questions. Uh, before that, there's an announcement someone who lost their seminar back with an orange burst. So if someone had seen it, please report it to the help desk. So we can take a couple of questions right now. Uh, can you briefly tell how you are doing the quorum quenching? Is it an enzymatic method you are using? No, Is no. Is it yeah, but we are using the quorum quenching microbes because there are some bacteria like bacillus so they, species. they produce this enzyme. They produce this lactonase and acid, uh, acylase, so they can uh, prevent the N-acyl homocerin lactone. So are you immobilizing in some way or these, these microbes? Or? Uh, not yet, but we have no, isolated. But otherwise, you know, it, I mean, it can be very expensive. Yeah, we, we have isolated some strains which can produce the lactonase and acylase. Basically, it's a bacillus species and we are working further on that because we are now applying it as a probiotic to the culture system so that it can prevent the virulence of Vibrio and Aeromonas. No, why I was telling we have an extremely good method for immobilizing okay. and which can be recovered. So if the enzyme is available, even the bacteria we can immobilize. Oh, okay, okay. So you just have to treat and you know remove so that you know these molecules can be degraded. Oh, then it's a very good. Yeah. The second thing is that you, know, you also mentioned about that water which is yes, going to yes. be used, uh, how you are treating that, because a large amount of uh, water is there. You, you, in one of the slides I saw that. Yes, yes. So, so ac that, uh, actually, those, uh, this resistant bacteria and other things, yeah. Actually as a part of uh, sustainable aquaculture, we are now promoting the closed system of aquaculture that once we stop the water, we will not uh, uh, allow them to exchange. So then the, what is the problem is in the closed system aquaculture, there will be a production of lot of ammonia and other metabolites uh, from the feed and other excretory product. And this can be uh, uh, removed with the help of uh, microbes. Ammonia is one main thing and another thing is the detritus, organic matter and the another one is H2S. So yeah, no, I was asking about what about this, uh, uh, the bacteria, many three or four different species you mentioned including E. coli and other which is uh, resistant to antibiotics. Oh, so, that is MR. Uh, or because that's a bigger problem. Uh, that we it? cannot do anything. That is, uh, our water bodies are already polluted. So best thing we can do the closed system, we can promote the closed system uh, culture in the state. That so is. Um, if, uh, I don't know how viable we have a method to remove. It's, it's not going to be very expensive. 
So that's what I wanted to know. Uh, using some method. If it is economically viable, then uh, it's, it's very good. It's a nanoparticle immobilized. We have the immobilization method. It can be recovered also. Oh, then it's so maybe sometime we can discuss these two things. Okay, okay. That's what sure. I want. Okay, thank you. If there are uh, no more questions, we will proceed to the next uh, session. I want to call upon Dr. Neeraj Rai from uh, Birbal Sani Institute of Paleo Sciences, Lucknow. Uh, Dr. Neeraj completed his PhD and postdoctoral work uh, and then joined Birbal Sani Institute of Paleo Sciences, Lucknow. He is one of the pioneers in ancient DNA and he has built a world class ancient DNA facility that is first of its kind in South Asia and specializes in tropical samples containing degraded DNA. They have also built a collaboration network with 55 plus institutions across South and Southeast Asia. Uh, his team has collaboratively produced some of the most exciting ancient uh, DNA work with publications in Science, Cell, Nature Communications, Genome Biology and Nature Genetics. Welcome uh, Dr. Neeraj and uh, we want to, uh, you know, just, we want to listen to your lecture. Thank you, uh, organizers, for providing this opportunity. So I'm not going to talk about uh, living organisms. It's all about deaths. So what I'm dealing, I'm dealing with the, uh, the organisms who have lived once upon a time. Uh, so mostly I'm focusing on human bone remains, which are all over the country. So I closely work with the archaeologist, anthropologist, and the museum collections. And I try to dig out the DNA to understand the population history of that species. So you know, modern human evolved in Africa somewhere around 70,000 to 1 lakh years before present. And then it started moving to other part of the world. And South Asia was the first place where most of the humanity arrived around 80 to 90,000 years before present. So we have archaeological records and uh, genetic records and both the records corroborates each other. So it comes up, confirms that the South Asians or Indians, they are here since at least 80,000 years before present. So, and this is the route that was opted by uh, our ancestors about 70 to 80,000 years before present and since then uh, India has developed a lot of demographic changes and that's why we have huge number of diversity. So we have now around 4,635 well-defined population in India which includes a lot of social groups and that forms the colorful India. So to understand the diversity pattern, it's very difficult to use the modern day uh, genomic data. So that's why we are adopting this technique to go back into past to uncover the different genomic layering of the populations. So this is the current scenario of our, uh, our civilization event that has taken over uh, 10,000 years before present. So we, we have categorized this uh, population groups into four forms. So Paleolithic period that, that were occupied by the nomadic and hunting gathering populations. Mesolithic period that goes back to 10,000 years before present and which also includes nomadic and hunting gathering population all across the country. And then around 5,000 years before present, agriculture revolution happened and then our diversity and the population growth, growth started taking place. So I use a state of the art ancient DNA as a tool to extract the DNA and to with the use of sequencing technology, uh, we try to understand the past population structure. So ancient DNA has wide application, not only to understand our population history, but we also can go back to our paleo ecological conditions. For example, we can use lake sediments to understand the ecological diversity that has taken place over the time. We have a lot of implication to understand the uh, biological sciences as well as the social sciences. So uh, we are uh, collaborating with archaeologists in the country and we are training them to properly excavate the samples and after excavation we use ancient materials to extract the DNA and then we are trying to sequence the complete or partial genome to better understand the past population demography. For example, these are the uh, recently collected samples 
uh, from different parts of India. So first samples is coming from uh, Gujarat and this individual is about 2000 year old. Second sample is a coffin burial and that was found in uh, near Delhi. And this sample goes back to 4000 years before present. Uh, third sample is again uh, coming from Gujarat and this sample is the probably first Parsi settlers in India. So we have good data of all these samples and we are day by day we are trying to enrich the genomic knowledge of our past. So uh, ancient DNA work is not an easy task. We have to deal with a lot of contamination uh, issues and uh, sometimes we get environmental DNA as a more number of uh, uh, genomic reads. So we have bioinformatic tools to segregate out the contamination and uh, endogenous DNA we, we extract from the whole genome data using different computational and using the different probe based methods. So what we use, mostly we use petrous bone and tooth bone, tooth samples to extract the uh, more amount of DNA because these bones has more uh, amount of endogenous DNA compared to the long bones. So I'll be coming back to the, uh, some of the very interesting project which I am working in Kerala with the help of uh, local archaeologist. Um, so after extracting DNA, we, uh, we build a library and we go for the sequencing. So this is the first, uh, most ancient data we have so far from India. We have sequenced one individual that was, this individual has lived around 4,500 years before present in the IVC site, Indus Valley Civilization site of uh, uh, modern day Haryana. And we were able to retrieve authentic whole genome data and we tried to understand the uh, genetic makeup of this individual. So with this very interesting uh, genetic finding, we concluded that you know, like mo all the modern day Indians, they have different genetic components. We have uh, West Eurasian components, we have Iranian components, we have local South Asian components, we have Ongi related ancestry. We have so many ancestries in our genome, but we don't know like at what time temporally and especially this ancestry has arrived. So for this ancient DNA knowledge is very important and uh, with this data we concluded that the Indus Valley civilization was indigenous and it has mostly uh, two kind of genetic component was found. First component was Iranian component and second was the Onge related ancestry that we all South Asian has, have. So how and when this Iranian component have arrived in Indus Valley population? That was a major question. Then we did some of the modeling and we found that this ancestry is not recent. It is very old ancestry that has arrived in this area about 12,000 years before present. When there were no agriculture, everybody was nomadic populations. And uh, th that was a major ancestry in that individuals. And we Indian, we have this Iranian component since that time period. So we concluded that uh, the, uh, the is we also found that the split time is at least more than 10,000 BC, that is 12,000 years before present. So on, on this basis, we concluded that there were no connection of uh, Indus Valley people and the Iranian after that, because after 10,000, until this time period, we don't have much connection with the Iranian. That component must have arrived before 10,000 BC. So on this basis, we, we concluded that the this agriculture uh, development and this knowledge of indigenous agriculture system must have been indigenous to, uh, to South Asia. Another samples we have, uh, we have excavated, we found the samples uh, from a late Indus Valley site. And uh, we also have a lot of samples from South India. We including Kerala, Tamil Nadu, we have samples from Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana. And uh, these samples goes back to 400 to 500 BC. And in 400 and 500 BC also, we don't have much West Eurasian component. Only we are finding consistently Iranian component. So this is the extraordinary finding that we have uh, recently, we have uh, uh, produced this data. So on this basis, we, we concluded that we, we, we didn't find much differences between Indus Valley civilization people and the megalithic people who have lived in South Asia around 300 to 200 BC in the southern state of India. We are also working on a lot of uh, uh, sites in uh, Kashmir, so Neolithic sites that we call Burjoham. We found a lot of genetic information because the climatic condition of this environmental region is very good. So we could uh, able to sequence samples going back to 5,000 years before present. So I'm not going to talk about the data because the time limitations, but th I'm just trying to uh, convince that Ancient DNA has a lot of implication in South Asia and we have a lot of samples in Kerala. You know, 
more than one lakh megalithic sites are are found all across the Kerala state, and uh, it need to be explored to a better understand the deep ancestral components of uh, this region. I'll just skip this slide. So yeah, coming back to a very interesting site of uh, Kerala. This is uh, located near to Cochin, uh, near the Smala Bar post. So uh, and the site name is Patnam. From this region, we have found lot of. Uh, 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 Roman amphora shreds, a lot of material culture that is going back to uh, Roman time period. But we don't know the dates and uh, the, the genetic makeup of uh, individuals who have lived this region and what was the connections and what was the trade route. So uh, we have uh, collected a lot of uh, archaeological information and uh, on the basis of that it was confirmed that there were trades, active trades were there. Uh, so from this site I have collected around 12 individual samples and out of 12 samples we found three individuals, they have very unique signatures. We could able to sequence mitochondrial DNA and we have also handful data from uh, autosomal uh, uh, part. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the mitochondrial DNA. We have three individuals that is uh, not uh, the haplotype pattern of those individuals, not very common into uh, South Asia. So uh, definitely they are, they belong to uh, West Eurasian region. So first haplogroup is the HV. HV is mostly found in uh, mostly in Mediterranean and the Iranian part. Uh, in South Asia, very less uh, this haplogroup is reported. Other haplogroup was JT. That is also found in mostly in European uh, part. In India, it's not reported so far. Third group is the T1A haplogroup. That is also found in uh, European region. That is not found in the in the, uh, in the southern part of India or entire South Asia. So. These three individual samples definitely they are not from the from the local uh, region. Uh, they would have come to this part, and uh, surprisingly they were cremated and they were buried in the proper fashion with the local tradition, local customs. And the dates are going back to uh, of all three individuals going back to 4,000 years, uh, 4, 400 BC to 100 uh, BC. So they are from the 4th century BC to uh, 1st century BC. These are radiocarbon dates of uh, all the bone samples. Uh, we are also uh, working on a lot of uh, human skeletal remains from Indonesia and uh, from uh, Cambodia. And uh, one set of populations who have lived in Indonesia about 400 BC, about 2400 years before present, they have very strong connection with the coastal region of uh, uh, Tamil Nadu and Odisha. So this is this result also very exciting and this is unpublished data. So we are working on this aspect also. Yeah, let's skip this slide because of the time constraint. I'll end up my talk with uh, with this uh, 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 with this very exciting result. Uh, in 2014, we started working on a project that was a bilateral project between India and Georgia. So there was a claim that one relic was uh, buried in a church, Saint Augustine Church in uh, Goa. And there were some literary evidences that this relic could belong to Saint Queen of Georgia. And her relic was brought into 1627 and that was buried in this church. So Georgian government was interested to find out the relics of the queen because she is considered as a martyr for uh, Georgian people. So our job is to find out the relics and to do the, some genetic testing to identify the relics. Uh, so with the help of our Eclipse of India, we, uh, we found three relics not one, at the, at the location which was mentioned in the literary uh, records. Uh, we did whole genome sequencing and mitochondrial DNA sequencing of the, all these three relics. One sample belonged to a very unique type of haplotype pattern and then we, we surveyed into our, our database and we found that this haplogroup U1B is very common in uh, Georgia but it is not common in India. So we have not found any sample which is uh, falling into this U1B haplogroup. So that was a uh, that very satisfactory result. We also collected samples, also the samples belongs to female. We also collected 30 individual samples from Georgia where this queen was born and brought up. And then when we compared, two samples had complete, completely matched with the haplotype that that relic was uh, 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 belonging. And on the basis of this, we concluded that this relic was, this relic belongs to Queen Katimuna Georgia. And on this finding, the relic was handed over by our Honorable Minister. He went all the way to Georgia and he has handed over the relics. 
So this uh, this study was conducted in 2014, and that has given me uh, interest. So I was a uh, uh, I was more interested in human genetics, then I accepted my field. Now I am working with archaeologists, historians to understand the deep population history of our country. There are the another uh, like lot of uh, like uh, this kind of uh, uh, monument you can see. This, this, they are the, uh, you know, the burial ground where the Ahom kings, they used to bury their deaths in Assam. And here also we are working and uh, we have got extraordinary set of data that connects India and Southeast Asia relation, not uh, since uh, medieval era, but since ancient time. So since 3rd, 4th century AD, uh, the migration was uh, in practice and a lot of population moved to this region, northeast of India, and they, they, uh, uh, they uh, came here and they, uh, they adopted the local, uh, uh, local population, they assimilated, and now like, they are highly admixed with the uh, northeast Indians. This is another case we have studied in 2018. We have uh, found a lot of human skeletal remains in a lake. Uh, this lake is at high altitude of Himalaya. Uh, we found more than 500 bodies. They were buried in this lake. And when this lake uh, get uh, uh, melt in the month of August, one can see bodies all across the lake in the vicinity of lake. It was a very interesting project. We wanted to know that who are these people and what they were doing at such a high altitude and harsh climatic condition. And we collected a lot of samples from here. It's very tough to uh, visit this place. You can see a lot of human skeletal remains uh, lying down in the lake. And we found that there were two groups of populations. One set of populations, they died in 6th, 7th century AD. Another group, they, died, they uh, got perished in 16th century of AD. And you can see two different kind of group. This purple color shows Mediterranean populations. They are not Indians. They are first generation Greek populations. And the nature, uh, the down orange color shows the South Asian groups. And then when we, uh, we analyzed uh, the populations, we found that the Rukun B, they are the Greek and French, and they are tightly clustered. Other group you can see, this is South Asian client. They are highly diverse. So a diverse group of populations in 8th century AD, what they were doing at such a high attitude lake. So this remain a question. We could, we were not unable to answer this question because we are not knowing the cause of their movement there. But we have found this data. So uh, I have seen a lot of people were talking about disease. So this is this field has also a lot of scope with the disease. Uh, when we do shotgun sequencing, we also accidentally and and unaccidentally we also find lot of pathogen sequences with the uh, uh, human genome sequences. One sample, this is coming from Sri Lanka. We found that one individual, uh, we were able to sequence this individual along with the diphtheria genome. And when we analyzed the diphtheria genome, we found this genome is not the contamination. This is coming with the, uh, this individual. And this is a very uh, premature uh, finding. And when we are comparing this genome with the published genome dat data set, we found this is more or less matching with the Australian diphtheria genome. So there are some con some kind of connections that might have uh, human must have moved to Australia through this route, and then they would have carried this diphtheria. But again, this is a very primary uh, finding. This is a very classic case of uh, paleopathology. We are working on uh, Indus Valley site in Rajasthan, and we could able to sequence uh, oldest mycobacterium leprae genome from a sample that is dating back to 4,200 years before present. And uh, this work we are going to present, uh, publish very soon because this is the oldest, you know, microbacterium lepri. Thank you so much. This is my lab. Great presentation, uh, Dr. Neeraj. And uh, if there are any questions from the group? Thanks, Neeraj, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, you showed some examples of Indus Valley. Uh, altogether, how many samples were you able to get from Indus Valley? Only one sample. Only one sample. Yeah. So isn't it very difficult to make a general prediction from one yeah, sample? Yeah, like uh, from audience, if if I'm collecting one sample, I can just say that they are South Asian. <laughs> That's all. But I thought David Reich had got some samples from Indus Valley. Yeah, he Same also. One? Yeah, in the collaboration only we worked. Oh. And uh, we have uh, uh, late Indus Valley data that I have shown from Sanoli. 
so this is a continuation of indus valley because the population they have moved towards south mm. and in the south in ganga plain also we are we are finding same more or less same signature what was found in ibc but i thought sanoli was like more like 500 bc or no no no, no it's uh, 1950 uh, so BC. late in this valley yeah late in this valley thank you There are no more questions. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Biju Parameshwaran, consultant KDISC, uh, to deliver a token of gratitude to all the speakers uh, who presented the last uh, sessions. So I invite Dr. Neeraj Rai, Dr. Arun Sakaria, Dr. Vijay Rajesh Kumar, and Professor Valsama. And Mr. Sam Santosh. And to Dr. Rajuri. I would like to call upon uh, Dr. P.V. Unikrishnan, Member Secretary, KDISC, for the concluding remarks. See, at the fag end of a very exciting interaction, we had started off with a vision and a strategy document by uh, Sam, where he had very clearly outlined that uh, we are trying to build up a genome backbone with pipelines for genome sequencing, AML tools residing on the top of that. And uh, the overall role of KDISC and KGDC would be that of a facilitator, bringing together research projects from the various research institutions throughout the state and also from outside the state but with a focus on Kerala. We would be primarily funding the genomic component and the clinical phenotype data would have to be collected by the respective research institutions. So we had started off with that. We had a very exciting sessions from a woman which went into an introductory session on how sequencing could be done, a detailing of animal genomics, and uh, with prospects for how animal protein production, because he is a specialist in animal genomics, and he had come up with exciting recommendations on a possible industry, a new industry around AI-based genomic technology-driven breeding, in animals, he in fact uh, identified two specific species of uh, Indian bison and uh, guile and uh, around their hybrids. He also touched upon pearl spot or karimine as a new species, focusing on aspects like feed conversion, fertility, disease resistance, etc. He also touched upon the possibility of looking at Attapadi goat and uh, Malabari goat for looking at disease resistance, tenderness, etc. He also indicated that uh, human genomic efforts should be structured around, uh, I mean, meaningful data, clinical data and phenotype data have to be compiled in the hospitals and, also, and uh, a system should be built up for that, for sharing. He also mooted the idea of a Kerala wellness model based on a biobank which could be generated uh, right from the infant stage and we could use that uh, for diseases for therapy techniques for diseases was one important suggestion that he had come up this has to be discussed and detailed 
Satish Chandran had a very detailed presentation on microbiomes. He came up with uh, the impact of uh, human microbiome on a case study of alcoholic liver disease. And he proposed that there could be multiple approaches for intervention around antimicrobial, probiotic, probiotic and postbiotic approaches. He indicated that there could be a strategy for Kerala microgenome around developing a knowledge base on microgenomes, developing associations, identifying key ingredients based on disease models. We had a very exciting session by Jeff Fall on quantifying the genetic cost of inbreeding and how explain how inbreeding leads to homozygosity and uh, indicated that breed and varietal management could be attempted through outbreeding and also rare genetic disease diseases can be avoided if we can avoid inbreeding and uh, genome sequencing could be a very important tool for that. KGDC also should develop a focus on uh, understanding of vectors on zoonotic diseases was one of his recommendations. We know Scaria had uh, gone through a detailed presentation on tracing the model of uh, Kerala, uh, leading genomic surveillance for evidence-based policy during COVID through a partnership with the health department with the CSIR Institute of Gen Genomics and Integrative Biology. He also traced the program for epidemic intelligence, which has been driven by the Kerala Initiative on analytics, AI, and open sciences for responding to epidemics. We're in an open system and architecture for prediction and preparedness for epidemics around Dengue, Nipah, and Sika has been developed. He suggested that there could be strategies for moving from phenotype-driven genetics to evidence-based genomics. Capacity building initiatives in this area are very critical. Data security is also very critical. Ramesh Herheran had a brilliant presentation on his experience of how he started off as a computer, computational scientist, a data science person, deep diving into the mysteries of biology. He, from his quite a lot of his personal experiences and including his own color blindness, he had used his understanding of sequencing and related areas in a variety of personal experiences. And he also indicated that uh, there could be a focusing on, I mean, right now, uh, most of the sequencing is on inherited genomes and evolving genome studies could be very critical. The studies are quite complex because the signals are very weak. He gave specific suggestions to uh, KGDC that uh, data sharing is critical for value creation. There should be a focus on bioinformatics. There could be an interdisciplinary focus uh, with clinicians, biologists, molecular biologists, statistici statisticians, computer engineers, and computer scientists coming together. We had very interesting technical session on data center design with Jagar Hilani, outlining the potential for NVDA-based uh, GPU system and AI tools that could be used for KGDC. Babu Shivadasan quickly outlined the landscape of data centers from traditional premise level data centers through software defined data centers to hybrid cloud and decentralized data centers leveraging on edge computing capabilities. Afternoon we had Vishal Menon who had come in place of Aju Jacob explaining a number of use cases for genomic applications. He had started off with uh, how the antifreeze characteristics in Arctic fish flounder was used uh, for developing antifrost characteristics in tomato. Extremophiles for probiotics which could survive under unfavorable pH and gut. Breeding of plants for creating secondary metabolites were also important citations that he made in terms of looking at uh, genomic applications. He also suggested that we could uh, look for a knowledge cluster with uh, the QSAT-based uh, center driven by Synthite and uh, KGDC for creating IEP skills and industry applications, which could be uh, used for 
a variety of applications in biomanufacturing, biodiversity conservation, etc. Vijay Reddy had come up with a very intense session on agriculture genomics where he had indicated how they had started off with reference genomes and have taken advantage of the genetic uh, diversity of plant material in Kerala for breeding by design and he explained how a cross of anthocyanin rich rice with uh, BPT 5204 grain rice he created line 120 and also went into explaining how curry life, cardamom and various other aromatic medicinal plants have uh, around applications in Ayurveda where genome sequencing had been tried. Dr. Patmanabha Shanoi looked at uh, interrelations between immunology and microbiota, how changing microbiota can address autoimmune diseases with focus on gut microbiome. Treatment of diseases could possibly be done with uh, microbiota was his uh, inference. Even though there is a lack of clarity on how uh, autoimmune diseases uh, and uh, microbiota, the exact causal relations between them is not well known. Uh, he indicated that localization is extremely important because microbiota is unique and hence modulation of microbiota in autoimmune diseases is required in specific areas. This outlines the relevance of uh, genome sequencing of microbiomes in the Kerala context under KGDC. Dr. Sabu Thomas gave a detailed presentation on the strategies of uh, Center for Microbiome as a pioneering initiative covering microbiome-based research in plant, animals, human, and uh, with a focus on environment. The focus on animals and uh, plants is basically for improving productivity and disease resistance. In humans, it is improving on human health, and possibly in environment is climate resilience, health, and wellness. Dr. Aravind had a fairly detailed presentation on One Health. Uh, he cited the major challenges that Kerala is experiencing in health, with uh, the ex with the connect and uh, the extensive diaspora uh, uh, and uh, the wildlife crossing. He also indicated that uh, avian influenza, the indications of uh, crossing over to humans and uh, the human diseases being transmitted to animals. Uh, these are becoming more and more relevant in the context of the aging population, the comorbidity and obesity, and this is the reason why a strategy of One Health has been uh, developed. He also cited his own experiences in the AMR-related studies, antimicrobial resistance-related studies, which he has indicated, uh, which he has tried out in his uh, uh, ICU-led uh, endogenous disease studies where he is trying to correlate uh, the gut microbiome diseases with uh, diet, water, environment and uh, food chain induced uh, antibiotics and antifungal agents from agriculture, animal husbandry, fisheries, etc. These all indicates that uh, there is a necessity for looking at a overall action plan and a strategy around One Health. Dr. Ramachandran who uh, shared the session, cited his own experience of interaction of microbiomes on metabolic pathways and indicated that lateral thinking could be applied to microbiome research. Arun Sakaria had a detailed session on conservation genomics, which could be very critical in wildlife disease ecology, wildlife population genomics, and uh, wildlife forensics. Limited uh, knowledge on evolution process in wildlife poly uh, the population is the need for embarking on genomics and conservation. Human wildlife geno conflict genomics is also required for the state of Kerala was one of the major recommendations from him. Well, some uh, uh, from the Kuchin University and Rajesh Kumar from KUFOS elucidated the depth and breadth of the research work in genomics area by the universities. 
detailing the publications and indicate the possibility of uh, close interaction and collaboration between the respective centers and uh, cadres. We had a very fascinating presentation from Neera Jiroy, who revisited the genetic history of our past and uh, fascinating mechanisms of ancient DNA analysis with linkages to biological sciences, social sciences, and geosciences. He had uh, case studies from the Indus Valley, Muziris areas, and Kashmir, and uh, anthropological and historical information on primitive uh, civilizations could be unearthed through DNA was a very fascinating uh, story which has uh, come out through his presentations. So I would uh, thank the Saigenon team for this uh, exciting academic uh, exercise which was triggered. It was uh, a learning, I mean, for me, who has learned only uh, life sciences till my 10th standard, it was a extremely exciting and uh, opening uh, session for quite a lot of things to learn in the future, even at this old age. Uh, I mean, I'm fascinated to look into the world of genomics and uh, life sciences. Thanks, Sam, once again for this uh, great session. And uh, we should try to consolidate the proceedings and uh, take them forward to some meaningful action. Thanks, Dr. Unikrishnan, for the concluding remarks. Um, so, uh, I would be presenting the vote of thanks. We started uh, with an academic conference on uh, KGDC and we had the speakers coming across India and uh, from other parts of the world and we thank all the speakers who have travelled from the uh, for the scientific seminar. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the health minister who raised the occasion and also members from the uh, state planning board, Dr. Jiju P. Alex, uh, Dr. Sajeev Gopinath, etc. I also want to thank uh, the KDS team who has helped in organizing this event and making it a grand success. I have seen uh, a lot of sleepless nights with a lot of our members. So I think today you can rest. I also want to thank uh, Rania and uh, Parvati from Computational Biology Department, the Kerala University, for helping us uh, for this event. And uh, last but not the least, I want to thank uh, Dr. Unikrishnan and Sam Santosh for guiding on the proceedings and also helping us with um, giving a strategic direction how to go ahead with this project. So this is just the starting, this is not the end. So what is going to happen in the next uh, couple of weeks would be we would be consolidating uh, all the uh, all the information and uh, all the suggestions that we have got from all of you. Uh, we have touched base with a lot of institutions but again we feel we can come back to you. You may have a lot of questions so we have QSAT participating in the university, okay, you know, so a lot of, uh, we touch base with a lot of, uh, a lot of universities. At the same time we will get back to you and we want to collaborate, uh, give us uh, interesting projects. Uh, so we, we understand uh, you are already doing a lot of work in this field and uh, KGDC would act as an anchor for uh, the betterment of the state in science and technology. So that's, uh, we, we are signing off. Uh, so let's keep in touch. Thank you so much.